It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... Tower is back in your life on this Wednesday, February 15th, 2023. Hello again, everyone. I sure hope you're doing well. Hope you're doing well on a lovely, lovely Wednesday here in New York City. Is it possible that spring is around the corner? It feels like it might be, but it's still only February 15th. I'm still waiting for the big snowstorm. I think the groundhog lied. You think he lied? Yeah. It's What's like, his name again? It, um, Pete? No. Uh, uh, Pax Attorney Phil. Uh, Puxatani. Puxatani Phil. <laughs> Pax Attorney. I thought he was. Tax Attorney Phil. Tax Attorney <laughs> <laughs> It's like in the 60s today. I know. It's unbelievable. Uh, but I feel like there's always one big storm. There's got to be a storm, right? Or is yeah. it possible that we're bypassing the storm? No, no snow storms for us. Or, this was, the, season. or was the storm your, uh, your Valentine's Day plans yesterday? That's not very nice. I don't know. That could have been a good thing. No? Carry on. <laughs> How was your Valentine's Day? It Frank? was great. We enjoyed each other's company. We ate good food. What'd you do? I just told you. We enjoyed <laughs> each other's company and we ate good food. Where did you eat? Or at what did at you home. Eat? We ordered takeout. Oh. What'd you guys have? Um, barbecue. There's a place in Brooklyn that does really good brisket. Oh, yeah. That was my idea. Because of all the Kansas City barbecue talk on Monday. Too much. Yeah. Too much Kansas City talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, that's nice. Uh, my Valentine's Day was nice. Thanks for asking. Um, it was implied. Mm, was it? I mean, I could have had a horrible one. I could have uh, I could have slept in a motel last night. You would have never known because you didn't ask. <laughs> Uh, but it was great, and I'm happy to be here on this post-pay-per-view Wednesday because, golly, still a lot to discuss post-UFC 284. You know, I have to say, uh, and and I feel like I'm a broken record at this point, I have often said on this show, as you may recall, you could do a whole highlight reel of me talking about this, the UFC official rankings have forever been known, at least to me, as the beacon of truth, you know, in this sport. Um, always on point, always credible, always unbiased. And once again, it was proven yesterday that they are just that because they, uh, they had Alex Volkanovsky listed as number one pound for pound. So, uh, another indication, another example of the UFC official rankings coming through. And I hate to say that I told y'all so, but I told y'all so there's a difference between winning the contest and winning the fight. Again, no knock on Islam whatsoever. He did what he had to do. He's taking the belt back home if it's not there already. And I like the trolling, by the way, the Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. That's good stuff. I like everything about that. But number one pound for pound is the man from down under. We'll talk about all of that and a whole lot more on this program. We love Wednesdays here on the show because we get to shoot. We get to answer questions. Shout out to my good friend, Danny Rubenstein, manager to the stars, who said his favorite segment of the week is on the nose and i appreciate that i'm sure he speaks for many and so we'll get to on the nose on today's program as always we are presented by our good friends over at DraftKings sportsbook they are the official sports betting partner of not only the ufc but this program as well if you haven't done so if you're one of the very few download the DraftKings sportsbook app today use the code dma hour when you sign up again that's code the mma hour you see it right there on the screen and they hook you up and it lets them know that we sent you. So that's very important as well. Please support them because they support us. Back into the show, we'll make our picks for this weekend. You know, it's an interesting weekend. Uh, we've got now Aaron Blanchfield versus Jessica Andrade. I mean, high stakes there at 125. Of course, we've got the big Lee Wood fight in Nottingham. We'll have more on that later in the program. Elimination Chamber, Knuckle Mania. I mean, it's a bit of a hodgepodge. But uh, there's a lot for the Parlay Pals sans Rick to uh, to partake in. Looking forward to that back into the show. Uh, prior to that, we'll be joined by JDM, Jack Della Maddalena, who had the big win this past weekend in his hometown of Perth. What a star he is turning out to be. Four wins now in the UFC. Very, very, very talented young fighter. Just 26 years young. And looking forward to see where he goes from here. But uh, the guy is such an amazing person, a mensch, mensch of all menches, joining us at 5.15 a.m. local time, back into the show to talk about his big win and the state of his career. Prior to that, we'll make our picks. 
So uh, stay tuned for that. Prior to that, we'll be joined by Eugene Behrman, uh, head coach at City Kickboxing. We'll talk about the Vogue fight. We'll talk about the return of Izzy and a whole lot more. So stay tuned for that. Always great to talk to Eugene Behrman. Coach Eugene, prior to that, we'll talk to Modestus Bukaskas, who had the massive win over Tyson Pedro this past weekend. What a story. A um, year and a half ago, serious injury, knee injury, gets cut from the UFC, has to work his way back up, goes back to Cage Warriors, wins their title there, the light heavyweight belt for the second time, and gets the short notice call to fight Tyson Pedro in Australia, takes the opportunity, obviously, and wins the fight fair and square. Uh, very emotional afterwards. I haven't had a chance to talk to the Baltic warrior, Modestus Bukaskas. We will talk to him at about uh, 2.45. Part of that will answer your questions on the nose. Thank you to moderator Lewis for the questions, as always, and thanks to all of you for sending in the questions. I am very excited to see what you have in store for us this week. But first... Let us talk to one of the bright young stars in the sport, the man that we were hoping to see make his official UFC debut in December. Fortunately, we had to wait a little longer, but it's rapidly approaching. It's just a couple of weeks away now. March 4th, to be exact, UFC 285. Viva Las Vegas, T-Mobile, Jamie Pickett against the pride of Penn State, the Nittany Lion himself, one of the greatest American wrestlers of all time, the one and only Bo Nickel. Hey, Bo. Whoa. What happened? Where'd the hair go? I actually just, just got a fresh cut. I'm trying to get more like you. Whoa. This is a shocker. This just happened oh, today? Yeah, like 20 minutes ago. Frank, can we get some breaking news music? Bo has a new haircut. <laughs> breaking. Colon. What inspired this? Just, uh, you know, I think a couple things. One, shaved head. I'm undefeated in my career. Okay. So I like to keep it, keep it rolling, keep the good vibes going. And then, uh, you know, I was thinking a lot, like when I see guys get hit in the head, when they have long hair and their hair's bouncing around and stuff, it just, it's a bad look. Uh -huh. so just kind of looking like you're just getting, getting wrecked. So, you know, I see guys hair getting bounced around and stuff. I don't really like that. So I'm not going to be that guy. Wow. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I kind of feel like you're undefeated with long hair as well. You know, that, that might be true. It's, uh, it's possible, but uh, yeah, either way. <laughs> How does it feel? Fresh? Feels great. Feel fresh. Feel good. So, yeah. yeah. Great fresh and clean. I have to say, I really like the long hair. I mean, I'm not saying I don't like this, but I really I really actually thought it was a good look. I, I like the long hair too. You know, I I had the long hair for the most part through college and, and I enjoy it, but I think, uh, you know, something about just switching it up and making the people kind of do a double take on. I like it. Well, that's certainly what happened here. Growing the beard as well? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I think if you, if you go short hair, you got to have you got to grow the yeah, beard. Yeah. Well, so. I subscribe to that as well. A lot of changes in your life, a lot of exciting things, a uh, new haircut, new beard, and I see you sporting this uh better sweatshirt. That's uh Jake Paul's company. What's going on there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, big announcement actually, you know, so I I just signed with Better, just signed with uh with Jake Paul's company and uh you know, going to be doing a lot of media and a lot of uh, um, cool stuff in the in the combat sports space. So, you know, um, just a new deal, kind of my first deal that I've done that's been kind of big time. And my uh, manager, Malcolm Kawa, helped me out with that. And uh, yeah, super exciting. But we got some awesome stuff, awesome stuff coming um, in the combat sports media space. So it can be fun. I love that. Um, are you are you in touch with Jake? Perhaps you can help him train for his uh, MMA debut. You guys going to work together? Yeah, yeah, I, I talked to him over Facetime. Um, you know, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get to meet in person and train together soon. So, you know, I think it just it made a lot of sense uh, for me, him being, you know, probably the number one boxing prospect in the world, me being the number one MMA prospect in the world, for us to partner up, team up, you know, and we'll definitely uh, be doing a lot of stuff together in the future. I'm sure this is great. And so, what what exactly is it like? They're sponsoring you. Do you have to do stuff for them? What 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 exactly are the terms yeah, so here? Yeah, so uh, I basically partnered with them in a in a content capacity and like a media space. So um, the first thing that we'll be doing together is uh, actually kind of a mini embedded series on my fight week for this upcoming um, fight, and that'll be available on all my channels, on all of uh, Better's channels, and uh, you know, just kind of um, from there, I'm going to get into just more more content just freshening up the mma content space a little bit you know i think um 
there's a lot of people that are doing good things. And um, for me, I want to kind of be able to share uh, insight into my life with the fans and with people that um, is maybe not typically seen uh, from a lot of fighters. And so we're, we're going to be doing a, a kind of a podcast style show. It's not going to be exactly like what you see in a typical podcast with people talking. It's going to be a little more, I would say, uh, active. You know, I'm doing a lot of fun stuff all yeah. the time, traveling and meeting people. And so um, it's, but I'm going to, after my fight, be working on putting a show together and uh, doing something on on that end. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it overall. That's awesome. Congratulations. We were actually just talking about this before the show. We're like, man, Bo's content is always so fresh. Like it feel like, do you have like a whole bunch of people working for you? What is going on here? Because why does your content seem so much better than most MMA fighters? You know, I think that, uh, well, first off, shout out. I have one content guy that helps me manage everything. His name's Ronan. He's a, he's a college kid. He goes to Penn State. He's graduating. Wow. Um, this spring and he'll be with me full time once he graduates. But I think that for me, just kind of, it's kind of been similar to my career in that like I'm I feel very well prepared for interviews, very well prepared for big moments. And it's been similar in the content space because getting the attention that I got through wrestling, you know, I, I want to say like I was up over 100K followers as a college uh, wrestler and stuff. And so just kind of feeling that experiencing that at a, at a, at a lower level um, and being able to build up to where I'm in now, you kind of get to almost see into the future a little bit when it's not just thrust on your plate all at once. Right. Like I, I kind of saw all this coming. And so I had a plan, um, not only like in fighting and I also had a plan for content and media. And, um, I think that's just being prepared and kind of seeing the future before, before it happens. Um, and just, yeah, trying to make, to make the most of that and, and just really share, share my life with the fans and the people give the people what they want to see. I like your content very much. It's it's original, it's fresh, it's unique, except there's one reoccurring theme that I do not like. And I have I to tell know. the world, I have to tell the world, it's a little it's a little bit of bullying on your part. I mean, it's a lot of showing this stuff to me and uh, makes me nauseous every time I see it. It's your uncooked meat, your disgusting um, uncooked meat. And we actually have, can we, can we play this and show it to Bo as well? This is you, long hair, eating meat, and our, and you're like going like, oh, this is so great. And we actually have now slowed it down. I don't know if you can see this and we're going to zoom in on it. That looks like a piece, like that looks like, th that looks like flesh. What is going on? Can we play that one more time for, uh, for Bo if possible? Nope. Uh, that's uh, Modestus. Did, did we lose Bo? Did you see that? It, I mean, what is that? What is going on over there? What is happening? Yeah. I, 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 my, there's a bigger question that uh, <laughs> I think, you know, most people, would side with me on, on in the topic. Um, There's blood dripping off the thing. There's actual blood dripping off it. What is that? Not blood, <laughs> my globe. So first off, let's get our facts straight. But okay. I don't think it's important for me to answer this because I think 99% of people would side with me. But what what is your, like, why are you scarred? Like, what's your deal? I don't like, like to eat. I don't like to eat flesh. Like I want to eat cooked food. You mean you don't like to eat flesh? You don't eat, you don't eat meat. You're not a vegan. No, I know, but I, I cook it. Like, like I like a hamburger because a hamburger is well done, right? Typically. I mean, I don't really eat my burgers well done, but. What do you, how do you do raw burger? I don't do it raw. I'll do it like medium, medium well. Medium like well? Pink. Wow. I feel like I just, can someone clip that off? Both saying medium for burger, well. For a burger. <laughs> for a burger. Uh, we can, uh, we can yeah, I don't, get you in a lot what, of trouble. Why? Have you just always been this it's way? Just, like you yeah. a kid eat ketchup on your steak and never grew up or what? Yeah. What's wrong with ketchup? I don't get why people are bothered by this so much. I really don't. I don't know. It just seems like, just seems like the wrong way to go about it. Like, really? I taste a hockey puck steak, and no. I'm like, okay, I might as well just eat. I might as well just eat some beef jerky or something. But if I want like a real steak, like a ribeye, I'm doing that medium rare, just like I like it, and it's going to taste amazing, and You're with a nice crust on it. Um, when was the last time? Have you ever? When's the last time like you ate a? steak that wasn't well done like when is the last time i don't know i mean hopefully never all right well <laughs> this is what we're gonna do then we're gonna bring you out to state college i'm gonna grow you steak oh my gosh by the way so, you ever you ever you ever do it like straight up rare um you know i'm not like a, like a cold like center type of guy like i, I like to I, I like it medium rare so like a warm a warm red center like that's kind of for me what is ideal you know i'll eat it rare if it's uh but but I, I do like it cooked a little bit a little bit more. And how often are you eating steak? 
pretty much every day, man. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, I eat, I, I eat some type of meat every day. Generally it's red meat. I would say, um, not always like, uh, beef i'll eat elk i'll eat venison and all the different right. types of stuff because I, I hunt too so i get uh wild game and stuff wow and that's healthy to have that much red meat super healthy yeah i mean especially like considering if you're an athlete generally you're gonna want um quite a bit of uh protein like you know relative to your body weight uh for me i'm, I'm getting in around 230 grams of protein a day and you, it's going to be really hard to do that without some type of meat. But, uh, I mean, of course I'm doing other things, doing protein shakes, doing dairy, things like that. But yeah, I mean, meat generally, I, I, that was where my mind was. And, um, I, I actually went into my last contender series fight with a bit of an injury oh. and I kind of thought it was something that was going to be like, I'll finish the fight and then I'll just clear it up and we'll be ready to go. And it, it took a little longer than I expected to get healthy, um, after the fight you know, with the contender series, it was like, I'm fighting, right? Like this is the date. This is the, there's kind of a season, right? So I can't push this back. So I'm fighting and I'm just going to push through it. And then when, uh, when, uh, I kind of got home and stuff and, and I started to, you know, think about getting back into training and prepping for December, I was like, you know what, like, it's not the best thing for me. I need to get this hundred percent solved and healthy before I, uh, before I move into my next camp. And so pushing it back to March made sense with, uh, the Brazil card in January and the Australia card in February. So March, uh, with the uh, U S card was like the next date that made the most sense. Okay. And you feel a hundred percent now? Yeah. Yeah. I've been a hundred percent since December. Um, oh. so I've been training like 12 weeks, like ready for this fight. And, uh, I'm a hundred percent. So, you know, I would have liked to fight, have fought in January or February, but with, again, the cards being, um, out of the country, the UFC wanted me to make my debut in America, which, you know, I'm cool with as well. So we just pushed it back to March. And what a card, man. Return of John Jones, Shevchenko on the card. It is uh, like of the, of the pay-per-view so far this year, I would say it's the best for you to be on a John Jones card, considering who he is in the sport. What does that mean to you? Man, it's huge. You know, I look at John Jones as obviously one of the legends. Um, a lot of, uh, stock in him and uh, argument as, as as the goat you know a lot of people think he's he's the greatest of all time and just to be uh opening up a main card him in, as the main event is a very cool place to be at you know in my ufc debut so you know obviously the goal for me is eventually to be headlining and and be the main event myself you know on pay-per-views but uh for now it's it's very exciting and i feel very grateful and and appreciative to be um, in the position that i am and have this opportunity um, you are, you just said it, but I just want to confirm you are on the main card. I know last time I asked you, but I just was, I wasn't sure. Uh, you know, sometimes they don't like when people get a little bit too, uh, uppity about these things. So you are, I, main got card. Hated that. I was shocked. People, it, it surprised yeah. me. people were like, yo, blah, blah, this, that. And I'm like, all right, man. Like I, I get where you're coming from. Like, you don't know me, but you're talking about me. So yeah. there's obviously a reason like, like, again, I'm not the one that makes these decisions. It's the, it's the UFC. And so, you know, that, I don't know why people are mad at me for that, but, uh, yeah, I'm in the right place. Um, do you like, obviously I'm assuming you're not the type to sit there and read your comments all day, but because you're so confident, some might say cocky, whatever. I don't say that in a bad way, but you're not afraid to say how you feel. You don't sugarcoat, which is why we like talking to you. Uh, would you say, you know, if this was a graph, you get 50% hate, 60% hate, 70% love. Like how, how would you describe what you see? Cause you know how MMA fans are, how all fans are like, who is this guy? Right. Maybe they didn't grow up watching you or they don't know NCAA wrestling. How would you, how would you break it down? So I would say, um, I would say it's probably like 90% positive. Oh, wow. Maybe, great. Like almost everybody is super positive towards me. I think oftentimes you can see the negative comments and maybe they're a little, a little louder or they just, you know, hit you a little differently, but I, I've had a ton of positive response and so much support. Um, so I, that's something I'm super grateful for. And I feel like I don't really want to be like the bad guy that people don't like, like, that's just not really me. I've never, I've never been that guy. That's like the villain, you know? So, um, I think maybe a couple of comments I had rub people the wrong way. And I think that's just because they don't have any, any context. They don't really know me. They don't know what type of person I am and stuff. And which I don't really blame them for it's 
that's the way that social media works. But I think overall, I've had super positive response. Everybody's really hyped, really excited. And yeah, once in a while, there's uh, somebody that's being a hater in there, but that's just, you know, that's the way life goes. When's the last time you competed in front of a full arena? Because the Contender Series fights weren't full. Even your Icon fight, that was, you know, still somewhat pandemic days. When's the last time you competed in front of like 15, 16, 17, 18,000 people? Yeah, so the last time would have been um, in Pittsburgh at uh, PVG Paints Arena in 2019, my senior year wow. of college. So that would have been like probably 25,000 people or so. Um, and, you know, since then I've competed with the pandemic, obviously everybody was yeah. in a little bit of a position where they, they didn't have that opportunity. I competed in the Olympic trials in 2021 and that was in front of probably maybe 10,000, but it wasn't like a, a, as, as huge of a crowd as what it's like in, you know, one of those big arenas, but yeah, I'm so excited just to be able to do that again. That's literally my favorite thing in the world. You know, for me, when I was in college, my favorite matches were the biggest matches, you know, um, or the NCAA tournament where you are in a huge arena. So th those are where I feel like I compete the best. And yeah, I, I really can't wait to uh, to just feel that energy again. Speaking of the Olympics, um, late December, you tweeted MMA should be in the Olympics. Do you think we'll ever see that day? I hope. It would be awesome. I, I don't think that... I think it would be really, really tough. There's a lot of obstacles in the way. Um, but I just... When I look at MMA as a sport, I just feel like it's the best, like overall, like, like a good example would be, all right, there's a playground and you got people playing basketball and then a fight breaks out on the other end. What are people going to watch? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think it's the easiest to identify with as human beings, you know, cause if you go, if you want to learn a sport, you obviously have to learn rules, right? Like again, to go off, off the basketball analogy, it's like, you got to learn like what, what, how to get up and down the court, what scores points, that type of thing. But you don't really need to know the rules to know like a fight and who, and who wins like in general, right? Like maybe there's close fights, close decisions, but I think for, for the most part, like people are going to understand a fight or if a mom, like if some guys try to steal like a mom's kid, like she's going to fight that guy. Like that's just ingrained in us as humans. Like we understand it a little better. And so I think it would make sense for it to be in the Olympics with where we're at now, I don't really think that it'll happen and in any time soon, but I just think it would be cool. I just, I wonder if there are too many issues because can guys fight that, or and, and, and women as well, fight that frequently? You know, in the Olympics, as far as boxing, you're wearing headgear, you can't do that in MMA, you're trying to avoid that type of injury. I don't know, I feel like maybe the next best thing would be BJJ or just yeah. Jiu-Jitsu, right? That one seems like an obvious for the Olympics, no? For sure. You know, I think MMA, there are obviously a lot of, uh, a lot of issues, you know, with how hard a fight is on your body and stuff and having to compete multiple times, you know, BJJ would, would be an awesome addition. Um, and for, for me, you know, I, I just love the idea of like representing my country as well. Like I'm super, like it was, it was really hard to, uh, not make the Olympic team in wrestling because I just wanted to represent my country so badly. And that's something I'm just like very, very, I would be very proud to do. And I was able to do it in a, in an age group capacity a few times and, and win a world championship in an age group. But, um, I just, I love doing that. It was a really cool feeling to be able to like put on, uh, for your, for your country. And, uh, yeah, you know, obviously now doing MMA, I can do that in a sense, but it's not the same as like competing in the Olympics, in my opinion. You can't try out for 2024, right? Yeah, I could, you know, and I think honestly, right now, if I just, if I focused on wrestling and was all in that I would make the team and and probably win the gold medal, but it's just, I feel like I'm past that point in my life where I've kind of just readjusted my goals and changed my um, outlook and perspective. And I feel okay, not pursuing that and just being all in on MMA and uh, it's, it's hard and stuff but i just feel way more passionate about mma and i i don't want to chase two things at the same time i'm if i'm going to do something i'm going to be all in with it are you training for this fight in pennsylvania or are you going to miami or florida as well i was down in florida for for a while okay. training with mike brown training with masvidal i had a bunch of good looks down there um so i was down there for a few weeks and since then i've been back up here so i'll finish 
the rest of my camp in Pennsylvania, but I was able to go down to ATT, get some good sparring in and good training down there. Anything concern you at all about Jamie Pickett? I mean, I think you always have to go into a fight concerned. I think if you are too relaxed and um, taking taking it for granted, then uh, and overlooking people, then that's a recipe for disaster. So for me, I'm very, I would say I'm very concerned, very aware of everything that he's going to bring. Um, I watch a ton of film, and I feel like I'm fully prepared for anything that he has uh, that he has uh, ready for me. And you know, with that being said. I'm very confident and I know what I'm going to do out there. I, I expect to finish him in the first round. And uh, if that doesn't happen, finish him in the second. And if that doesn't happen, I'll finish him in the third, but he's not making it 15 minutes, full minutes. I'm confident in that. So um, yeah, but I think there's always room for concern whenever you're going to a fight, no matter what. Considering how fast your pro fights have gone, do you feel any kind of pressure? Like, okay, I need to be the first round guy, at least for the first few. Do you put that pressure on yourself? Yeah, I, I definitely do. I, I wouldn't say I put that pressure on myself because of what I've done in the past. It's not necessarily like, oh, I've finished all these guys in the first round. Like, I have to keep this going. It's more like that's just what I expect every time, no matter what. Anytime I would go out to a wrestling match, I expected to pin the guy, you know, and anytime I'm going out into a fight, I'm expecting to finish the guy. If things don't go exactly as I'm, I'm, I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket. And, you know, I see some guys that go out and it's like, guns blazing for three minutes and then they're done. And it's like, that's not really, I'm, I'm too smart to do that. So that's not going to be somebody that's not going to be a strategy for me in fighting, but I just feel very capable and very dangerous in a lot of different positions. And, and I think I have the ability to finish the fight wherever it goes. And so with that, um, I think the expectations for a finish are on me and that's just an expectation for myself. Every time I compete, how many fights are we shooting for this year? Three, four, what are we shooting for? Yeah, um, I would say probably three. Uh, we'll, we'll obviously, you know, I want to take care of this one first and make sure that I put on a spectacular performance and um, kind of uh, are just really make the most of my arrival into the, into the organization. And then we'll go from there. You know, if I can fight again in the summer, that would be great. But, uh, you know, for me, I don't like to, especially the more I've learned about the the pace of fighting and like the planning and all that stuff, it's almost, you, you almost can't really even think ahead. You just got to focus on what's, what's right in front of your face. And then once you get that done with, then reassess, it's just better to do it that way. Okay. Um, along those lines, uh, you know, you, you have said in the past, while Izzy was champion, like you, you liked your chances in a fight like that. Uh, since we last spoke, Izzy is no longer the champion. It's Alex Pereira, and they're fighting again. Um, similar type of fighter, though. How do you feel you would match up against an Alex Pereira? You know, that's that's a uh, relatively, I would say, I'm not going to say easy fight because he's dangerous, but as far as styles go, that's a great matchup for me. You know, um, I watched their fight a couple times, and the grappling, you know, the striking exchanges are super impressive. You know, that goes without without saying is they're they're absolutely elite strikers but when they get a hold of each other it's just almost like funny like i'm like <laughs> like laughing at like how they're moving and what they're doing and stuff because it's um and maybe maybe they feel that way about me when i'm like hitting pads and hitting the bag and stuff but i just feel like if i grabbed a hold of either of those guys it wouldn't it wouldn't go well for them um and i think everybody everybody knows that so that's not something that's like a shocking statement or that's like pretty that's outlandish in my opinion but you do have to get to them, right? Like, let's say in this fictitious yeah. world, you, you feel comfortable that you'd be able to bypass the striking, shoot for the takedown, and then do your thing mm -hmm. on the ground? Yeah, of course. You know, I think that um, the more that I experience MMA, the more experience I get in, in sparring and, and things like that, you just understand the range a little better. You understand when you're in danger. And reality is, like, whenever I'm fighting a, a guy who's a striker, that they have all the anxiety. I have none. Like they have to come, like if they're going to knock me out, they got to either like be like, like catch me coming in like somehow, which is incredibly difficult to do or like walk me down and hope I don't take them down as that's going on. So it's just like, I have all the advantage in, in, in the pace of how the fight goes and just controlling the distance and that type of thing. Cause 
in reality, like I'm not going to sit here and stand in front of you in a 50 50 situation, and let you kick me in the head. Like I'm either going to be in or out. Right. Like, and, and I know I have good enough cardio and good enough pace that I can do that for 25 minutes if I need to. On top of the fact that once I do grab you and get a hold of you, like you're going to be gassed out, you're going to be done. And that's just if you survive and if you don't get strangled or don't get beat up too bad, the ref stops it. So in my opinion, going like there's there's always going to be that danger of like hey like i lean in and lean the wrong way and get hit but i the more experience i get the less i think that the less likely that's going to happen you know it's wild it feels like every division especially at the top there's one elite grappler in the mix you don't really have that at 85 right now alex izzy robert these are great fighters these are some of the very best on the planet but that's not their forte jared marvin Derek's about to retire Costa, Strickland, uh, Delice is a great one. Hermanson, Drickus. Like, I feel like there's a path there for you. Like, that's right. That's not a crazy thing. It's not crazy at all. I mean, I, I feel like there's absolutely a path. Um, and I think that for me, uh, you know, if I look at, I can look at it two ways. One, like there's an easy path to the title where I could fight, you know, three or four times and get there. But my goal isn't to win the belt and then like be done, right? Like I want to be the best pound for pound fighter on the planet. And so if I do have to co up against other guys that have strong grappling styles, stuff like that, like I'm okay with that. And that's why I train as hard as I do, why I put the time in and and why I want to get better at everything in the in the sport, because my goal isn't to just take what I've done and kind of use that and and get to the top that way right like i want to obviously i'm always going to take advantage of that but i want to make sure that i round out my game and that i can absolutely beat anyone on the planet regardless of what their style is and so um i'm working every day to improve every aspect of my game with that being said like every single time i go into a fight we're wrestling and uh that's always going to be something that i'm taking advantage of by the way, are you like, are you in a rush? Would you say you're in a rush or no, you're not in a rush. Like you're, you're not antsy. You don't want to say, Hey, get me on the fast track. You're cool with taking your time. No. Okay. No, I'm definitely not in a rush. You know, I think that again, this is a, this is a, for me, a goal of being, you don't get to be the pound for pound number one guy in the sport when you're in a rush and you skip steps and you don't develop correctly. Right. Like I'll, I'll, I'll wait a couple years to, be champion and to win the belt um, in order to really achieve my goal of being the best fighter on the planet. Right. Cause like, again, I want to win the belt, but that's not my goal. The belt is part of the goal. It's not the goal. And so I think that for me, just continuing to improve, develop, get better every single day. That's the most important thing, you know, not how fast can I get there? Right. Cause like in, in all honesty, they could probably match me match me up with like two or three fights and then I could fight for the title like early next year. If, uh, if, if they matched me with guys that in, in the right place, but in reality, like I don't want to fight Robert Whitaker at six and zero, hmm. right? Like I want to get to nine, 10, 11 and zero when I'm fighting those guys and make sure that I'm ready to take them out the same way that I'm ready to take out the guys that I'm competing against now. And uh, I think that with develop with correct development and my mindset, that there's uh, no doubt that that's going to happen. Who's number one pound for pound right now, in your opinion? Number one pound for pound. It's I big, mean, it's a big debate between two guys coming off of Saturday. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, obviously Islam won the fight. I wouldn't necessarily put. I mean, I really like. I wouldn't necessarily put Islam at number one pound for pound because he beat Volk. Because you you beat a sm a guy smaller than you. So I don't really think that like ups your, it, it doesn't really like up you that much. Obviously Volk is like, if Volk would have beat him, I think that would have garnered number one pound for pound status. But uh, I, I want to kind of see how a few certain fights play out in the future. Like I want to see Cejudo come back and fight. I obviously want to see John Jones fight. You know, if John Jones can win the belt mm -hmm. uh, heavyweight, like he's automatically right there too. So I feel like there's, three or four guys in the mix right now. And I don't necessarily, that last fight didn't, it almost like made it more unclear, even though Islam won of who, if he would have went out and finished him in like the first or second round, I've been like, that's the guy. But because it was so competitive, I feel like 
it's almost like there's not a clear pound for pound number one right now. What do you think of the grappling in that fight? Really high level. Yeah. Those guys, those guys, really high level, doing a lot of really good things. I was super impressed with uh, Volk. Um, I kind of thought Islam was going to be able to hold him down a little more and and be able to impose a little more than he, he was. So you know, and yeah, overall, I mean, those guys are really, really freaking good. Definitely two guys that I study a lot. I watch a lot of, and I'm seeing the things that are doing well. I'm seeing the mistakes they're making and trying to um, add that, add those things to my game and, and learn from them. Well, a lot of exciting things for you. You're back on March 4th, first UFC pay-per-view T-Mobile Las Vegas, the return of John Jones. What a card, this new deal with better. So a lot to be excited about new haircut as well. new beard EA sports hating. I see them hating on you. What is up? All good. They, first, they love you. They put you on the cover, and then they freaking hate on you. What, what are these ratings? It's all good. I, I don't even play video games, so yeah, it was I don't really... I mean, it's cool. It's a cool thing to like be in the game and all that, but like, I don't really put a lot of stock into that. I was actually a little tight. All my friends now... It's, it's, this is really messed up, actually. All my buddies on the wrestling team, they like love playing the game, and they're all creating their own characters and like beating me up. <laughs> I'm like, bro, what are you guys doing? Like... Wow. Some of them will like it's will that bad they're, they're just like i think it's just they're just being funny they're just yeah. like they're just posting their own creative characters beating me up and stuff but then a lot of them are using me online and dominating people so yeah, it's kind of cool but yeah five-star grappling definitely after this fight all right well looking forward to it thanks for coming on as always congrats on everything good luck on march 4th thanks ariel appreciate you all right there he is bo nickel returning to action and uh, GC had a good, uh, you had a good meme, I believe it was, GC, a couple of days ago, or was it yesterday with Rihanna looking at the card, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. John I Jones, mean, Surreal Gun. Valentina Shevchenko, Alexa Grasso. Keep going. Jeff Neal, Shavkat Rachmanov. Hey, come on. Keep going. Bo Keep Nickel, going, Jamie man. Pickett. Uh, but wait a second, wait a second. Um, I don't have the right, oh, here it is, here it is, because sometimes they get Wikipedia, it's not true. Because 2 plus C. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Just added Mateus Gamera versus Jalen Turner. That is like, oh my God. Now, here's the thing. Love Dan Hooker, but this is a higher level fight. Higher level fight. Huge test for Jalen Turner. Like if he, like if five, five fight finish streak, if he goes in and finishes Mateus Gamera, I mean, that would be unbelievable. First of all, how many freaking fights are on this card? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 fights. Golly. 14. And like they're, is it's like one after the next quality in almost every single one of them. It it might be the most anticipated fight card I've had in in recent memory. Jessica Penne against Tabitha. Don't confuse me with Christina Ricci. Yep, that's what they call her. Uh, Baby Shark. Yeah, Farid Bashrat versus Damon Blackshear. Yep, get another Bashrat brother in there. Uh, Viviani Arujo against Amanda Hibas. Shout out to Hibas. Julian Marquez versus Marc Andre Barrio, the pride of Montreal. Yeah, you were just singing uh, Miley Cyrus. He fumbled that bag. Yep. Uh, Derek Brunson versus Drakus Duplessis. That's like that's where we get started. That's like where it's just like so, woof. Um, okay, okay. Mana Martinez against Cameron. Uh, Ian Gary against Keenan Song. I mean, I'm always excited to watch. Yeah. Ian Gary. And then the return of Cody Garbrandt against Trevin Jones. Yes. yes. <laughs> I mean, there's like there's intrigue in like. 10 of those 14. Hopefully it remains intact. Oh, uh, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Because I mean, and then to finish it with, with John Jones at, at heavyweight. And what about my brother, by the way, wait. getting married on this uh, day? That's absolutely, it's, I mean, it's an atrocity. No, no, it's okay. It's all good. We're very happy. No, 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 no. We'll no it's watching. an atrocity. We'll it is an atrocity. We'll atrocity. be watching, uh, we'll be watching from the reception. It's yeah, crazy. I was going to say, what are you going to have to do? You know, you guys are having dinner. Uh, Ariel, it's time for the toast. Yeah. Uh, John Jones. Is yeah, he's making that walk. walk. No, Bo <laughs> Nickel. It'll probably be around Bo Nickel, right? Yeah, 10 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nickel's yeah. making that walk. Sorry, we're going to have to delay this. Could be quick though. What is he? What is he? Oh, he doesn't have. Uh, there's no line for yeah, that, right? No odds out yet. There's only a, a few fights that have odds so far, but uh, I'm gonna imagine he's gonna be in the minus one thousand, minus fifteen hundred range. I'm, I'm interested. That high? I mean, I want to say they set the line for two eighty two when it was supposed to happen, and he was he was a four digit favorite. I'm gonna be interested in, in parlaying up that inside the distance line for sure. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I hope that that's like in the minus 800 range for us. 
I was hoping for like a minus like 350, minus 400 range, but that would I mean, be nice. he, a bow nickel round one might not be a bad right. Look. I mean, the way that's that a he, lot of pressure. It is pressure, but I mean, bow nickel 60 seconds might not be a bad look after the way he looked on contender series. By the way, how do you feel about the steak thing? Like, you can't possibly. Like I love it. it. You like I love that? It. You, you want to know what I think of well done steaks? I was at a wedding, yes. speaking of weddings, last year, and the meal was steaks. And I was sitting next to a guy that has similar taste as you, and he ordered it well done. Mm-hmm. And I ordered it medium rare, like Bo. And, uh, you know, they deliver the steaks and they get them mixed up. I get the well done. I start cutting into it and I'm just like, oh God, like, what is this? And like, it's tough to get through. Uh. It is, it is brown. It is as done as done gets. Like this guy, like, he was like, screw it. Guy next to me cuts into it, and I was just like, "Oh, dude, I think I think we got mixed up." And so we switched, and like first bite, I was night just and like, day. Oh, I- night and day is, is a that's an understatement of a comparison. Like it's like not that good of food to like possibly one of the best things I can eat. I find medium. the rare to be hard to cut. It's so uh, it's so like rubbery. You're supposed it's, to pick it's it up a with two hands. Style and of, just of toughness. It. What about you, Frank? Do you agree with me? I eat it rare. Yes. Straight up rare? Dude, I mean, the flavor yeah. is so much better. Not even medium rare. I'll do a medium rare and a rare. Let's go over to the Capitol Grill one night and get us a couple steaks. Yeah, you know? where is that? It's a block away. Oh, wow. Did you guys do the uh, the, the, the Brazilian steakhouse thing? No, nah, I had a losing week. Or I mean, I keep Outback promising for the out- show. I, found, yeah. I promise I'm Outback, and then I don't I don't make good on, on my deal. So you haven't been to any? I haven't been to any. One day, soon. M- one day. Maybe that's the new curse. Maybe I'm I'm starting to get where the watch parties might be the new. Curse. Wow, is that becoming show, a thing? Show for the watch parties. I feel so good about my bets. I'm like, oh, big winning night in store. I'm feeling great, and then it's just like loser, loser, loser. And it's all of a sudden I'm like, ever since you oh. started the watch party, I swear. Ever since like I used to, that's when I would make my dough is on these pay per views. Oh. Now I show up to these watch parties. I'm like, ay caramba! I think I've only had one winning night out of out of five watch parties. I mean, it's, I mean, we get the, in other words, it's the Mike Heck curse. It's the Mike Heck curse. The Maga Men draw happen. I mean, it's just like, uh, you know, uh, we do have something on the books, me and Frank cocaine bear. Oh, when it comes out. Yeah. He texted me after work the other day. He was like, actually in all seriousness, like, let's go see cocaine bear. You guys are really interested in this. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, By the way, I saw the poster. It said based on a true story. Based on actual events. Uh, North Georgia mountains, I believe. An actual bear. Alabama. Somewhere in the South. Took cocaine. Yeah. And I think he died like very quickly after jeez uh yeah turn your brain off very similar to the meg uh shark movie mm. better than jaws in my opinion but uh yeah it's called the meg yeah it's about a megalodon i thought it was like when you kick a soccer ball between someone's legs uh oh, just that. Yeah. it's just that on a loop yeah that's been that's it. like yep. my my kids are very into the meg i didn't even know that was a thing i didn't even know that was a term Oh like, yeah, Meg them. You like walk I'm walking in my house and like boom, Meg oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Classic. That's you gotta, good stuff. You, you gotta be on your uh, P's and Q's. All right, guys, time now for everyone's favorite segment of the week. It is time. It's time yeah. for a good old fashioned Q and A MMA. What do you fans? think we got? Any good questions? We I shall find out. Questions. You think so? Yeah, I could tell. To hear from the man himself, you know, I saw some people Ariel were saying Hawaii. that uh, moderator Lewis was phoning it in. Like he didn't studios. have the same Who are these people? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you something. This guy is more reliable than the freaking weatherman. Every Wednesday around 12.45 Eastern time, Ariel he sends us the questions. Hawaii. He picks the best questions. I go back and see, hmm, were there better ones? Absolutely not. Mm. Don't doubt this guy, all right? Tough to get up when you're sleeping in satin sheets, you know. That's, That's right. What saying about him, he's no. I'm not saying that. The people are accusing him of that. That's what I'm saying. That's what the people are saying. Yeah, I, I'm saying he's on that grind. All right, he embraces that grind, like DC King Tyler is first up, and he was the first one to get on the board. Hello, Ariel and crew. In the last six and a half years, our man Dustin Poirier has only lost twice, Habib and Charles, in championship bouts. He is the only top seven lightweight coming off a win that isn't already matched up and the only lightweight in the top 15 pound for pound not named Islam or Charles, given how Volks, all respect to the number one pound for pound king from down under, fight played out. I think DP could also get in there and make a fun, exciting fight that he could win. Given the current lightweight landscape, this is the best PPV matchup as Connor is already lined up and not making 55 anytime soon. Could you and the team get behind this fight next in lightweight? While Vogue unifies the featherweight belts. Thanks as always, King Tyler. Funny you should ask. I was just talking to Mr. Dustin Poirier recently, and we were both talking about the fact and agreed 
on the fact that there is nothing for him right now. How is this possible? Now, this is a bit of a byproduct of his longevity, but just look at the rankings. Charles, Dustin, Gaethje fought. Benil looks like he's booked. Chandler, Connor, Faziev booked against Gaethje. Gamrot just got booked. Also, they're ATT brothers. Tarukian, RDA, Jalen Turner has a fight. Hooker injured. And then, and then we're starting to get to the bottom of the division. Moicano's out there. Also ATT. By the way, Drew Dober is next. I'm told no truth to the rumor that he's fighting Patty Pimblett. I saw something on Twitter about that. I asked Dober's team. They have not been approached about this. Um, could it happen? Sure. But as of right now, they weren't approached about it. Uh, so there's no obvious thing. 170, they're a little big. Um, I don't know what he's going to do. You know, it actually makes more sense if you ask me to do Benil versus Dustin than Benil versus Charles. But if what you're asking me is this, are you asking me, should you do Dustin versus Islam off the bat, like right now next for Islam? I don't know. It feels a little unfair to Benil. He's got that long winning streak. Would I be upset? No. Do I think there's a great story to be told? Yes. Is he the odd man out right now? Yes. And again, Benil's fighting in May, but also have to remember Ramadan is coming up. And so that could affect Islam's timing. Like I, I, I don't think he fights before Ramadan and Ramadan is March, April-ish. And then he's going to need time after that. So tough. It's a funny world where he beats Michael Chandler at MSG. Chandler gets the big prize, the Connor fight, and the Ultimate Fighter. And Dustin's just kind of wondering, what do you got? I don't know. Anyone else out there have uh, an idea for for Dustin Poirier? GC Rick? I don't know. Anyone? Patty Pimblett. Dustin versus Patty Pimblett. Are you being serious? That is bananas. <laughs> that would be fantastic. How long would that last? I don't know. I don't think Patty's around. Fight. Patty versus Drew Dober. For a minute that, there, I was like... That is what we need. That would be our hero, Drew Dover. <laughs> that chin going in there. Oh, He would... Be fantastic. Moicano versus Patty would be a fun one. Oh, yeah. The lead up to both those would also yeah. be fantastic. I don't know what to do with Dustin. Honestly. Tough one. There's really, Unless he's going to fight like an Armin Sarukian, and I don't know if that gets him excited. I, I don't know if there's an answer to that question right now. I have to uh, wait and see how... Some of these fights play out. King Zalo, greetings, Ariel. This is tough. But your take on the whole pound for pound situation had me in fumes as you continuously defy your own logic. Really? I'd love an explanation as to how someone could win the contest but not the fight. Really? Isn't the fight the contest? Alex fought Islam the same weight class of 155. It's not like he contested the bout at 145. If he beat him, he takes the spot. At least from your perspective, to clarify, I tend to side with Rick's pound for pound point of view and firmly believe Volk should remain atop. Cheers to you and the whole crew. Wait, so we ultimately, what you're saying is we agree, but you don't agree with my logic. All right, fine. Again, pound for pound is fictitious. I saw someone saying, oh, are we just handing out participation trophies now? That's exactly what pound for pound is. Participation trophy is pound for pound. Pound for pound is one big fat participation trophy. That's what it is. It's not a real belt. It's not a real division. It's not a real weight class. It's just, it's, it's fantasy. And so what I meant by won the fight, not the contest, won the contest, not the fight, it's that even Bruce Buffer says it. The judges score the contest for, he says contest. Contest is what just happened. And yes, I, you could go with won the fight, not the night. We could go with that one too. But at the end of the day, if we're looking for the fictitious, like who's the baddest man on the planet? Who came out on top? Who took less damage? Who inflicted more damage? To me, that was Voke. And so in this fictitious world of pound for pound, he wins. And by the way, the official UFC rankers appear to agree with me as well. Now, I don't know what their explanation was, but that's all it is. And it's, look, no shame in being two, especially when you haven't been at, at the top. I mean, what was Islam ranked before the Oliveira fight? Guy's got a whole career ahead of him. He's going to be one in no time, probably. Chill out. But I think on the night, Alex proved that he is number one. That's what I think. It's not clean. And I've said it before. You beat someone in their own weight class, 
Leon, Usman, Alex, Izzy. You got to give them the nod. But now, you know, pound for pound, fantasy, who's the baddest man if everything was equal? I think it was Alex. By the way, why are you so upset? Why are you so upset? We agree. What's your problem? Cash Cody. Good day, Ariel. With Volk putting up the fight of his life against Islam and both men putting on a thrilling fight, where would you rank this in terms of championship fights, attempts to become dab- double champ? Thank you again, Ariel, for putting on a great show and answering as many questions as possible. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know if it's my favorite fight. It's, no, I don't think it's my favorite fight of all time, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was thinking back to the recent main events and there have been some really good ones. Um, I was trying, like, Izzy Pereira was a great fight back in November. Islam Charles was somewhat one-sided. I mean, there have been some good fights, but, like, this is up there. I, I loved it. I loved I loved the 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 drama. I loved the chess match. I loved the back and forth. I loved the intrigue. I loved the size difference. I loved everything about it. The historical element attached to it. Attempts to become double champ, hard to say. I mean, I don't know if anyone who has tried to become double champ ever, and there haven't been a ton, fell short like this, right? Um, like Izzy, that, that wasn't really a close fight. Didn't have that drama. I was also at the apex. Just didn't have that feel. It wasn't, you know, just wasn't the same in Australia. And by the way, can I just say one thing about Australia? Like this hasn't been said enough. And it, I don't think it was said enough going into the fight. Islam didn't get enough credit for taking that fight in Australia. Not a lot of people would do that. You're the champ and they're fighting for your belt. And you're going to go to his hometown shortly-ish, four months after you just won the belt and uh, defend against that guy moving up who has nothing to lose, everything to gain. Tough spot. Didn't get enough credit for that. Not a lot of champions would defend their title first, second, third, fourth, fifth time in the challenger's home country. Now, again, I know this is a little bit different because Volk is a champion as well, but they were fighting for his belt, for Islam's belt. Uh, I think he deserves some credit for that. Santana127, hey, what is up, Ariel? Love from Panama, land of the great Roberto Duran. Wow, what a legend. With this performance against Islam, regardless of the outcome, and also remaining as number one pound for pound, do you think that Volk, has a free ticket kind of like money in the briefcase, money in the bank briefcase that he could just defend his 145 title and just be the number one contender at 155 whenever he chooses and whomever the champion is, considering no one has even touched us in that division other than that one loss. Alex might be the toughest matchup for Islam at 155. How crazy is that? And he's the 45 champ. That being said, I don't think he has this free ticket to just fight for the belt whenever, um, unless he you know, vacates the 45 belt, and I don't think he wants to do that. I did see I did see Islam say something like, oh, I knew I wasn't going to be ranked number one because I see how they treat us, and I'm assuming he's referring to the, the Russian fighters because he mentioned Magomed, he mentioned Pyotr Jan. I mean, was Magomed robbed? I don't think Magomed was robbed. Was Jan robbed? Uh, that was just a super close fight in Abu Dhabi. I don't know. I don't believe that there's any anti-Russian bias when it comes to ranking, especially not the UFC rankings because it's pretty much the UFC doing those rankings. What are you drinking there? It's good stuff, Frank. I got to tell you. It's actually better than the actual. Wow. Um, but yeah, Alex might be his toughest matchup. Was I mean, that's kind of a crazy thought if you think about it. 45 champ. Hi, Ariel. Loved your interview with Jens Pulver on Monday. This is from Dupes. My question is, why is Sterling not considered higher on the pound for pound list? Many of the men's weight class champions have less title defenses than him. And he has wins over very high level fighters like Sanhagen, TJ, and Piotr. Is it strictly the nature of some of his wins and injured TJ in a close decision to Dion? Thank you, Dupes. I mean, I can't answer for everyone. I'll tell you where I have him ranked because I had to do this as well. Stand by, stand by. Here it is. I have him ranked fifth. Alex one, Islam two, Leon three, Kamaru four, Aljamain five. Higher than Kamaru, higher than, I mean, I, I feel pretty good about that. 
Charles six, Alex seven, Izzy eight. Remember he beat him, goes on. Uh, Brandon and Yuri. What do you guys think of that? What do you think of those rankings, GC? You like them? You agree with them? Hate them? Eh, I don't know. You have Islam I, one? Oh, man. <laughs> what? I, I don't have an official rankings. I just I, like I think I'm already exhausted on this topic. Oh, it's a great topic. Everywhere I go, it's I mean, everywhere. It's just, I mean, has it ever been better than now? I mean, Never. When you're into basketball, it's it's Michael Jordan, LeBron. When you're in MMA, it's pound for pound rankings. You know, eh, that's a little different. That's a historical thing. This is a current thing. Both are hypothetical. Your own opinion, 100%. your own view, thousand percent can't ever get to an end of it. No one's going to change anyone's opinion. I couldn't agree more. It's so stupid to get Endless. worked up over this. Oh, and people <laughs> and they get worked Scroll up. Scroll on Twitter, man. People get worked up about it. But would you? I got Islam one. I got Islam. Okay, one fair. Totally fair. That's, that's I mean, it's I a do. totally fair, insane, ludicrous opinion. Uh, do, Thanks, would man. you have so Aljo five? Let's say you have Islam one, Alex two, Alex two, Leon three. You have Kamara over Leon? Yeah, this is where we're getting into What? Yeah. But then you make that, then I'm contradicting myself. Yes. Because Leon beat yes. Usman. Listen, I need to give my official rankings and, and come wow. prepared next time with them. I mean, this is... But Aljo 5, I think, is not bad. By the way... I don't think that's bad. It, it's, it's an amazing time in the sport where so many of the pound-for-pound pound guys are actually fighting each other. Alex Islam, um, Alex... Sorry, Alex Islam, Alex uh, Pereira and Izzy. Uh, who else we got? Charles and, and and Islam, you know, some people might have Jamal Hill in that mix. I have Yuri in that mix. Um, some people do 15. I do 10. I feel like 10 is an appropriate number. I don't know. I think it's fun. Do you have Dustin Poirier in your top 10? Top 10 pound for pound right now? No. But I, I wouldn't hate. I mean, I have Yuri up there. Hmm. I try to give the nod to the champ. And to me, you know, as I've said, and I've gone very, you know, very much in trouble for this. Yuri, to me, is still the light heavyweight champ. Yeah, you have gotten in trouble for The that. big question is, what happens if John Jones wins on, on oh, March 4th? He's going to skyrocket. Does he skyrocket to one? I mean, if he goes out there and finishes Cyril Gunn, I think that's probably what's going to happen. Even though Cyril isn't the champion. Just the fact that he beats a heavyweight. But a very, a, the, yeah. you know, the top prospect right. in heavyweight. That's a crazy... Yeah, I actually, I, I don't hate it. Considering where he left, and I don't think by the time he left, he was number one anymore because some of the... For me, I think I might have had Habib up there. Um, where's Usman if he comes back and beats Leon? Where's oh, Leon if geez. he beats Usman again? Where's oh, Alex if he beats Izzy hey, again? Flip it. I mean, this is just... It's pound for pound season. Everybody's loving it. By the way, no one talks about the women these days, but mine is... Um, Valentina Amanda, and you could flip those two. Uh, Zhang Wei Li, Chris Cyborg, Carlos Barza, Rose, Andrade, Juliana Pena, Tyler Santos, Mano Fioro. There you go. Thanks. You're, Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, oh, my guy, Andrew Feldman, MMA. What's up, Ariel and crew? As you know, the pound for pound rankings came out and have Volk 1, Islam 2, Leon 3, Usman 4. Wow, that's exactly mine. Izzy five, Pereira six. Don't think that's fair to Aljo. Can you remember a time in which the top six pound for pound fighters are all coming off of matchups with one another? Yeah, it's true. But again, I don't agree with those. Um, but close enough. In the pretty rare occurrence that Volk and Islam end up having an immediate rematch, then all three matchups will have had immediate rematches in 2023. If anything, what does this tell you about the current landscape of MMA? Which rematch would you be most excited for out of the one potential and two already booked matchups Folk Islam, Leon Usman, Izzy Pereira, geez Louise. All of them? It's hard to pick. Maybe Volk Islam after all of this. You know what I mean? But I mean, I'm super excited for Leon Usman. Super excited for Izzy Pereira. Hard to pick. But it's a good time to be a fan. Like we said, the next few pay-per-views are all tremendous. Cheeto Pancakes. What is up, Ariel? I would be remiss if I didn't wish you... A happy national flag of Canada Day today. Wow. How come no one wished this to me? Can't get this out. Crypto put it in too tight. <gasps> it's too tight. Can't even get it out. I was going to wave it. Put your back into it. Dun, 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 dun,
Hope it's been a good one. Anyways, my question is about the UFC's crop of talent brewing at basically every weight class. After another impressive performance from JDM, I thought about some of the other fast-rising prospects in the UFC and wondered where you and the guys would rank these fighters based upon highest ceiling and potential to one day hold UFC gold. All right, here we go. Jack Della Maddalena, Jalton Almeida, Umar Nurmagomedov, Ilya Tapuria. Golly. I feel like I feel like GC's going with Jalton. Can you rank them? Actually, no, you love Jack too. Dude. The three were Jalton, Four, Ilya, Almeida, Adela. JDM, Umar Namagomedov, oh, Ilya Tapuria. Oh my God. All right. So, so far, actual accomplishments and like still having that huge prospect value. I mean, I, I would say Ilya is one. Like, I mean, that win over Bryce Mitchell was unbelievable. That was impressive. a big one. Yeah. Jalton, two, because. He literally, like, we have yet to see him struggle. Like, it's like he just toys with his opponents and they land one significant strike and he always gets a finish. JDM, like, before the finish with Randy Brown, like, Randy Brown was having some success. So I'll go sure. JDM three. But then Umar, I mean, the way that he finished, uh, Heoni Barcelos was like just freakish. It's, it's literally like one, two, three, mm -hmm. four. Like, they're all in the exact same. I mean, anytime any of them fight, it's it's must watch television. I'll go. Uh, I'll go Umar three, JDM four. I, <clears throat> Rick, I got Jalton. Jalton one. I can't blame you. The, can't hate the on path. That. The path is the easiest. I was. We're I was, talking about. Thank you. I was just we're about say to say that. championship. The yeah. path is just so much easier for him than any of these other guys. Yeah. Um. Then for me, it's a toss up between <laughs> Umar and Ilya. Could have either one and then JDM last. And I feel like a goof yeah. because he's so damn good. But it's like, there's no bad fighters. And like, these guys are all so damn good. It's, it's an impossible task. It's pick your favorite kid. Um, The only one I'm really sure of is Jalton one, just because those path, divisions yeah. are sparse and, and he can. Heavyweight, light heavyweight. Pick your poison. Yeah. I agree with that. Almeida, Taporia, Nermagomedov, Madalena. But it's, I mean. 1A, B, C, and D. Yeah, some good young prospects coming up. Where's Bo Nickel in that mix? Too soon? Too soon, probably. Bo Nickel, is 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 Bo Nickel fight? Does Bo Nickel fight for a belt in 2024? Yeah or nay? What do you guys say, Rick? 2024, I'll yeah. say yeah. You say yeah? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. 2024, I mean, I mean, he could fight four times, five times before that. Sure. We just saw this with Alex. If they want it to happen. Yeah. If, there, if there's a road to getting somebody into a title opportunity and that person can capitalize on it. Yeah. And I think Bo Nickel can, then it's it's possible. So I would say I would say yay. Can we talk about the haircut? How do we feel about the haircut? I mean, I, uh, I think he said it. He's trying to be like you. I like his hair. I really I like mean, it. He has great hair. It's, it was it's... like really flowy. It was it was healthy. I like the look. I don't know. As Let the man a, live. I'm just saying, hairline, could... like it. It feels a, like a crime to to not capitalize on that hairline. I mean, I love the guy. I'm a big fan. I just I, I was. Uh, I... Rick, you wouldn't understand. I mean, you get your head shaved, and then well, a week later, this is what we're working with. You're like a, a chia pet. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I like the uh, hair. I liked it. Okay, I'm not saying I, I don't like it, but like there has to be a one and a two, right? Like there has to be. I have a, a feeling. In Islam. I, <laughs> I have a feeling it will. It will. He will choose different hairstyles. You know what I mean? Like I think maybe this for now. He goes back to to growing it out. You know, like, grapplers on, love on, to change their style. The head every once. In a while. Yeah, when his when his champ will have the hair out, and then we'll see the old highlights of the shaved head. It'll right. Be, oh man, this is early bone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I like the hair. Um, but I feel like these rappers love to change their style. Gary Tonin changes. I mean, I've never seen a guy change. He's a he's a different breed. That he just looks Gary. like a completely different human being. Even Gordon Ryan. <laughs> I was gonna say Gordon Ryan with the with the white. Yeah, it's all crazy. I'm for it. Yeah, I'm for right. the style change. Style blender. Uh, Zach J. Good morning from SoCal. I wanted to get your thoughts on Verdict MMA, the app where people can vote for who won each round. Zach for sure works for Verdict. Asking me to, uh, um, if this global scorecard was implemented as a replacement for the judges, would this fix judging? Or would it become a popularity contest? I appreciate your time and everyone's hard work. So, uh, full disclosure, full disclosure. I hear you laughing, GC. Full disclosure. I really like the guys behind Verdict. Uh, I know some of them. I don't know all of them. You said that they have to for sure work for Verdict. The fact that they use the phrase global scorecard, like that's their thing. And they like 
he's got to work for Verdict. That being said, again, I didn't choose the question. Um, I really like them a lot. I will also say I have never used it. Uh, I just, you know, I'm doing a lot. I'm not putting in my score. But I think you have, right? Oh, yeah. I've used it a ton. I make my picks there every week. I mean, we got the biggest league uh, on the app. But you make your picks. Do you actually score fights on there? I don't score as much, but they, like, give you an incentive. You get experience points if you score it. It is fun to, like, score the rounds on there and, like, see what other people are thinking because it does, like, update live as to what people think. I mean, it is cool. It seems like a great idea and fun. I don't think, I mean, you can't Could just it ever replace no, it. No, just, I, I agree. It's popularity contest at times. Right. I mean, like, it's just, it's a cool indicator, but when people post that and say like this, you know, this verdict had Vogue as the winner. I'm like, all right, cool. That's what the, fa- that's, that's no different than me doing a Twitter poll. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could be interesting to see, but like, you can't, you can't give people that credibility to properly score the fight like what if like you have a huge bet on a guy like you're just gonna score every single round for him no matter what i feel like rick has a hot take on this let's hear it i mean if the hot take if if my take is hot by saying we're gonna fix judging by turning it over to the uneducated (laughs) fans of this sport then call me you know whatever the hottest thing on earth is no, I mean, I can't imagine that being a hot take. It's that a fun thing. I like that they have integrated the picks and all that, but it, it's that. Nothing more, nothing less, right? It isn't the future of judging. Uh, Taco Enthusiast asks, Hi, Ariel. I support open scoring. Now, by the way, you know what? You know what? Could I just say? How, I we didn't even think of this. How would open scoring have affected Saturday night's main event? Uh, I'm honestly shocked it took you this time to mention it. We, we were discussing it on Monday in the back. We were like, it, man, uh, he hasn't said open score. It was What's a very on? big uh, 2022 thing. I haven't really brought it up in 23. I don't think it would have affected it at nah, all. No, I wouldn't think, no. Not because he came on strong in the fifth, maybe the fourth. Yeah. I thought the most one of the most interesting things that he said in the interview was the lapse of judgment, talking smack. He was getting cheeky. If he doesn't give up that takedown in the fourth, what happens? That might have been the fight right there. I mean, yeah, he could have won the round. Right. And then he would have won the fight. Anyway, open scoring, still love it. But I think he says open scoring would have hurt the quality of the Volk versus Islam fight. Without knowing who was ahead, that fifth round became one of the most fun, dramatic, and iconic rounds I can remember. Picture open scoring, though. If Volk knew he had to get the finish in the fifth, and Islam knew he would coast to victory, would we have been robbed of the fifth round spectacle that we witnessed? Do you feel like open scoring would have negatively impacted the quality of the specific fight? No, I really don't. You can't get me to say anything negative about open scoring. I'm sorry. By the way, New York Rick's comments on the zero-sum game of post-fight reactions were spot on. Thanks for your wisdom, Rick. Again, the 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 baby face turn of 23 for New York Rick, something to behold. A lot of people have been saying, you have the best takes lately. You're the most sensible one, the least emotional one. I know you don't I, like I that. Appreciate, How many burners does this guy have? <laughs> yeah, I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate the the vocal minority there because my mentions are uh, are a wow. war zone still. So wow. Uh Chris P. Happy Valentine's Day to the best show in sports. Wow. How about that? Very nice. Ariel, just wanted to make a comment about the cost of being a UFC fan. As someone who is way too anxious about buffering issues to ever risk. Missing a big moment. I buy 95% of all UFC pay-per-views. Occasionally, I will have a scheduling conflict that causes me to miss an event, but I don't let that happen often. I hear you constantly saying that asking a fan to shell out $75 is a big ask, and I appreciate you shedding light on the issue. Sometimes the price is warranted. Oftentimes, it is questionable. I'm sure many other viewers in my position would have yelled at their screen, phone, radio when they hear you bring up $75 price tag recently because as of last month, and UFC 283, the price is now $80. Wow. It's $80 now. I guess $79.99. Which leads me to this question for the crew. $80 is a lot, man. Jeez Louise. That's like the price of an actual ticket to watch a sporting event live. Which leads me to this question for the crew. When you get together, are invited guests pitching in on the cost? Is it rude to ask? How much are we pitching in? What are the social norms to having guests over or being invited to an $80 pay-per-view gathering? All right, can I weigh in on this first? Please. If I'm inviting you to my house to watch the pay-per-view, I'm paying for it. Simple as oh, that. Oh, oh, oh. No? Completely di- yes, completely disagree. Why? It's my, You're coming to me. 
Yeah. You're you're my guest. It's my treat. Well, you, you're going to go around being like, hey, can I have five? That's a very mysterious Frank move. Can I get $5? Wait a Ten minute. Only 10, bro. <laughs> no, no, no. See, you're both, right. you're both right because it's how it's presented, right? If I say, come on over, watch the fight, that's an invitation. Sure, pay for it. I get it. I would do the same. But you can also upfront discuss, hey, do you guys want to split the fight and come over? That that eliminates the need for it, you don't if that's ask them to show up and then ask them for money. If that's discussed just, that's beforehand, fine. fine. But you can't yeah. have people over and be like, "Hey, hey, my, my Venmo name is," uh, no. you know what I mean? Discuss it prior. Mm, depends if it's your boys or not. The real mysterious Frank move is to be like, "Yo, everyone, send me ten, fifteen bucks," uh, and then he just illegally streams it anyway and doesn't. What? Pay per view. Frank's not done this. Saying that I've done yeah. that. You're kidding. How do you know? Yeah. UFC 275, he did that. I just want to also point out that <laughs> Connor has never charged me to watch a pay-per-view at his house. By the way, uh, he the person told me, have. like, he started to watch, and he's like, where's your stream? Oh. And I had to reach into my bag and pull out my laptop. <laughs> you got to watch on your own. <laughs> By the way, what are you eating, Frank? Not a damn thing. It sounds like you're eating That's something. That's Joe. Free. That is a thousand percent. That's totally you. Joe. By he way, is leaned over my microphone right now. I, so rude of him. You're allowed to eat. No. What's going on in the uh, control room? Let's take a look. Oh, wow. Oh, there he Joe. is. Yeah. Uh, See, he's still chewing. Yeah. <laughs> Any evidence? Look at him chewing. Mm. As this is, Frank's doing all this and his left hand is, is fully in a bag. Why can't you admit that you're eating something? We heard you going. I don't know what you're talking about. We well, have questions to get to. Yeah. All right. Fine. Um, no, I don't. I don't ask people to pay. I think this is also circumstantial, too. You know. By the way, do I owe anyone for the Royal Rumble thing, or do you guys owe me? Because I said seven dollars and fifty cents. I owe you seven fifty, but I want. I don't know if it's you directly, but somebody owes me seven dollars <laughs> fifty cents. <laughs> I paid all my money. That's all. I, I don't know because I. I yeah, want. Oh, that's, yeah, you never put your money in the pie. Yes, but but because so everybody who put their money in their pie came to me. But I was owed eighty seven fifty. I only got eighty. Just saying. <laughs> I mean, you're the one who brought this up. I wasn't gonna say anything. <laughs> but I won as well. So why would I have to pay? You only won seventeen dollars, right? I don't know. What did he win? Can I have no? This, idea. This has just been so remember. poorly handled. Is, like yeah. no, all it was a simple task. Money, then mow the money over. And then we would sort so it So I out. owe you seven fifty, even though I want yeah. half? Somebody does. No, I don't think you owe him seven fifty. Yeah, that can't be possible. You that can't be right. I won eighty seven fifty. That is crazy. I've only received $80. <laughs> look at I the, have the receipts to back Look it up. at the conviction involved. Because you did actually follow up in the, in yeah, the text I said chain. It. Well, even Alex was like, bro, I don't have the seven fifty. You're going to have to take that up with them. I'm like, wow. I think some people forgot to Venmo, didn't they? Oh, I definitely didn't Venmo because my thing was... Uh, <laughs> no, but listen, listen. No, no. No, but he's owed money. I'm owed I, money. I understand. I told yes, you guys you don't have to pay me. I mean, the agreement was, you know... I won! Venmo beforehand. <laughs> that's that's what would have sorted I'm the one be this. Okay, fine. And then so we then get the buzzer up. beater, the, the last minute aerials. So pay like, me up. Oh, do we want to do most eliminations? He I was trying having to, the most eliminations. That, that's actually not true. I was trying to help you out because you were belly aching. Oh, I'm not going to win. Belly aching. Oh, I'm not going to win. He was right, though. I was, was correct. Right. I was trying to give you in incentive to actually be more invested in it. You were trying it. to squeeze more juice out of us here. You were like, another 10 can't hurt anybody. Uh, I got C Rose. Like, I knew. I don't want to... I don't want to allege anything, but you know, you're there. Alleged. You got a little yep. bit. Wow. Mm -hmm. I actually, I feel like mean, we're, we're seeing insulted. the men's Royal Rumble just getting started. And you're like, wow, Rhea Ripley wins the women's <laughs> Royal Rumble. You're like, dude, you're two hours ahead of us. Yeah. How did you oh know? Oh my like, God. You know, by the way, you guys want to do most eliminations? Okay. This is what I get for being a good person. I now I want to get paid. How do I, I get paid? Wait, you have to wait in line. Uh, First, the escrow. I get paid. Wow. You get paid. Gotta talk to the escrow. There's got to be money in there for me. What happened to that money? Where did it go? You never even put your money down. Where did the money Just based go on that I was owed? You should have done that. Oh, I was trying to be a good guy. Okay. Do so you, you sit in front of a slot machine or like, hmm, I'll put my quarters in after I win? The I actually. Of times that, the amount of times that I've heard this slot machine metaphor. <laughs> wow. So like, this is like the 18th time Frank has said that. So I left the show that day thinking, man, I'm such a good guy. Like, I didn't make that. That's pay. the actual that's tragedy would, here. That's is that you you've created you such a problem and that you still think that and you were the best. Man, I'm such a good wow. guy. Wow. And, and, and in turn, you guys were all saying that I was being a cheapskate. That's what happened? Not cheapskate, just can't be bothered. Wow. Like 750 doesn't mean anything to you. All right, this is, this is a lot to handle right now. 
Uh, let's move on. Chad, greetings, Ariel. The Islam Vogue fight this Saturday was one of the best high stakes technical displays I can remember over the last 10 years or so. I came away even more impressed with Vogue than I was leading up to the fight. Islam showed heart as well as the ability to fight through championship adversity as well. Can you remember all throughout MMA history about with such unbelievably high stakes and historical ramifications where the loser came out with even higher stock than they went into the fight with? I believe Volk's name resonates even more after Saturday night. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's definitely been times where the loser's stock went up, though. I think Gustafson's stock went up big time in the loss to John Jones at UFC 165. Um, like I said, Johnny Hendricks' stock went up big time after the loss to uh, George St. Pierre at UFC 167. Uh, those are two that come to mind. I'm sure, there are others. I'm trying to think, but eh, there's two. So, yeah, it has happened. doesn't happen often, um, but... This one's definitely up there. Will P, happy belated Valentine's Day to the entire crew, as well as my guy, moderator Lewis. Shout out. Following Volk's incredible performance Saturday, I wanted to ask a big picture question about his legacy up against the other three undisputed featherweight champs. Aldo, Connor, Max. All future Hall of Famers, without a doubt, all with unique dominant stretches in the division. I was curious how you'd rank them at this point. I think it sparks an interesting discussion on what you value most in a title reign. Length, strength of opponent, head-to-head, -head. Also was interested to hear, despite Connor never defending the belt, how much weight you put on him being the only of the four to successfully, at this point, capture title in another weight class. Thanks, as always. And go Sammy this Saturday. Sorry if this was too long. Um, am I... Aldo, get, it's tough because they don't all meet at the same point in their career. Jose Aldo was the one who, you know, put the division on the map. He was the face of the division. He made it feel big and important and had an incredible run. Volk did beat him, but it was later in his career. Also has the wins over Max. I feel like the two most... Max has wins over Aldo, Connor. I don't know, man. It's a tough one. It really is because they all actually fought each other. Um, except for Connor and Volk. Uh, Gun to my head, I, I feel like the appropriate answer is this is it crazy to say Vogue Max? I don't even know. Because how can you put Connor over Aldo? Because of the longevity. Vogue, I mean, could could you possibly do Vogue Max Connor Aldo? Mm. Can you do Vogue Max Aldo Connor? Can you do Aldo? Maybe the answer is Aldo, Volk, Max, Connor. I don't know. Connor was the one that broke the streak. This is a really tough question. New York, Rick, what do you think? Yeah, it's extremely tough. I don't, uh, you know, much like with the pound for pound, I don't, I don't put all the stock into the head, for, head to head, right? So I would not have Connor above Aldo in any capacity. I think Connor, I think Connor's last just based on the resume in that division. Um, I would probably have Volk, Aldo, Volk, Aldo, Max, Connor. But I could hear Aldo, Max, Connor. Yeah. But I could hear if you swap Max. By the way, isn't that I crazy? Mean, hard. Isn't it crazy that Connor beat Max? I know in a different time, Connor beat Aldo, and then you, you know, like I. Yeah, but it's about body of work. It's it you you can't if you just rely on the head to head, you're in a you're in a loop. It's just, it's just not possible. Yeah, I really don't know who'd you have as number Vol one. Look, Volk's the only one who's not getting beat by these guys, right? Like he's the only one that out yeah. of out of the competitors that we're talking about doesn't have losses. All but all uh, in their prime. Guys. Who's the pick? See, that's a, an interesting question. Oh man, all in their prime. I'm probably going still Volk. I'm probably still going Volk. Yeah, Volk, all in their prime. But man, I would love to see Jose Aldo oh like, kicking Volk in, in his prime. I would love to see those two oh have a striking God. battle. That would be incredible. The problem is, I think that Volk will be able to mix it up. Like he's just yeah. too well rounded. I think so he's good. he's he's an evolution of the game that I don't think we will we will have seen, um, yeah. even at their primes from the other guys. But it featherweight has had some very good champions. We can say that. That's for damn sure. I mean. 
those four guys, incredible. Absolutely incredible. Todd in Dallas, dear content creator Helwani, I've only been addicted to MMA and your show since 2018, and I'd previously never heard of Jens Pulver, but I literally teared up watching him live on the pay-per-view last weekend, and your interview with him on Monday was amazing. His be your own best friend quote will stick with me, and I'll share with my kids for years to come as well. What a super likable dude he is. No question from me this week, but just a note of sincere thanks for giving the good guys of the sport, like him, a platform to speak and share their advice and stories. Todd in Dallas. Thanks. That was nice. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, he's an absolute legend. I love the way he handled it. I love the way he has handled it. I love how much it meant to him, the story about his father and his son. I mean, just amazing stuff. Truly amazing stuff. July is going to be amazing when he gets actually inducted. Uh, quick fire round. Maverick, what's up, Ariel? We see what you see when we see what you see when you have a guest via Zoom. But just out of curiosity, what does your guest see? You at your desk, a close-up of you. So correct me if I'm wrong, guys. They see this camera shot. It's just me turned to the screen. Is that correct? Yeah, they see That's you. That's right. Everyone left. No one's here to answer my question. They all answered you at once. I didn't hear a single thing. Oh. Oh, but I didn't. By the way, for the record, that didn't go through my uh, headphones. Frank, how about you answer on his behalf? I mean, Joe, just talk to him again. No, don't hear it. He hasn't said anything. Oh. (laughs) Hey. Oh, there he is. Now, does the public hear this? I don't know. Wow. Frank? No, you've literally changed your answer on this every time. Sometimes you tell me they do. Sometimes you tell me they don't. Sometimes you tell me that they never bring this up again because they always do. What is it now? They can hear him. Okay, now they can hear him. <laughs> Two weeks ago, they couldn't hear him. Why are you being it's all... a mystery. Well, I have to know if I have to re... Uh, you know how much t- I love you asking me this. That's all I'm saying. You okay, just, so you this know. time, it's yes or no? It's a, a yes. Okay, Joe, what is it? So they see this camera angle. They see this? Yeah. Just me turned here, right? Yep. yep. There you go. Gilbert, yo, Ari J. What story that you broke in your career are you most proud of and why? Oh, my. I don't know. Brock Lesnar coming back UFC 200. Um, you know, it was a big one. Uh, the trade, the DJ Askren trade. That was a big one because it was so weird. GSP coming back was big. I don't know. I mean, there have been some fun ones. I feel like my mind is going to mush and I can't remember them all, but those are some big ones. Uh, the Connor, the Connor, uh, Nate rematch. Alex Weber, a dub, by the way, is it just my headphones or am I peaking a lot? Frank, it's just your headphones. All right. A dub is, uh, is Playa Bulls a recipe bull shop. I'll say this about Playa Bulls. You all know that I'm, uh, I'm very particular about my SC. It is a chain, right? I think they have them all over the tri-state. I don't think it's like an American, like national chain. Maybe I'm, does anyone know? I don't know. Uh, It's actually quite solid. I actually like pliables. Now, now I like it for what it is. I don't like it as, you know, the creme de la creme. It's certainly not in my top five best Aussie experiences because those, the, the top five is in Brazil. But as far as an actual Aussie experience in America, it's actually not bad. It's not bad at all. You guys have had it, right? I think GC had it. Yeah, it's good. It's not bad, but you don't really have, you know, anything to yeah, compare yeah, it to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's I don't have a gauge? What's that? I haven't been to Brazil. Right. Well, you know, I don't know. Are they good in Brazil? They're pretty good. I have to. Yeah. Where would you get yeah, the best know. SAE pool? Is are you? I feel like you guys are mocking me now. Nobody's mocking you, Ariel. Mm. Yo, oh, Frank's answer. You're peaking a little bit, though. Hold on. Am I? No. Yes. I don't really know how much I want to do this anymore. Oh, stop <laughs> it. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I come here, I think I'm home. This is the place I feel most comfortable. And We love you, Ariel. Leroy asks, Lewis won't ask this, but I will anyway. Wow. How about that? A little shade. Folks said, you know what I mean, several dozen times during the interview. When fighters have a verbal tick like this, is this something you notice and think about during the interview? Or are you so in the zone that you are totally unaware? Of? No, I notice. Of course I notice. I noticed Jen Pulver said ironic a lot in the interview. Did you guys notice that? It's just a thing. 
No, but I have picked up on the, uh, you, you know, know what I mean. mean. Yeah, from yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's a legend. Uh, no, of course. Uh, I could tell you about a lot of verbal tics from a lot of different people, including my own, but I'm not going to be that guy. Lewis, what are the team's thoughts on Aaron Blanchfield's chances in her fight against Jessica Andrade on Saturday and what might be next for the winner? Well, I feel like we're going to get GC's thoughts later on in the program. You got a little action on that one? Yeah, I guess you're just gonna have to uh, wait to find out. Okay, a little tease there. And and what uh, what what are the odds for that one right now? What's the line? Uh, main event. Yes, the main event, Aaron Blanchfield. So this you asking main event right now makes me think that you didn't hear the question previously. Yeah. <laughs> what could that's we that's just? Why I had a tease. Yeah, you know, it was, that was a beautiful tease executed. That was a professional and broadcaster and move right there. Pro stuff. But we literally just talked a minute ago. What else could you have yeah, done since no, the last time we spoke? So man, I'm doing work back here. Sometimes the ears zone out. Jeez. I gotta, I gotta click it back in. I feel like uh, right now, currently DraftKings Sportsbook just gone drudge minus one forty. Aaron Blanchfield plus one twenty. Who deserves more credit for this fight? Blanchfield for taking the fight on short notice against Andrade or Andrade for taking the fight on short notice versus Blanchfield? Andrade, because she just fought a couple weeks ago, and I yeah. feel like Blanchfield was just kind of got to get a fight in here. Yeah. It's it's typically going to be the fighter who's higher ranked and yeah. giving their, yeah, giving what, their what, opportunity. What are they going to do? Are they, are they going to main event yeah. Zach Palga versus Jordan Wright? I mean, could you imagine? No. I couldn't imagine either. I couldn't imagine that. <laughs> I couldn't imagine either. They would eventually just have to pay someone seven figures to to step in and, and main event. So how do you feel about how do you feel about over one and a half rounds? Over one and a half rounds? That is currently lined at minus two forty. Is, is, is this what you're thinking? Minus two forty plus one seventy five? Yeah, what do you think? Why is this is this your parlay? I don't know. The fan that's the I mean You like it or no? Yeah. Fight Even goes to decision upside. minus fifty thousand. I mean that's an incorrect line on. Oh, is it on a different sports book? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's plus one seventy five. Oh, why does it say minus fifty? I mean, it's a typo. Okay, all right. Well, that's yeah. quite the minus typo. fifty thousand would be ridiculous. Uh, next for the winner, I'm not sure because you still have Tyler Santos out there, but I feel like you can make a case for the winner getting. Well, it depends. If Valentina Shevchenko loses, she's getting an immediate rematch, so that changes everything. But then, if she wins, is the winner next? Maybe. Winner gets Manon Fiero. I know, yeah, it's out there. Hey, you know what? At least 125 is getting a little interesting now, right? My Give Andrade a title shot. Yeah, 115, wait till, wait till Wei 125. Wei Li, Araujo. There's some players. Blanchfield's currently 10, so that'd be a big jump. I'm really curious to see how Grasso does against Valentina. Like, is the is is the question, you know, is 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 Valentina dipping a little bit? Was it a bad matchup for her? Grasso's not that... You know, the, the last couple of tough matchups that Valentina's had is against grapplers. Grasso's not that fighter. Interesting. We're going to find out. We're going to find forward. out. Wow, this next question is super long. Holy smokes. Father Claus, hola, Ariel, moderator Lewis. Is it just me or are MMA crowds more knowledgeable than ever? I don't remember consistently hearing big pops over simple moves like guard passes or underhooks during fights. Those pops were usually only safe for knockdowns or fully secured submissions. Yeah, it's not bad. Not bad. Um, the sport is growing. People are getting more educated. It's not bad. 284 didn't make me realize this. That crowd would pop over any movement Volk made. And and I think a lot of the people who are in attendance think without doubt that he won, maybe because of the crowd. You know, the crowd reacts to a move from Volk and less so from Islam. Certainly a case tough for the judges. It was re-watching Izzy and Alex. The crowd was popping over some pretty average leg kicks in the first round because they were knowledgeable over how important they were in this matchup. I feel like these pops add a lot to fights and make stories of the fight stand out even more. What do you think? Yeah, that's why I hate the freaking Apex. That's why it kills me. It kills my soul. It kills my soul when they put these cards at the Apex. It kill I can't tell you. I always thought that the the uniforms would be like the number one thing that kills my soul. And then I found the Apex fights. Kills my soul. Kills my soul. And this is one of the many reasons why. By the way, like Volk walking out to land down under, everyone's going nuts. Ugh. <sighs> By the way, on the night of 281, I thought you were crazy to say it was an early stoppage. So much, you lost 0.9% of credibility in my eyes. But, Frank, breaking news. After re-watching months later, I not only agree, but I think it was the worst stoppage in UFC title fight history. 
This is legit. I'm reading this right now, guys. I think we were all caught up in the story of Alex's deadly power and how they were second kickboxing match, how their second kickboxing match ended so much that it blinded us to reality. The mere fact that Izzy even let Alex hurt him again in a final round had us already so hyped we weren't even thinking straight. Clearly, Goddard let that sway him as well after some of the fights he let continue since. Izzy was fully aware of where he was and his body didn't go fully limp off the drop, just lost his balance, right as always knows. And could I tell you, I mean, the island that I had to stand on with that take was probably this big. Would you say it was this big? I mean, no one had the courage. Izzy didn't even have the courage. But I maintain early stoppage. We'll ask Eugene about this. We haven't talked to him since the fight. No soup for you. Hi, Ariel. A wholesome question this time. How is Mama Nose keeping? Hope she is well. What a legend. Have a good one, lads. Hope to see you for a pint in Dublin for Katie. No soup for you. Wow. How about no soup for you asking about my lovely mother? That is very, very kind. Um, she is doing great. Thank you for asking. Um, my father as well. I look forward to seeing them at the wedding in a couple of weeks. That will be fantastic. In fact, my family hasn't been together in the same spot, in the same room since 2018. Could you believe that? My siblings and I, everyone haven't been together in the same room with my parents since 2018. So that is a crazy thing. We've all come and gone, different, someone's missing. So that's pretty wild. I mean, GC's out here, you know, lamenting the fact that we have this big occasion and, uh, you know, I'm getting emotional over it. That's just the difference, you know? That's how these things go. In any event, uh, Mama Knows is doing great. She used to be a fixture on this program. She won. <laughs> this was a crazy thing that we did. It was her versus New York Rick in a series of bets. And to New York Rick's credit, Mensch that he is, fair to say, never felt fully comfortable with the arrangement, right? I feel like you didn't really want to be my mother, but you went through with it. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> but also, I mean, Mama knows knows. So she knows uh, her stuff. You still exactly watches she every knows her stuff. Every show, still watches every show, texts me. Good luck on the show. Have a good show. Fully aware of what's going on. Been to a few events, went to uh, UFC on Fox 3 at East Rutherford, went to Condit GSP, went to Diaz GSP in Montreal. So yeah. She's an OG. She's the OG. She's been there. She's been here. So thank you for asking. That's really, really kind of you and uh, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, don't get to see my parents as much as I would like to, but uh, we talk a lot, FaceTime, all those things, and... God willing, see each other in a couple of weeks. Uh, Andrew, from Jens Pulver to Dusty Rhodes, all the talk about great dads. What's it mean to you to be a great dad and how good does being a dad feel? Wow. Now we're getting deep here, guys. Um, uh, being a dad is the best. It's, uh, I mean, it has changed my life. What, what I tell people who are about to become a dad or on the fence, being a dad has given me such great balance, such great perspective. It has given me a reason to live. It has given me, you know, something to live for. It has given me a reason to be motivated. It has given me a reason to work hard. All those things that you hear. But for me, it was really the balance because I am way too intense about work and I will think about it and obsess over it 24-7. But when you have a child, especially a young child, a baby, like you can't do that. You can't be on your phone all the time. You can't be thinking about it all the time. You gotta, you know, you gotta be present. And and trust me, uh, sometimes I don't do a good enough job of that. But uh, it is there's nothing, nothing like seeing, especially now your kids grow up, especially now seeing them, you know, develop their own personalities, their own interests, getting into things like uh, the soccer thing is the perfect example. My kids are so into soccer. They came home from school yesterday and right away wanted to watch Bayern Munich versus uh, PSG in the Champions League and. It's amazing. So how could I not get into it? Because they're into it. And I'll let you guys in on a little secret. Tomorrow's my son's Walter, uh, my son Walter's birthday, his ninth birthday. And um, he's he's a big Forest fan as well. He's very much like me. We are very, very, very much like, I, I, I see a lot of myself in him and his personality. Some of the not so good things, you know, anxious, worrier, but then some of the good things as well. And so my friends at Nottingham Forest, I was, I was talking to them. I um, actually did an interview with Brennan Johnson yesterday, the forward number 20, uh, 21 year old phenom. That'll be up soon on the YouTube channel. 
they surprised me and sent me a collection of videos from some of the players on the team, including Jesse Lingard and Brendan Johnson, wishing my son a happy birthday. He's going to freak. He's going to freak tomorrow when I show him this because he knows all the players and watches with me, and I just can't wait to share that with him. So, yeah, those moments are great. Uh, we're going to see the Harlem Globetrotters tomorrow night. I'm looking forward to that. I haven't been to the Harlem Globetrotters in forever. Uh, it's just amazing to 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 be there and, um, yeah, to be their dad. Having a daughter has been amazing. The difference between her and 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 her brothers, the difference in personalities and what they're interested in and, and, and what they take from my wife and I, like all of it is just great. And my daughter is still at the point where she gets super, super sad when we leave and we don't leave often, but like last night we went out for dinner for Valentine's and she's cried. And there's a part of me that feels bad about that, but there's also a part of me that it makes me feel good that she's still so attached. She's only six um, attached to us. Cause at some point she's going to want nothing to do with us. Probably. Um, that's what I hear. I hope that's not the case. So I just try to cherish these moments. And it's really the reason why I don't, I, I turn down a lot of things that involve traveling. I don't want to miss soccer events, school things. Um, practices, games, weekends, Friday night dinners. Like I don't want to miss that stuff. So I say yes to some, say no to a lot because of that. So yeah, it's it's the greatest accomplishment. It's the greatest time. There's there's life before being a dad and there's life after and, and after has been infinitely, infinitely better than before. Can it be frustrating? Can it be tiring? Can it be all these things? Absolutely just like anything that's great in life. But it is infinitely better post being a dad as opposed to pre being a dad, just the best, the best. And now that they're getting older and you can share things with them, the absolute best. Try the acai. Howdy, Ariel. While the IV claims are purely speculation at this point, what consequences outside of an Islam suspension do you see happening for the divisions, the Dagestanis and the UFC as a whole? I think it gives more credibility that Vogue brought it up when he usually doesn't make excuses. Thanks. Yeah. He brought it up before hooker. Um, as we noted on Monday, I don't know, man. Now there's this thing that I saw John Morgan tweeted that they amended it in 2019. Who knows? I feel like they change the rules all the time. I don't know what to believe anymore. Honestly, I don't even know. Who, who brought this up? Oh, I was doing an interview with uh, the great J.D. Bunkus on Monday night about this. How, they, who's to say that people aren't using IVs every week? You know what I mean? There's no real way to test for this. Who's gotten caught other than, you know, word of mouth? I don't know. Can you test for that? Uh, who the hell knows? And again, there's a part of me that feels like IVs should be legal. Now, if it's to flush illegal things out of your system, yeah, that's a problem. If it's to just rehydrate after a grueling weight cut, why should it be illegal? My guess is nothing happens. That's my guess right now without knowing too much. We'll see. Maybe, maybe the biggest thing that happens as a result is that they say, all right, let's do it again. But I don't know. Sometimes they are victims of the moment and they say, let's do it again, even though, you know, sometimes they have ordered immediate rematches when they didn't really, you know, need to, when it wasn't warranted. So we'll see. No real word. Dana White hasn't done any interviews. He wasn't even there on Saturday. Who knows? Maybe he didn't watch the fight. Hey, Ariel, Connor from Canada. What would a Sami Zayn win in Montreal mean for you in the city? You've mentioned how much the pro wrestling scene has grown in Montreal, and I'm just wondering what that looks like to you. Thanks, as always. Oh, thank you so much for asking me about this. I mean, can I just say, this is beautiful stuff. This is absolute beautiful stuff for many reasons. And, and this isn't about me. This is about him. He's had an incredible career, and he, um, you know, he, he, he is from Montreal. He started his career in Montreal, and now he's getting this great moment in Montreal. It's, it's a beautiful thing. But if you're asking me as a fan who is from Montreal, it's also a beautiful thing. And I'll explain why from my perspective. From my perspective, the first thing that I ever loved as a human being was pro wrestling. I remember going to, you know, my, my local video store, Avenue Video, TMR Shopping Center, and seeing WrestleMania 1. I remember renting it. I remember watching Maple Leaf Wrestling every Saturday at 12. I remember getting the pay-per-views not live. We couldn't get them live, but we would get them at the video store a month or so later and having to put my name on the list to try to get it first, take the little thing, go to the guy, he gives you the tape and freaking devour the whole thing. I had a box of LJNs. I had the ring that was all beat up. I had to tape it. I mean, I, I adored pro wrestling as a kid, adored it. Again, I've told you, go to the doctor, get a shot, close my eyes. My mom says, think of a good thing. I'm scared. I'm thinking of Bret Hart. That's what I'm thinking about. That's the, that's the thing that makes me, that's my happy place. 
1991, go to the Montreal Forum, watch Bret Hart, Mr. Perfect, fall in love, fall in absolute love. Um, and I've been to big shows in Montreal. I've been to that one. You know, that was a house show, but I was at WrestleMania. Um, I was at 18 in Toronto, but then the Monday Night Raw after 18, I was at the Montreal Screwjob Survivor Series 1997. I was at No Way Out in 2003. I wasn't at Breaking Point in 2009, but I've been to SmackDowns and Raws and things of that nature and a litany of house shows at the Forum and at the Bell Center. And now here's the thing. The Montreal wrestling scene has always been attached to the Survivor Series. And that's one of the most famous or infamous nights in the history of pro wrestling. And for Canadian wrestling fans, it's really a dark night. It's, it's, it's really a negative. Like we talk about it now, wrestling fans talk about it now, but it's really one of the darkest periods in the history of Canadian wrestling and Montreal wrestling because it happened at the Molson Center. Now the Bell Center, we're attached to it. Even though Brett is in a Montreal, he was beloved in Montreal and throughout Canada and throughout the world. And so you have all these events and they've tried to recreate the screw job and all this stuff. And there were big moments with Hulk Hogan and whatnot. And prior to all of that, in the 70s and, and, and whatnot, you had Andre the Giant and you had Ivan Koloff and you had Dino Bravo and you had Rick Martel and you had the Rougeau brothers later and you had Mad Dog Vachon and Luna Vachon and you had absolute legends, Edouard Carpatier and all these guys, Pat Patterson, maybe the greatest of them all. But in the modern day world wrestling entertainment orbit universe, we've never had one of our own in one of these cards. We've never had one of our own at the very, very top headlining it all. Top of the bill going for gold. And you have these two guys, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, who started in this scene, in this town, super local shows, 100 people there max, couple hundred people who didn't fit the bill, who didn't look the part, who everyone thought would just be regional wrestlers at best, who then become indie darlings at best, who then become WWE prospects at best, who then become main card, main roster, big time players. And one of them, Kevin Owens, gets accelerated to the top, becomes a star, becomes champion, and has stayed at the top for a very long time. The other, Sami Zayn, also from Montreal, took the detour was a bit of a sideshow, was a bit of a darling, was, you know, a mid-carter, was a comedy act, was the guy going up against Johnny Knoxville, but was never viewed as that main event player. Then he gets inserted into this bloodline feud, and what happens? He becomes an absolute darling, an absolute star, and this bloodline thing has been some of the best things that they've ever done, at least of, 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 of recent memory. And then what happens? You know, the turn... Royal Rumble, and oh, look, there's an event in Montreal right before WrestleMania. And now, for the first time in what feels like forever, this February pay-per-view, which is usually the lame duck pay-per-view, which is usually the one right before Mania, you just got to get through this one to get to Mania. There's never going to be a big title change or anything seismic that happens. Now you got us wondering, is it going to be Sammy versus Cody? Is it going to be Sammy versus Cody versus Roman? Is, is The Rock going to show up? What's going to happen? How could they deny that pop? Is Kevin going to show up to help him out because he hasn't been on the Royal Rumble since the Royal Rumble? And now we're talking about this thing that we have willed, the fans, happening in our city, in La Belle Provence, in the same freaking building where Brett got screwed, one of our own at the top of the bill against the hottest thing in pro wrestling who hasn't lost the belt in almost three years. It's freaking magic. It is freaking magic. So yeah, it, it's very personal, not just for me, but for all Canadian, but in particular Montreal wrestling fans, because usually it's Canadian stars at the top. You know, the edges of the world, the Christians of the world. It hasn't been Montrealers at the top. And let's be honest, in Canada, we're often third place. It's Toronto, it's Vancouver, it's Montreal. These days, back in the 70s, it was Montreal first, but now it's all about Toronto. Toronto gets all the love. Then it's Vancouver, and then it's Montreal. It has become common to put Montreal third. We don't get a World Cup slot. We don't get a new stadium. We lose our baseball team. We're second class. Finally, for one weekend, we are at the center of it all. Everyone's talking about our city. Everyone's talking about our building. Everyone's talking about our history. And everyone's talking about our own guy. And I, I don't know what they're going to do. And as of right now, I'm not scheduled to be there. I might go. I'm not sure. It's a little complicated. But golly, do I want to be there? Do I want to feel that 
for, for the kid that was there at Montreal Forum back in the day, for every wrestling fan in Montreal, some of the best fans in the freaking world. And I would put them pound for pound with anyone in the world at that building to see one of our own who was celebrated yesterday at the Bell Center at the Canadians game, get that opportunity. And I know that you got to do Roman versus Cody. I know you got to do Roman versus Cody. I get it. But how do you deny us of this moment? This would go down as one of the greatest moments in the history of pro wrestling. The pop on Saturday, if he wins, I'm getting chills right now just talking about it. It would be unlike anything. It would be Foley and Worcester times 10. How do you deny us of that moment after everything we have been through? After everything he has been through, how do you deny us of that moment? And then you figure it out. And you do triple threat or you split the titles. Figure it out. But give us this moment. This moment would be so great. Oh, I can't wait. Did I sell you guys on it? Are you going to watch it? Someone tell me they're going to watch it. Yeah, I'm tuning in, man. That was that was quite the promo. It's just so great. It's just so beautiful. It really is one of the best things that they've done in a very long time. And he's such a likable character. He's such a likable guy. And they have really turned this into David versus Goliath. But this time, it's not like the underdog going to, you know, enemy territory. He's at home. So he gets 20,000 people on his side as well. It is going to be deafening in there. It is going to be absolutely insane. If, if, that, if that title changes hands, it's going to be one of the greatest scenes that pro wrestling has ever seen. Trust me on this. I have been in that building when a big moment happens. I've been there for Canadians games. I used to have season tickets, mini season tickets. I've been there. I was there in 93. I saw that team. This will be bigger than all of that. They're different. They're just a different breed. And the way they built him up as the underdog, and now he's out on his own in front of his people. Oh, my God. And 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 the history of, like, people have been to Montreal UFC events. UFC 83 was nuts. UFC 124 was, I mean, like, you couldn't hear a thing in there. Like, you think Australia was loud? Montreal's different. I'm telling you, for GSP, for one of our own, when it's one of our own, when it's one of our guys or gals, different place. You may say I'm biased, but it's a different freaking place. So yeah, the way they built this 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 up, and and the fact that they put Montreal on the map here for this card, this wouldn't be the same if it was happening in Boston or Philly or Buffalo or some random San Antonio. Brilliant. This shows long term planning. This shows a vision. It's really, oh, can't wait. Can't wait to watch it. I don't know where I'll be, but I can't wait to watch it. I got two left here, but am I out of time? Yes. I am out of time. All right. Uh, we'll get back to, yeah, we'll get back to that. Uh, I got all fired up talking about that. I love this stuff. Um, all right. Okay, we'll get back to the rest of the questions in a bit, but I'm very excited to talk to our first, or actually our second guest of the day. It feels like it was a while ago since we uh, we had a guest an hour and a half or so ago since we said goodbye to uh, Bo Nickel. But this man had an unbelievable and emotional weekend as well in Perth. What a story. He comes back after getting released from the UFC, after the knee injury, after the highs and lows, and I know there were a lot of lows, has to go back to Cage Warriors and win the, win that title. He gets a call on short notice to fight Tyson Pedro in Tyson Pedro's home country. And what does he do? He wins fair and square, and now he is back on the UFC roster. We're talking about the one and only Modestus Bukaskis joining us right now from the UK. Hello, sir. How are you? Hey, how's it going, my man? I uh, just want to say it's an absolute honor to be on your show, bro. I've been I've been following you and watching you for for so many years, so this is quite a, quite a moment for me. Oh, it's uh, it's my pleasure, and thank you for that. I really do appreciate it. What a what a last few days it has been for you coming back. Has I don't know. Are you down from cloud nine? Does this feel like it's <laughs> it's real life for you? How could you explain everything that you've been through over the last couple of days? We're going to get into the whole story, but just the last couple of days. Oh, there's your ceiling. Uh, just the last last couple of days <laughs> yeah nice no, do you know what I've, I've i've not really had a chance to have really much of a calm down for anything that's been going on as of late because everything just happened so fast you know my third fight obviously in uh in three months so it's, it's just been like a massive like kind of roller coaster so i actually just had to kind of sit back for a minute and just let everything sort of sink in but you know, already my my perfectionist mindset is already telling me like I just want to get back into training. I just want to try and keep improving, and you know, obviously to get like a massive win here, it, it was amazing. You know, Australia is such a beautiful country. Um, I'd never been there before. Um, you know, the stadium was amazing. Obviously, this is my first actual fight in the UFC in front of a crowd. 
wow. which was another experience in itself. So yeah, it's been it's been a crazy journey, man. So yeah, I'm just I'm just like you know reveling in 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 obviously the glory and and the win and everything, but at the same time, I'm obviously looking forward to the future and looking forward to improve my skill sets even further and obviously show my skill sets even more to the world. So, like I said, your story is great, and I actually want to take a, a step back or two if we can. And I know you've had to talk about it before, but we've never had a chance to speak about it, so I hope you don't mind. Uh, you suffer that third straight loss. And you injure your knee in that loss. You injure your knee against Khalil Roundtree, and then you get released. How 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 much time after the fight did you get released? Um, it was about a month. So, yeah, I I think it was about a month later after. So I'd already had the surgery and everything, and yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I, I remember first seeing it on UFC roster watch on Twitter, and then I called. I called my manager and then obviously he, he he let me know the news. So yeah, it was about a month after the injury. Wait a second. You're kidding me here. You saw it on UFC roster watch legit. That's how you found out. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Fucked up, I man. What the hell? Yeah. I know. I was, I was literally, I was just flicking through Twitter. You know, you're kind of just, you're kind of just chilling, you know, watching some stuff on, on, on your phone. And then next thing you know, I just, I'm like, like I said, I'm going through Twitter and, and I remember actually I, ha- I had a message. I can't remember who it was, but someone told me like, I've seen that you're not on the UFC like fan roster or whatever. And at first I thought, oh, okay, I'm just going to like sort of not necessarily ignore it, but I'm like, you know, I, I, you know, nothing's been said to me yet. And then, yeah, afterwards I saw on Twitter and then afterwards I, I then called my manager and then, yeah, he, he pretty much confirmed it after that. Can you describe that feeling when you see yourself with the X UFC? Like what, what happens to your gut? What happens to your heart when you see that? <laughs> Well, it, it kind of like really just dropped. Um, I'd been going through probably like the worst time in my life already just from that injury and having the third loss. And, you know, you'd I'd literally just gone from all my dreams coming true to all my dreams just crashing down and getting splattered in my face. So it was, uh, I was, you know, I was trying to stay positive. Um, I kept on like, you know, you know, I had... I've still got stuff written on my on my board back here as well. Um, you know, I had stuff written like all my goals and and stuff like that. And I'd I'd just been trying to sort of just stay motivated because I knew I'd lost my third one in a row. I knew that it was like a really bad injury and that it was going to take a while to recover. So I was just kind of just trying to I was just trying to stay positive every day as much as I could, just trying to do things like productively. And then yeah, when I already knew it was a bad situation. I had a lot of personal things in my life not going so well. You know, I I, I was you know, just sit, sitting in bed, just like, like, like I say, just trying to think, trying to wrap my head around the situation. And then next thing you know, I, I, I see that obviously on, on Twitter and like my whole world just kind of just fell apart. Like I felt quite, I felt like quite dizzy. I'm like, I just can't believe it's like, you almost feel like you're waking up and you're, you're sorry. You're, you're like kind of in a, in a, in a nightmare or something. Like I straight away, I, I saw it. I just burst into tears. I, you know, I had to tell my, you know, I had to go and tell my dad, you know, call my manager. And I just thought all this hard work that, you know, I did to, to make the, the UFC happen, which has my, been my ultimate goal for, for ages has just now as quickly as it happened, it's just got taken away from me. So that, that was like, really, it was really painful. It like really hurt my heart because I'd literally just climbed a massive mountain, like I say, and, and tumbled back down. So yeah, it it was a very tough time when, when I found out. You entered the UFC uh, 10 and two, uh, you were the cage warriors light heavyweight champion. Uh, you obviously have to vacate that title. You go to the UFC, you win your debut and, and you look great in that fight. Then you fight Jimmy Crute, Mikhail Alekseshuk, and then Khalil Roundtree. But you entered the UFC in July of 2020, as you said, midst of the pandemic, you're not fighting in front of anyone. Uh, that's Abu Dhabi. And the next few fights weren't in front of anyone as well. But the last fight, the Khalil Roundtree fight was a little more than a year later. So your time there, the first time was just about a year. The injury that you suffered against Khalil, I understand, was so so gruesome, so bad that even your physiotherapist went to the surgery just to see what they did and said it was like like a yeah. war zone, all this stuff. What exactly was it that you had to, uh, you know, like what, what was the surgery? What, what was the injury? Yeah, so I I didn't really disclose uh, anything that was sort of happened before the fight, but so I'm just gonna go like go into it like from the beginning. But so obviously I had got offered to fight Khalil Roundtree, and it was supposed to be in London. This was when the pandemic technically everyone thought was going to be finished, right? Big opportunity, you know, London in front of a hometown crowd at the O2 against Khalil Roundtree. I mean, what a 
what an amazing fight to fight in your hometown, right? And everything looked all good and 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 blah blah blah. And then in training, actually, ten weeks out from that fight, uh, I, I feel like a little click or a pop in in, in my knee. And this injury actually dates back to 2019. Three weeks ago, three weeks, sorry, three weeks before my uh, Cage Warriors title defense, I'd actually torn my ACL, 50% of it. And I didn't know this. Like, I thought wow. it was just a dislocation. And, you know, my physio was already helping me with that. But I got the MRI afterwards. And, yeah, I'd, I'd torn a bit of my ACL. But because I had muscle around the leg, like, holding everything in place, it kept me going for such a long time. Then this next injury happened before the Khalil fight, 10 weeks out. Essentially, what I had done is the ACL torn to 75%. They, they On the MRI, it showed that it was kind of like on its last legs. And both the meniscuses were torn in the left leg. This is before the Khalil fight. And the MCL was already chronically worn anyways. So I remember speaking to my doctor because he was obviously explaining to me what was going on in that MRI. And this and then this is you know like ten weeks out from a fight, so I, I kind of told him like you know what, what what we saying here? Do I need to get it sorted now or after the fight? And uh, he said, "Listen, your leg." I he says, "I worked with you for a long time. Like your legs are strong enough to hold everything in place that you'll be able to fight. So you know, obviously the decision's ultimately down to you, but you will be able to fight. But we have to get this sorted straight after." So I thought, you know, judging by Khalil's last couple of fights, you know, and how things were going. I thought, you know what? I'll be able to tough it out. I'll be able to uh, get in there, do the job and, and, you know, get it sorted. And unfortunately, uh, that what happened in the fight happened. And essentially, the 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 meniscus then tore off the bone and uh, uh, and the ACL, they said it looked like tooth, like half a bit of tooth loss. Oh my they said God. it was like literally hanging on the end. And the uh, MCL was completely gone as well. This is why I say my physio, when 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 she went to see the operation, she said she's never seen such an intricate operation because they had to do so many things to it. But they, I had the best doctors in London, UFC, absolutely amazing. They they covered the surgery, so I was very grateful that you know I had the best people in the business actually looking after my knee. But this is why I've actually managed to make such a great recovery. Not only is my physio absolutely amazing, but the doctors were great, and you know, and obviously. I was very determined to, to to make sure that I could get back, but yeah, it was a, it was a crazy injury. Did you ever get an explanation as to why? Because I remember when you got released, and it felt like, man, this guy's got a high ceiling. He's coming off an injury. Like, why release him? At, at least during the recovery process, why add that on top of all the crap that he's dealing with? What was the point? It's not like you're taking someone's slot. It's not like there's a an actual number. So, did you ever get an explanation as to why they decided to do it when they did? Um, not really. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's a ruthless business. So kind of what I learned is that, you know, the world, as Rocky would say, you know, the world ain't all sunshine and daisies. You know what I mean? Sunshine and rainbows. Sorry. So, um, it's, it is, it, it was kind of like, uh, obviously I was kind of one, I was just hoping to God that my performance against Oleg Shachuk would be enough to kind of keep me in there. That's why I thought I was kind of just hoping that that was what they were trying to determine. But I think realistically, as soon as the fight was over, I think everyone already, you know, I think they already knew that they'd, they'd come to a decision. Listen, it's three in a row, you know, not, not many people last in the UFC losing three in a row. So, um, yeah, of course I would have liked to have got told may, may, maybe earlier, but at the end of the day, you know, this is a harsh and ruthless business and they knew I wasn't going anywhere anyways. You know, I've got a massive recovery to deal with. So, you know, I whatever happened was going to happen anyway. So, you know, it is what it is. I just uh, had to kind of just get on with it, you know? Uh, you come back in November, so a little over a year later, you make the recovery. How did you feel in that first fight back? That was in Cage Warriors this past November. Like, super nervous, unsure about the knee, worried about it. Now you got to go back to the place that got you to the UFC, so it's a bit of a humbling process, right? W what did you feel like? Yeah. Yeah, it was a very humbling process. I, I was actually, you know... I was actually ready to ready to fight from about March time, March April time, and wow. I was actually looking to to to, to have a fight that, that whole time. I was I was literally speaking with my manager. What promotions? What are we What are we doing? What's the next step? You know, I kind of felt for a long time that I'd already you know I've already ticked off the Cage Warriors check check mark. You know, like I've already done this. Surely I should look you know to something else to get me back to the UFC. 
So we looked at a couple of different options and uh, all of those fell through. Either opponents didn't, you know, pulled out or this, that. Stuff didn't solidify, basically. And then it got to summertime, got to about August, and then, you know, Did we lose him? Working on it. All right. What a gent. Uh, we'll get him right back. Incredible stuff. The Baltic Gladiator. And oh, there he you is. You about that fight. Sorry, we lost Sorry. you there. Now uh, you're back. You're back. Yeah. My bad, mate. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Uh, about two weeks out from from that fight is when I it, it got it actually got together. Like... I didn't actually know that. I, I, I knew I was going to fight in November, but I didn't even know when, what date, what was going to happen. And then literally two weeks out, they found me an opponent. They found me Lee Chadwick, um, you know, very credible opponent, very tough guy in the game. And um, yeah, I mean, look, mentally, I actually felt pretty calm going into that fight. I had a had a really good men mental coach and um, like I felt, I felt, I felt really good. Like I felt like it was my calling. You know, I've been waiting for such a long time. I've been, I've been doing backflips. I've been doing, wow. you know, um, freaking wrestling shots and all sorts. Of, like I knew my knee was okay, and it was just a case of just going out there and competing now. And um, I have to admit, I was a little bit hesitant on the trigger in that fight. Um, it wasn't my best performance, but it was enough to get the job done. I knew I had to do a hell of a lot more though after that fight. After that fight, I knew this isn't really going to get the UFC's attention. I've got to do more. So uh, I knew it was a win. It was, it was a much needed win after obviously a losing streak. You're, you're always going into fight like crap. I've just been off a of losing streak. I, I don't want another one. But at the same time, I was confident in my skill set. I knew what I could do. So it was just a case of going out and doing it. And, you know, I got the job done and that was the main thing. And then you come back um, a little over a month later, New Year's Eve, and you do look very impressive and very dominant. You get the the finish and you get the Cage Wars Light Heavyweight title back, which you once had. Did you feel after that like, oh, wow, I'm, I might get a call now? Or did you think, okay, I'm probably staring at a few more of these before I get a call? It was kind of like up in the air because my, my manager said, look, just stay ready. Just stay in shape because you never know. Something may happen where there's a pullout. So obviously I, I, I was just, you know, just doing my thing. Do you know what I find is really freaky? Yeah? The last time I got called to the UFC, I went to Newcastle. So my stepmom's family live in Newcastle. And we just went to train by the beach. And I was recording like beach, like Rocky type, you know, like like training things. I did the same time this time wow. before I got the call to the UFC again. So it's like a, a weird sort of process. It's almost like deja vu in a, in, in, in a way. But I, I didn't... Um, I knew that it, I needed an impressive performance, which I did, but I didn't know if I needed another one, mm. if you get what I'm saying. So I knew potentially if last minute something comes up, I'll get the call, but I know I couldn't count on that. So weirdly enough, already when I got the call, um, the same day, my manager called me, it was like the Wednesday, and he said, Cage Warriors have offered you a fight to defend your belt on the 24th of March. Wow. So i already uh, like i was like at first i was like oh okay if the ufc don't want me then then fine i'll, I'll you know i'll go and bag another body I'll, I'll, I'll do what i gotta do and it was literally that same day that i then got the call that i got to the ufc so it was it was like a very a very crazy process it all happened just like kind of like wow like just all yeah. all out there just out of nowhere you know what was your reaction when you got the call yeah so i, I um Obviously, I, I just finished my training in the evening. I, I had it in, I had it set in my head. Okay, I'm going to have to defend my belt. So I was doing what I had to do. And I was driving home, and it was about 10.30 at night, um, my time. And um, right where my house is, yeah, I literally live in the middle of nowhere. Like, literally, there's, like, freaking woods everywhere, uh -huh. no signal. And there's a little bit, right, like, five minutes from my house where there's signal, but then it cuts out. Literally, just before it cuts out, my manager... Gives huh. me a, a FaceTime call. I literally have to swerve over to the side of the road. I'm like, okay, if my if my manager's giving me a FaceTime call, that's probably something important. But I didn't even think in my head that I was going to get the call, right? And then and then he he asked me straight away. He goes, you know, uh, what's what's your weight looking like? I'm like, oh, well, I'm not fat, so that that's good. Um, I was like, you know, I'm between two twenty, you know, uh, two nineteen, two twenty, and he goes, well, you're fighting in Australia in two weeks' time, and I'm like. It, like literally almost like the same emotions that I had when I got the call that I got released. It was like the complete opposite. So 
how low every like my whole emotions went down when I got caught. It was like the complete opposite. It was like always on a rise up. I had like a massive like adrenaline and and I just started like I just started crying. I like had my hands in my head like and I was just telling my manager like I can't believe we, like all that we've been through and now we're we're back again. Like the the for everything that had just happened to then finally come back to it again like where I was before, just literally 16 months ago to, 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 to now, for it to happen so fast, it just, like, literally, I, I couldn't even control my emotions. Like, I was literally, I, I was, as I was driving home, I was, like, literally, like, screaming. I was like, yes! Like, I, uh. I couldn't, you know what I mean? It, I, I was, I was like, in a mad, I was, like, in a mad elation. Like, I, I, I was, I was so buzzing. Like, everything was just, I don't know, like, like I felt really weird. I felt like I was like in fairyland, you know, and that's when I went, obviously went home to tell my parents and, uh, and yeah, like it was just, it was just a ball full of emotions. I think the second time round was much more emotional than the first time round than when I got yeah. the call. Considering everything you had been through and, and in those dark days as you're recovering, I, I read that you said like you were drinking yourself to sleep. It was, it was pretty dark, but was it that bad? Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously I, I, like I said, like personal problems, I, I just, I kind of just went into a, like a mode where I was just like, fuck everything. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I literally thought like the world was out to get me. I thought, I thought, you know, I, I kind of felt like I was being punished by God. Like I had so many different things going on in my head, you know, and that was the only way to get away from the real world, man. Because when you're in this nightmare, you just want to get away from this nightmare, you know, and like sitting in bed with a cast and, or like, like, you know, having to ice my leg and, you know, nothing solidifying. I had to have a second operation. I was, yeah, like there was oh, many man. times that I was drinking myself, that I was drinking myself to sleep. I would tell no one about it, but I literally, I remember like I have in the corner of my room, just like I have like a plastic bag with all these bottles of freaking beer and me watching Game of Thrones. And like, I wasn't even paying attention to it. Like I was just, I was just drinking for the sake of drinking just because I didn't, I wanted to have that like buzzed feeling so I didn't have to be present. Like that was, that was such a massive contrast to, to now, to where it was then. Now I couldn't, I couldn't imagine being anywhere else but the present. But back then I didn't want to be, I didn't actually want to be there in that moment. I just wanted to be somewhere else. I just wanted to be in a different world. Like, so yeah, it, it, it was dark, man, but I'm lucky that I've got amazing family and friends and people that, 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 that supported me to, to, to help me get out of that time. But I did have to go through a realization process. One of my training partners who I know a lot of people have been talking about, Will Curry, he was, uh, he was actually, uh, a massive help in or, or, or like the, the main, one of the main factors in order for me to sort of learn more about the world and learn more about life. And the way he explained it is that, you know, I was too blue lightsaber, you know, and you know, you can't be red lightsaber. You can't be like too arrogant and self-consumed and all the way to that side, but you've got to have the the mix of both. I was too blue lights. I was too nice, too kind, too, oh, this, that. No, you've got to have a dark side. You've got to have that, 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 that mean streak, which is, it, which is something that in all areas of life, not just in fighting. And it's actually helped me out a lot because it helped me to become a tougher as a person because it's, it's, I mean, in, in my nature, I just want to be kind and polite to people and not do anyone any harm. But, you know, you, you've got to have a side where it's like, now, nah, hold on a second. Like, you know, you've got to tell people what's what. So, you know, that was one massive lesson. And, and I was actually very grateful and thankful that we, that the relationship between me and Will became even stronger after this whole situation. He was the, oh, I hadn't trained with him a lot. I trained with him like, you know, like kind of, but he was the first person out of all the fighters that I'd been training with leading up to the Cleo fight to come to my house and, wow. and, and visit me whilst I was with this leg injury. So that's why, like I say, now me and him are like brothers pretty much. I love that. And so you get this opportunity and I'm sure you probably wanted a little more time to train for Tyson Pedro in his home country, but you got to say yes. Right. And then you go out there and you're yeah. involved in this, uh, in this super close fight. How nervous were you before they announced? Cause you know, you, you probably would get another one. You took the fight on short notice, but you want to get a win badly, right? It's been a while. How nervous were you before they raised your hands that you had done enough to win? Yeah, so I kind of, obviously, you're in the guy's home country. You're in his backyard. Yeah. So if it's a close fight like it was, I, I knew that the first round that they probably, and I've watched this back, obviously, a couple of times now, but 
the first round was, you know, you would definitely say it was his because he took me down. But if you're looking at damage, like I definitely landed more damaging, damaging shots in that first round. If you're looking at overall strikes. So it's like, okay, if you're holding the weight of the takedown, then yes, they would have to give it to him. They already told me, you know, my corner was already telling me that I was down that first round. So I was like, okay, I've got to, I've got to get this back. Second round, I definitely, again, landed more shots or landed the cleaner shots. And third round, I knew I had to do something, which is why at the end of the round, I sort of went a little bit mad. But I should have done that more. You know, I should have done more because I, I hurt him a couple of times and I, and I should have even then thrown a bit, little bit more. But who, who knows, maybe jet lag and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, being being in another country on short notice, maybe those things affected me. But, you know, I thought at the end of the fight, I'd when they said unanimous decision, that's when I've kind of thought they've got to give it to me. Mm. If it was split, I would have thought, fuck, it might go one way or the other. But because they said unanimous, I'm like, there is no way in hell I could lose this fight now. Mm. The fact that they're calling it unanimous. So already from that point, I was I almost had a bit of a relief because I'm, I'm like, surely, surely, you know. Um, and then, yeah, obviously when they when they called it, uh, like I say, it was just kind of like, oh, thank God they they decided to give it to me. But um, I was just glad that they gave it a unanimous decision and it wasn't a split decision, you know? Saw a lovely video of you and I think it's your father backstage and you're very emotional. What was that like? It was, uh, I mean, just like a culmination of everything that has gone on. I mean, he's the guy that's been in my corner, been the angel on my shoulder throughout my whole career, you know? He's been you know, coordinating my whole career, my strength and conditioning, my strategy, my, um, you know, like, like mentally preparing me. He'd been, you know, helping me with my striking and and he, he's always believed in me, you know? And I just, it, it was like literally again, just like almost like a, like the, 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 the like sort of the peak of the emotions of me and him together as father and son, we've been on this crazy journey together you know, we, we, we've been to the UFC, we've been caught and now we're back again. And now we just won again. Like, you know, it, it was like a massive thing. I'm like, I was just basically telling my dad, like we did it, you know, like, you know, after everyone just counting us out, you know, everyone telling us that, um, we're never going to do it, that we're never going to get back that, you know, that my career was over people telling me, you know, that, that, you know, you Modestus, you're crap. Like you're, 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 you're never going to make it, you know, and to prove so many people wrong. And like, there was already people turning their backs on me and, you know, and turning my, their backs on, on us as, as, as a team. And, you know, for us to prove them wrong, it was like a massive, it was, it was like a, is a big thing for me. I still get emotional, emotional about it now, just even speaking about it, because like I say, me and my dad, me and my dad have been through a hell of a lot. So for us to be here together, still doing it, still competing with the best of the best. Um, yeah, man, it was it was a very, very emotional, happy and warm moment. And uh, I'm sure there'll be many of those more to come. And 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 what's this whiteboard situation here? Because I see you have win cage warriors belt again. Is this all these yeah. are all the things that you were you were visualizing? I, I, I see money figures yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see yeah. beats Tyson so, Pedro via KO, so didn't quite <laughs> what is this? this yeah. Is, so this this is like my uh, this is like my, I don't know. It's, it's almost like my mystical, mystical whiteboard because at one point, like all the things that I've been writing, do you know what? Let me show you something. Let okay. me show you something actually. Please, please. Um, uh, let me see if I can turn this camera around. Oh, all wow. right. So uh, do you remember my Martha and Hamlet fight? Uh huh. So I trained with John Jones, obviously, as you can see. Yeah. And I, I went, I went to go and see him actually at the Body Power Expo before that fight, and he signed obviously my photo. And look, they said the present and the future, and then obviously the Cage Warriors belt. I had wrote underneath that I was gonna. Uh, oh, sorry, I got to cut that out. But anyways, I, I, I basically said that I was gonna win the belt, and it it happened. Like this wow. was the start of me trying to speak everything into existence. You know, I'd literally wrote it down on the on this piece of this is why i have it framed up because i have it written on this on this piece of paper that i was going to win the world title and and i did it and then it just so i just started like okay well hold on a minute let me get a whiteboard you know then i said oh, i actually wrote on my whiteboard before i was gonna win my ufc debut and when i won the 50 grand bonus i was going to give it to my parents which everything came true so from from everything coming true 
everything started not coming true, basically. Mm. Like, like mm. I said, from my dreams coming true to getting crashed down, passion burn in front of me. So now everything's starting to happen again. It's like it's it's like a mystical, mystical thing, but I feel like everything obviously happened for a reason. In order, f- in order for me to succeed now, the dark times I had to go through had to happen. But I love it. It was mad because I wrote at the top there back in UFC by 29 years old with a record of 13 and five, and that's exactly what happened. Yes. <laughs> so you know, wow. Um, and I see UFC I'm, champ by 31, still possible. You got two more years. Yeah. So so this these are these are things that obviously I have in my head. Obviously, I'm working towards it. I have. The record's written there. Obviously, I wanted to win by KO. It was very possible, but unfortunately, I didn't do it. But still, 14-5 and five is my new record. I wrote that up on there. And yeah, just, you know, win Cage Warriors belt again on, on December 31st. So I've just ticked off, like, I like you know, a, a, load, a load of different things on my whiteboard. And, you know, it's just, I've got more things to do. Obviously, the, the top ones are more like, were my long term, but I'm going to have to rub some of that stuff off. And the bottom one's more for like short term kind of stuff. So, you know, it's just to something to keep it at the forefront of my mind. What is that I want to achieve? What do, what do I want to do? And just keep it plugging through my head constantly. And, you know, like I say, I think all the things that happened to me, like the really hard times, the dark times, were all just part of God's plan in order in, in for the bigger picture. For, for me to become a UFC champion within the next couple of years, I had to go through all of this. Because I tell you what, bro, when I was in that cage in front of 50, almost 15,000 people, I loved it. Like, everyone was booing. I was, like, walking out there. Like, I even watch it back on the video, just me walking out with my hands out. I'm just like, I'm here. Do you know what I mean? Like, this is this is the moment I've been I've been waiting for. I thought it was even funny. I was, I, there was one person that put their hand up to shake my hand <laughs> as I was walking out. But, um... You know, playing my entrance music, I, like I felt in the mo. Like I said, that I felt very in the moment, and it felt absolutely amazing. I'm like, I'm ready to fight. You know, these are things that I didn't feel before. So I feel like this roller coaster had to happen this way. So I'm just grateful. You know, as crap and shit of a time it was, I'm grateful that it happened this way because I wouldn't have learned the lessons needed in order to be where I am now. And I'm by no means finished. You know. I love it, man. Uh, you 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 make us all want to root for you. You 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 are an amazing guy with an amazing story, and you're so passionate. And I'm so happy that you were able to come on and tell us about all of this. And uh, who knows, maybe you get a uh, a short notice call to fight in the O2 uh, and and write that wrong. It's coming up, and uh, you know you deserve something like that, if not now, but in in the future. So I wish you nothing but the best, and I hope that you get to realize all those dreams. And this will be the first of many appearances on the program, Modestus. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Mate, thank you so much, and I really appreciate your kind words, bro. Like I said, I've been a massive supporter of you uh, for for a very long time. I've been watching your show, and it's been absolutely amazing. I'm very happy to see all of your success. Thank you. And um, yeah, man, like, like I say, we we all, we're all gonna rise together. And um, yeah, man, I really appreciate you having uh, given me this time on your show, my brother. Anytime, and we'll do it again soon. Congratulations. Enjoy the victory. There he is, Modestus. What a win. What a story. What a guy. What an inspiration. Amazing stuff. 14 and 5 now. Modestus Bukaskis, the Baltic gladiator representing Lithuania and England, and uh, now very much back in the mix at uh, 205 in the UFC. All right. Very excited to talk to our next guest. Appreciate his time very much. Uh, we had him in studio back in November prior to the uh, MSG card. And a lot has happened since, including this past weekend in Perth. Without further ado, let's go to the uh, head coach of City Kickbox. And let's go all the way to Auckland now. So we go from England to Auckland, New Zealand. Coach Eugene Behrman standing by. Hello, Coach. How are you? Hi, Aaron. Uh, good to see you again, my friend. Yes, a pleasure as always. And by the way, is everyone okay over there? I'm hearing of some uh, crazy weather, cyclones, things of that nature. Is everyone all right? And uh, every, every, everyone's good. I, I mean, we had a lot of delayed flights. There's guys that are only just getting home like today. So it's like, you know, like four or five days later, but um, everybody's safe. Okay, glad to hear that. Um, we're still buzzing over here after what Volk did on, on Saturday night, Saturday night here, Sunday in Perth. Uh, could I ask, as far as how the fight was going to play out, is that what you expected? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the most part, for the most part, I, 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 it was exactly how we expected. Um, was there anything? No, there was nothing really. Nothing surprised you nothing about the re- fight? Did you? Th- I mean, nah. obviously, you thought he was going to win. You were confident, but um, Islam striking, ultimately, how he did on the ground with Islam, anything like that? Now, look, the, you get the great thing about Islam um, is you can calculate every single, every little thing that he does, and uh, just about everything we he did uh, in terms of the striking on the on the on the ground, uh, we we had we we, we studied uh, by one takedown, to be honest. There was one one kind of body lock he did where he kind of went the other way and then he changed direction with it, which he, which we've never seen before in any previous uh, video. But uh, for the most part, um, the good thing about Islam is you can uh, take a very good measure of what he does. The, the hard part is just you know what he's going to do. The hard part is just stop it. <laughs> mm. How did you score the fight? Oh, look at <laughs> I of course uh, thought we won, but uh, I will never rule out the fact that um, I, I, I have uh, I will be biased, right? And, and there's there's no way I can get around that, even if I try my hardest not to be. Um, uh, I I will always be biased. You, will, you 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 will a human being will always be biased. So yeah, I thought we got uh, two, three, and five. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought two was close, but. Uh, uh, in, in hindsight, after watching it, I thought we won too comfortably, and three was actually the more swing round, the close round. So um, I would say two and five, we comfortably won, and then three was the one that was you could mix it up both ways. You know, I remember when you were in studio here uh, prior to MSG, we spoke about the possibility of Alex getting this fight. It hadn't quite been yeah. confirmed just yet. Um, it was days away from being confirmed. And I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, that you said you actually initially weren't in favor of him doing this, right? Um, did, you know, in the process of the training camp and just being around him, fight week, did you ultimately change your mind or were you kind of, obviously you're going in there, you're going to back your guy, you're working with Joe and the whole team, but you're going to support him. But in the back of your mind, were you like, oh, I, I, I still don't love this? Or did you change your stance as the fight approached? Oh, and I, I, that was all, in terms of when you make a decision before uh, before a fighter is ever announced, in which direction you you go, I felt Volk. I thought the better direction at the time was probably uh, a couple of couple more featherweight contenders before he went up to Islam. That's all. I just thought let's do a couple more. Let's get a little bit more seasoned in certain areas, and then let's go up. So I wasn't against. Uh, him going up, I was just pro- possibly. Um, I played the devil's advocate and said maybe we should wait a little while. And and but once the decision was made, uh, it was just it was it was all aboard. You know that, that that's that's the call for war and our team. You know once the decision's made, then uh, it's uh, all 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 engines ahead. Um, I never for once thought that Volk couldn't do it. It was more about putting Volk in the best position to do it. Yeah. Uh, you have been in this position before trying to become a double champion. And obviously there's a difference mm-hmm. between 45 going up to 55 and 85 going up to 205, bigger jump. But was there anything that you learned as a coach the first time around with Izzy that, you know, maybe you applied that you did differently that you, that you, that you looked at differently this time around with Alex? Um, no, no, not 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 really. Like you, and, and the obvious answer is this, this weight division for a reason. And mm. you, <clears throat> you are, you are never going to be able to get around that fact. So you are always going to be fighting a bigger, stronger man. When you go up in weight division, it's about, um, which really comes down to: have you got enough skills to offset 
the strength and weight advantage. That's what it's about. And it was that was the same thing with Israel. And it was the same thing with Volk. And I would have to say, <laughs> and with the benefit of hindsight, that both those guys probably suffered from the same um, fate in terms of they just weren't quite skilled enough to offset the size advantage if you look at how both those fights um, panned out. And um, look, that, that's that's just how it is sometimes. Um, you know, like we, we can just, like people like Israel and Volk, they can just win the win the they can win the title and then have two fights and retire, <laughs> huh. and or or they can just stay in their division and just rule their division forever, but that's just not in their nature. It's just that they just don't have it in them to be satisfied with where they are. They just will always look for the bigger and better place, the place that can push them a little further, the place that can challenge them the most, and that's a unique characteristic like that's they're the one percent of the one percent they're not the champions that are just going to stay there and be satisfied they're going to take the biggest fight so who's the biggest fight you guys think Pereira is the biggest fight we're taking Pereira oh you guys think Jan's the biggest fight we're taking Pereira they, they will always they just have it inside them that's what um that's how you become great that's how you become legendary and that's just they, they just have that inside them if you if you understand what I'm saying yeah for sure is there anything, and by the way, have you been able to watch the fight on television afterwards? I, I, yeah, I've watched it uh, one time. I've watched the replay, and that's where that's where I thought um, two, because I thought two was kind of the swing round that I wasn't sure who won, but then I was like, we probably took two, and three was probably the round that was up for contention. But Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, is there anything that you wish – Alex had done differently in the fight in retrospect. Yeah, look, I think <clears throat> Alex like alluded it to it himself. Like uh, after the fight, he he probably gave Islam a bit too much respect too early. Mm. So one and two, and and uh, I don't know if there's a way around that. You always have to. And, you know, you always have to approach a fight uh, very cautiously. Um, you've got to figure a guy out first. Um, that's kind of our MO. That's kind of how we approach the fight. So I think Alex just wishes that he had kind of got in his comfort zone a little earlier and he was able to push the pace a little earlier. But he was in uh, uh, kind of a cautious frame of mind early, which he, which he eventually got out of. But he probably he needed to get out of that a bit earlier to make this fight um, definitive. What would you like to see Alex do next? Would you like to see him try to get this rematch or do you want to see him go back down to 45? <clears throat> um, oh, oh, if, if you're asking me and I'd say, oh, it's never my decision, it's a team yeah, yeah. decision. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, go, go back to 45. I mean, I've, obviously there's a, there's a fight that's sitting right there. Like, right. Uh, I don't know what Islam's doing like if he's gonna fight uh soon or if he's fighting twice a year or i, I don't know even know anything to do uh, i'm not sure what his plans are there's a we have a fight locked in if alex wants it and uh it's a very difficult fight in many ways a much more difficult fight than the one we just had um versus um yeah yeah so um i think that's a challenge and i think he should probably take it why do you say a potentially more difficult fight than the one you just had, Yair versus Islam? Why do you say this one could be more difficult? Uh, well, preparation-wise, um, like I said, like you can calculate and study everything Islam does, and that's and, and just and and we did that very well. And, and you know, credit to Joe, Frank Hickman, and Craig. Uh, they studied Islam, um, you know, into the early hours of every night and they figured out every little possible path and step he would take and they tried to negate it. They did an excellent job. Whereas yeah, 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 yeah will always bring you, you almost every fight see something new, but you also 
which is hard, but you the, the way that he throws the shots and he does unpredictable, um, you know, some of his techniques are very unpredictable and hard to read. And each fight he has, he changes his pattern a little bit sometimes. So it, that that's what I mean. The unpredictability of Yaya versus the predictability of Islam, but you just can't stop Islam. That's the kind of that's what makes it difficult from my perspective is trying to calculate all of that. Whereas I think the coaches had a pretty good job of calculating Islam. It was just coming up with ways to stop Islam is 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 the difficult part of that journey. Uh, you you probably don't know this uh, because you're and 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 God bless you for this. You're not on social media, but the main thing that everyone in the MMA Twitter sphere, if you want to call it that. Um, what we have been debating since Saturday has been who's the number one pound for pound fighter in the world. Can I be uh, cheeky enough to ask you who you think is the number one pound for pound fighter in the world right now? Well, let me just answer this. The number one pound for pound fighter in the world is whoever the people decide. Fair. Because it's because the number of the pound for pound fighter is a people's choice award, in my opinion. Mm hmm. Okay, um, is it Islam? It's definitely not Islam in my brain. Is it Israel? It's definitely not Israel. Islam doesn't have, in my opinion, the credentials and the uh, good enough stand up, uh, refined enough stand up skills to be pound for pound, uh, you know, in, in that place. Israel doesn't have find enough wrestling skills um, for him to be pound for pound number one. But I know someone that does have really refined stand-up, equally as good wrestling and wrestling defense, who probably deserves that number one spot, who has uh, fought the who's who in his division, defended many times, and uh, tried to go up and wait. And that guy is... Alex Volkanovsky, who I think is the rightful um, pound for pound king, uh, even despite the loss. If you base it on the things that I'm basing it on, and that's just uh, just a skill set that is able to take on any fighter uh, at any weight, should he imaginary right. uh, in an imaginary world go up to heavyweight or yeah, light heavyweight it. or yeah. I love that, and no That's one can say opinion. no one can say you're biased because you're, you're speaking about one of your own, Izzy, in in that discussion as well. So, um, I, I appreciate that insight. But like you said, it's uh, I mean, there's no real right answer to any of this, and that's what kind of makes it fun. Yeah. Could could I ask you know um, when we had you in studio, we talked about like you know having to kind of give everyone a kick in the behind before the the MSG card, and and not wanting you to compare your students necessarily, but I feel like Alex is almost like a coach's dream. He just seems so professional. He never strays from the game plan. So to speak. I mean, I'm sure there's times where you're maybe like, oh, I wish he would do that or that, but like just always so solid out there. Um, would that be like, do you ever have to worry about his motivation? And, and again, I know, you know, he's, he's often in Australia. He's with freestyle. He's with Joe Lopez, but from your perspective, uh, and since you're so open with your perspective, we appreciate that very much. When you are working with him, are you ever questioning the motivation? Are you ever feeling you, you need to give him a bit of a of a jolt, so to speak? Yeah. Well, I tell you what. Like, I'll, I'll look, let me allude to a conversation I had with some of the other coaches um, at CKB, and we were talking about we were talking about in particular champions and uh, how most champions. When you become a champion, you experience a newfound stardom and a newfound, uh, newfound wealth. And in most cases that I've seen, not just my own champions, but uh, other champions uh, in the UFC, particularly the Western ones, they almost all, in all cases, let off the gas. Uh, and I was just alluding to my other coaches that there's only one champion I know of that when he became champion, completely ignored the stardom, the media, the money, and all this. 
and in fact increased his work ethic. And and that that was Alex Volkanovsky. And I I'm not inside some of those other camps, so I'm looking from outside. So the, so my yeah. case, so everything's from outside. But in my opinion, there's only one champ person who became champion who actually like he, that, you're talking about a guy who's still still after his fight will be back in the gym within five to seven days, even with a broken hand. Mm-hmm. He was back in the gym, mucking around on 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 the bag. Like that is um, this is a rare gift. This like this uh, motivation that he has to just uh, be the best fighter in the world. It's like it just goes beyond every other want and need that he has, uh, apart from his family, of course. Right. I love that, and uh, it is great to yeah. hear that. Um, like I said, we haven't talked since MSG, so I'm dying to ask you this question. And we talked about it actually earlier on the show. I still believe, Coach, till this day, that that fight was stopped early. I really still believe it was stopped early. I'm talking about Izzy and Alex. Your reaction there leads me to believe that you maybe don't agree with me, which uh, I commend you for, but I still believe it. And I've seen other fights. And again, I have the utmost respect. I think Mark Goddard is the best referee in the world right now, but I've seen him give leeway to other guys who don't have, you know, the the history and the 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 stakes and the champ, all that stuff that is he had in that moment. That was like his one vulnerable spot. And I felt like the plug was pulled just a little early. Agree or disagree? Disagree. Okay. All right. Fine. Disagree. Why is that? Disagree. And and look, Arrow, you know my background, so I could I could quite possibly just have an innate uh, yeah. feeling to kind of um, err on the side of caution. So, but I, I believe the chances of Israel um, coming out of that um, without being further hurt were were minimal. He was probably going to get hurt even more. Okay, and to that ends. I'm glad he stopped it because he prevented Israel from being damaged even further. And we're in a position now where we're able to be healthy and have a second go at, um, you know, trying to beat that monster. Mm. Are you? So, uh, you know, I'm happy with the stoppage. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Are you? Are you happy with yeah. the circumstances here? Like, are you happy with the considering how it ended, and you feel like you know? It was a good stoppage. Did you want him to wait a little longer to get this fourth crack, second crack, whatever you want to say? Are you happy with the date, the circumstances, where he's at right now? You know, are you at peace with all this? I, I, I would have liked for Israel to. I mean, if, you, if I had a choice, yeah, which I quite often don't, uh, then I would probably have waited longer. And prepared, uh, you know, just had given Israel a little bit more time between um, between, between the stoppage like that and the next fight. And you like even in an ideal world, I would have done what they do in boxing. I would have brought in a couple of guys for Israel to warm up on and then fight. Yeah, but we don't in the UFC. We don't have that choice. And quite frankly, Israel is one hundred percent adamant that he must be the next person to fight. Alex Pereira, beyond all doubt. So much so that when they were talking about Pereira fighting, I can't remember, it was like four or five weeks it was for one particular card. I think they had no main event or they had someone pull out of a main event <coughs> at the end of last year. Yeah, yeah. So much so that so much so that Israel, when there was talk that Pereira was gonna fight, um, Israel was like, Okay, then we'll we'll fight. We will fight before Israel had his surgeries and everything. Israel was prepared to uh, take the fight on four to five weeks' notice if Pereira was willing to take the fight. Wow. Was that ever a real thing? For a little while. I mean, I can't, I'm not going to speculate on how real it was, but it was a very real concern amongst uh, myself, Ash, and Tim that uh, Pereira was going to step in. I can't, I don't know that I can't remember, remember the circumstances. Was it possibly, or, uh, or or was it for the light heavyweight title when uh, when um, Yuri pulled out? Yeah, 
something they were looking for a main event for that or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there was there was talk of Ferreira wow. maybe taking the fight, and Izzy was like, "Okay, then we'll get on a plane and take the fight." Damn. Versus Pereira. But you wouldn't have liked that, right? I wouldn't have liked it, but I wouldn't have been able to stop it as well. Right. <laughs> and by the way, what, just Izzy. you mentioned just surgery. Izzy is. well, what surgery did he have, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, just a minor surgery on his, on his ankle. Okay. Yeah. Is he okay now? Oh, yeah, fine. It was uh, just like less than a... It was like very minor, like a couple of hours in hospital. He was out the same day. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So in a perfect world, like when would this fight happen for you? And and by the way, I love the idea of the tune-up fight. We don't get that enough in in, in MMA and the UFC. I think it's a great idea, but you know how it is. They want to run it right back. Like for you, like June, July, is that what you were hoping or even later than that? I mean, I would have been happy with just April. Uh, well, we are, yeah. yeah. Well, May, 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 okay. June, but right. uh, you know, give or take, it's uh, I'm okay with the timeline that we have. Like, as he's uh, uh, has been training for a while now, so um, we're we're in our usual frame of mind and our usual state where we're like we're calculating the days as they go by and, and monitoring the progress and. We're in an okay spot. Okay. But we're always in an okay spot this far out. We're always in a spot where I'm, um, where I want more to happen. Right. And so I, so I push for more to happen. Were you impressed with Alex? Did he surprise you? And and I'm saying I'm talking about Alex Pereira, of course, uh, with what he did in that um, fight. Yeah. I'm always impressed by Alex or by fighters of that caliber. Um, but yeah, I, I was impressed with uh, the way that he fought, the tenacity that he fought, the way he came back from adversity. And uh, what always has impressed me with Alex is his ability to cut a big amount of weight and for it to seemingly have no ill effects on his cardio. And and he has a world class. Uh, gift and that's the gift to be able to take a shot and recuperate himself and come back in and and perform yeah i can't wait for that uh two two last questions and i'll let you go thank you for the time as always um i just as a follow-up to our last conversation i'm just wondering now that izzy is the hunter rather than the hunted now that he's the challenger again for the first time in a while, do you see a difference in him, in his demeanor, in his approach at the gym? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's a very unique position to be in um, when you're the hunter. And in many respects, I think it's the better position to be in. I think the much harder to be position to be in is the flip side of that. Yeah. Um, where you're trying to stop all these guys um, whose sole purpose in the world is to take what's yours. Um, that's, that, that comes with its difficulty, but the, the stronger position to be in, I think, is the guy, is the hunter, is to, to be the hunter, the person who has all the motivation, and is, is had, you know, doing all the things that they do, that, that they, it, it, their whole life is directed towards um, taking something of you. I think that's a very strong position to be in that we haven't been in um, for a while. I saw that position. <laughs> I saw how powerful that position is with Alex Volkanovsky and the camp that he just had and the motivation that he just um, showed. Like it's, it, it's a very powerful position to be in that should be used mm. um, to our advantage here. Yeah. And and lastly, and I wanna I wanna preface this question because I know a lot of people will be like, oh, you know, he's talking. Everyone who clips this off, does something, please note that I am asking you this question. That you are not bringing this up. I am asking you this question, and feel free to plead the fifth. But as you may know, your guy Dan Hooker set the world on fire on on Monday when he had mentioned that Islam cheated. Um, is there anything that you can say about this? Do you do you have the same information? Do you believe that he cheated? Do you believe that he took an IV before the fight? Um, I spoke to Alex about the fight before Dan tweeted, 
and he alluded to it. But if I'm being honest, I thought he was joking because I did because of the way he brought it up. So I wasn't really sure. But then Dan had a series of tweets which were pretty, you know, pretty poignant. Uh, is there anything that you can say about this accusation? We have reliable information to a point. And I will half plead the fifth. Can you half plead the fifth? <laughs> you can plead the two but, and a half? Look, <laughs> yeah, the two and a half. Yeah. yeah. But the information it falls short because um for 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 several reasons and and one of them is that you can actually take an ID before a fight. It just has to be a hundred mils of of saline with uh, every twelve hours in a twelve hour block. Okay. So uh, what it more has to come down to is whether you believe that they're, that, that that people are going to take this uh, saline at 100 mils and then stop. Mm-hmm. And the information also falls short is that, uh, and, and the fact that there, from that team, there were two fighters. There were two fighters from that same team. And the information can't reliably tell us yet which fighter mm. illegally hydrated or whether they went over 100 watts. Mm. But I don't know how information can tell us that without a doubt that someone uh, in their team is in that fort use an IV bag to rehydrate, which is uh, not illegal if you're using 100 mils. you just got to ask yourself, if it's only 100 mils you're going to use within 12 hours, why would you even bother? Sure. Um, that's the information, and it, the only reason I could tell, the only reason I'm going to even repeat this, and Dan's going to, oh, 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 I advise Dan against even talking about it. Right. You, uh, look, that as you can see, that information has holes in it. That's what I'm alluding to. Okay, but it also there's enough information there to be like, uh, this is why Alex and the rest of the team are laughing because we're like, man, some, something's gone on there. Mm. We just don't, you know, we just can't reliably say what it is, and it's just, yeah, it's just, it's frustrating. It's frustrating because the whole sport uh, should be played on an even playing field. But then again, you know, you, you can't reliably say that there's not cheated. So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't go out there and say that in the same manner that Dan did. That's just, I just don't think you can reliably say that. But there's something going on there, um, whether it was uh, Zubira or whether it was Islam, something's going on there. If it was Zubair and not Islam, then Islam should be distanced. You know, if anyone on my team was doing something illegal, right. decided to do something illegal, then I would immediately distance the team from that person or something. And, and so, I don't know, Ariel. Maybe something will come out in the wash. Maybe it won't. But I think the more important thing is to focus on the fight and not worry about that so much. And the fight was, what a fight. Um, Congratulations to Islam and Javier and his other coaches who I'm not so familiar with, but congratulations to those guys. Uh, they won. And, and, then, and congratulations to Alex. Um, super proud of Alex and uh, what he was able to do. And, um, yeah, we move on. Give us the next big challenge because that's what these guys do. I love it. Uh, love talking to you. It's always a privilege. It's always a pleasure. You're a class act coach. I appreciate very much. And I should have started the conversation with this. I apologize. Congratulations on winning the uh, the Gym of the Year Award. I'm surprised you didn't fly over from uh, from Auckland with Dan and uh, Izzy to take that. It's so unlike you to not want uh, the spotlight. Uh, but congratulations. Well-deserved to both you and the team. 
and uh, it's it's really incredible what uh, what you guys have done. So uh, another another notch on the belt, so to speak. Congrats on a great great night on Saturday, and and looking forward to a big year for you guys. Thank you as always for the time, and stay safe out there. Thank you. Awesome. Right. Thank you, brother. There he is, Bye-bye. Coach Eugene Behrman of City Kickboxing. What a legend! So great to talk to him. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I I saw some people saying, um. Oh, what is this? I saw some people saying that, uh, oh, he's going to come on. He's going to complain. That's not a complainer right there. That's not a guy. I mean, I don't know if there's a coach in this business who tells it like it is more than him. And, 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 and honestly, like I can understand why coaches won't want to be critical publicly of their guys, but this guy tells it like it is the way he talks about Izzy, the way he talks about all his fighters. He tell to me, he always tells it like it is. And that's why I really, really love talking to him. Like he, you know, you, you give someone the, uh, the opening to say it was an early stoppage. Like, yeah, you're right. It wasn't early. Nope. You were wrong. All right. Agree to disagree. Talk about the fight. Talk about even the, the IV stuff. Uh, he's not letting that be an example. So fascinating guy. What a team. And uh, they still have a big year ahead of them. You know, obviously the Izzy fight. There's Kai Car France out there. There's Carlos Ulberg out there. There's Dan Hooker out there. There's fighters outside of um, of the UFC fighting for them. I know uh, Janae Harding has a big fight coming up in a couple of weeks in Bellator. There's there's a ton of young fighters on um, different rosters. So interesting time in the sport. Interesting time in New Zealand. And anyone out there who is uh, in. Uh, you know, in a tough spot over the next few days, I understand there's some serious uh, weather going on over there in New Zealand and around that area. We wish you the best and uh, are thinking of you and, and and hoping that everything is okay and that you're able to stay safe and sound. Um, we do have a guest coming up uh, in a bit. His name is Jack Della Maddalena. He will be joining us at 5.15 a.m. Perth time, which is insane. By the way, what's going on in the um, Arsenal? Ooh, 1-1. One, one. Big one. I mean, top of the table. At stake here. Saka and KDB. I mean, you talk about the big... Ooh, a penalty kick. The big dog showing up. I mean, that is just tremendous stuff. Do me a favor. Throw that on the TV. Put the, the volume down and, uh, and keep watching the show, all right? There's also a Champions League going on. There's just a lot. Now that I'm such a football aficionado... I'm uh, well-versed on all this stuff. Uh, Still have two more questions to answer, and then we shall get to the picks. Let me just answer these real quick. So we'll go back to on the nose after my 10 out of 10 promo on Sami Zayn. We good? Yep. Jack Sherman, a question for the team. What would be your walkout song, and does it change based on location? Being from New York, I get money, 50 cent would pop at MSG. I have always said that my walkout song would be Hit Him Up, and this is before all the 1070 Hilwani stuff, even back in high school. When I was in high school and I was playing in a big basketball game, I would listen to two songs, Hit Him Up and Triumph by Wu-Tang. Those were my go-tos. What y'all thought y'all wasn't going to see me? I'm the old Cyrus of this shit. Wu-Tang is here forever. But Hit Him Up was number one for me. What about you, Frank? I bet you have a good one. Is it, uh, is it The Strokes? What are we thinking? The, go the, with, um, the Wallflowers? Wham. Uh, Wham. Wake me up before you go. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Rick Astley? No Rick Astley. Just, just some Wham, some George Michael. You know? Why did it sound like you were on a speakerphone? Just because... Before? um. I still had you up in the room. Ah, there it is. What about you, GC? Walkout song? Yeah, I don't know. There's something special about uh, Many Men by 50 Cent. Wow. It's a great one. It's a great one. It feels like fighters do well when they walk out to that, too. I'm surprised you're not going with an Atlanta song. Yeah, I mean, I could maybe cook something up, but I mean, this is just right off rip. 30 seconds to think about it. Yeah. Well, just like Seems like you've spent some time thinking. Well, I've been asked this question before. How come every time we go to New York, Rick, it always seems like he's so busy? He is very busy. Why do you have, how many monitors do you have in front of you? Because you're always looking multiple different directions. Do you have multiple monitors? Are you one of those like three monitor guys? I've got my laptop and then I've got my laptop onto a monitor. Wow. uh, One one double screen, like an extra wide screen, and then my laptop down below. Oh yeah, how big? And is why am I so busy? Is because I have a job that's, you know. <laughs> but it always seems like you're. I mean, I appreciate. I'm giving you a compliment here. You're locked in. You're like, 
Looking yeah, around. it sounded like a compliment. It <laughs> definitely sounded like a compliment. What would I rather be like? Oh, let's go to New York, Greg, and he's up there like freaking, uh, you know, twiddling his thumbs and taking a nap and yawning. No, I mean this is a much better alternative. What about your walk? We're also, so? yes, we're, we're also short staffed. You know, it's a it, we're hustling over here. All right, understand? All right. Nice. My bad. My bad. Walkouts on. Um, walkouts on. I've never thought. I, I I've thought about it many times and never landed on anything because I just. I don't feel compelled. Like some Pantera. I know oh. it will never happen, so it it hasn't become real. You know, like I just don't. Mm. I don't know. I, I don't know the answer. All right. I think I think I do know. It would be mellowing rather than aggressive. And yeah, is is oh man, like mine it, would definitely yeah. be on the more aggressive side. I have also yeah, said I would you'll, go, you'll I would remember go this New York Rick. I've also said three little birds would be in contention. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It would birds. be more in that vein than yeah. the than the aggro side. Sail away. But I don't know this. Go on Atlanta base, maybe uh knock if you buck. No. Pretty good one. Who sings that? Oh wow. No, serious. You're not gonna tell me? Yeah, moving on. What? Do you know who sings that, Frank? Yeah. Knock if you buck? What do you do here? Who sings it? Crime mob, a little scrappy. No. Oh, uh, you didn't like three little birds. I would not walk out to that now. Uh, it's a great one. Tyus Ladies used to walk out to that. It was great. All right. Uh, there you have it. Uh, one more. Aaron. Hi, Ariel. Jens Pulver being inducted into the Hall of Fame really made me appreciate the pioneers, the guys that made me jump out of my chair back in the day. For some newer fans, can you give them five old school fighters that they need to watch to fully appreciate this great sport? For example, I would say my faves would be Mark Kerr, Mark Coleman, Marvin Eastman, a little bit later, but fine. Jens Pulver and Frank Shamrock. Thoughts on my list and what would yours be? All the best and thank you for answering my question. I appreciate it. Golly, that's a great question. Um, Eastman's a fun one. Not exactly a Hall of Famer, but definitely a fun one. Um, well, I mean, first, I would say Hoist Gracie, just because he's the guy who started all of this. I would say Mark Coleman. I like that one. Does Krokop count or is he too late? I don't know. If Krokop counts, uh, yes? I'm saying yes for sure to Krokop. Okay, he's not too late? Like, are I we, don't I, think so because I think like, I almost think we're so far removed from that 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 is... Era? I love yeah, Krokop. Like, Freaking terrifying. I, I think you have to. I love that. Um, loved Krokop. Randleman was nuts. He was incredible. Baroni was fun too. Thinking of all the Hammer House guys. Um, I don't know what I'm at here. Uh, Kazushi Sakuraba was insane. I mean, what a spectacle it was when he fought. Um, the beatings he took, the comebacks, the wins, all that stuff, the scene. Uh, I think that's five. I'm trying to think of some of the older, older guys. I mean, early Randy Couture was really special. Maurice Smith was pretty damn cool back in the day. Um... Don Fry, another one, incredible. Dan Severn maybe wasn't the most like flashy fighter, but definitely an, an early pioneer. Frank Shamrock was incredible. Bus Rutten, incredible. So those are some that come to mind. Any any that I missed here, Rick? I mean, it really just depends on where the, the time cutoff is, right? Because yeah. I, I even feel like like the era of guys like... PJ Penn, by the way. PJ Penn yeah, is you're right. You're right. Yep. Like so far removed from the current fan base. Like they would need to know about these guys. And Matt Hughes and... Early You know, there's Penn. so many. Yeah. There's so many guys. Um, the one that I think you have to absolutely have is the one you hit. Like you have to have Hoist. If you yeah. don't know... If you don't know about Hoist, if you're not familiar with, you know, what the early UFC looked like through the lens of, of Hoist Gracie, then... You know that that's the most important fundamental place to start, in my opinion, and then you can kind of go from there. But there's just so many names, and to your and to your point that you've made many many times, it'd be nice for some institution to kind of uh, be collecting this and figuring out a way to tell this story. Yeah, again, international, independent Hall of Fame. Where would the Hall? Of, where would you put the Hall of Fame? Would you put it in Denver? Vegas. Not okay, Vegas. Because it's the fight capital of the world, you can get people there just yeah. you know anytime. But it, it's so you know the uh, 
you know, like the football hall of fame is in Canton. The, uh, the baseball is always in like this remote the, random the sport place. is not born in Denver. Well, I mean, where was now? It where is the sport born? Yeah. Is a is a is a hard question. I mean, it kind of was born in Denver. No, I, I suppose. I mean, it's more. You know, I, I would make the distinction that the UFC is born in Denver, but you know, it's sure. It's, I mean, yeah, you're right. It would it's, feel uh, a little random. It's tricky. It would feel a little random. Denver isn't really. I think you can get around that by doing Vegas. If we're doing US, right? Because you could argue Brazil. You could argue Japan. I think those would yeah. be great places to have it. Um. If we're if we're thinking U.S. based, I think Vegas is just the the number of the cumulative number of fights that have happened there is so significant uh, that that's probably where I'd put it. Can I throw out an, a, another uh, suggestion? What about New Jersey? Yeah, you know, early days, New Jersey was the hub. What about Atlantic it's, it's City? Not bad. Atlantic City. Yeah. Could you imagine? But the, the problem is, it's such a depressed area now I that, know, like, I know. Like you have to actually think of the, the fiscal uh, impact. You have to think about the, can you get people to actually go to it? And I don't think if it was in Atlantic city, it'd be yeah. too. Although, I mean, people go to Cooperstown, they go to Canastota, they go to Canton. Yeah, you're right. They make the pig, pilgrimage specifically yeah. for that. Um, By the way, when's the last I mean, time you've been to AC? It's been a bit, man. Yeah. I'm sure it was for a fight. It was some kind of maybe like PFL's like championship a while ago. I have no idea. I've been there, I think, once, maybe twice, Max. Pretty depressing place. I went there for the uh, Jim Miller, Donald Trump. Wait, in your life only? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no reason. To oh, that. wow. Because you're you've been on the East Coast. Yeah. I, I figured know. you would have had more reps there. Um, you remember that fight? It was uh, at the Oasis. Was it uh, the Oasis? At the time no. it was called Revel. The Revel, yes. I think it's called the Oasis now, right? That's correct. Or Ocean Club Ocean, now. Yeah, they've yeah, they've yeah. changed like a thousand times. It was actually really nice, but you know, it was kind of beautiful. Yeah. And I was there, there in June. I can't imagine what it's like in February. Yeah, their problem wasn't that they didn't do a nice enough casino. Very nice place. Very, yeah. very nice. Place. Have you been there, GC? No, I've never been. I feel like you would like it, given your affinity for you think so? Yeah. After how bad you guys said it was? Well, well no, you, no, no. There's no, actually, I, I have, mean, I, I have a friend actually that loves going there. That goes there like once a month because he's a huge gambler. He also it's loves a gambler's paradise. Gambler's paradise. You never been to Vegas? I mean, it's it's not quite Vegas, but it's the closest we have here on the East Coast. But another thing that he loves that he says, like he he preaches about this. He says that AC is the spot where every big comic either starts their tour or ends their tour. And you mm. often get them before they go out, you know, before they hit New York and all the big spots. So you'll get like a Chris Rock just trying to figure out his set or, I don't know, a Tracy Morg. He told me recently he saw um, Sarah Silverman. So like you, it's, you know, if you're into gambling, if you're into comedy shows, you know, it's not a bad place. It's just like there's, you know, when, I'm not a big gambler, you know. There's I no will, reason to go there other than to gamble. Right. Is the, is the I will say as much as I love sports betting, I am not. A big like card game, roulettes, any of that. That's yeah. what I was gonna ask. If you're not a table game person, yeah, it's not you all. might as well just go to Vegas. The, the the vibe and the energy is so much different there. July. July. Yeah. July we see how there. I, I watched I watched um the Heat beat the Thunder in the fifth game of the NBA finals. That was the the day before that Miller Cerrone fight. And that was pretty cool at the sports book. There were yep. people there watching that. AC, yeah. Shout out. Shout 2012. out twelve. That's right, 2012. Yeah, fucking long wow. time ago. Jesus, <laughs> isn't that crazy? Holy shit, that was 11 years ago. My yeah, God, I just, just graduated crazy. high school. Oh my God, that is crazy. Golly, all right. I, think, I mean, GC, how many times have you you probably gone to like Mohegan and uh, yeah. and Foxwoods and those places? Yeah, believe what, it or not, yeah. I've never been. I've never. Oh, been. Wait, miss- what? Excuse me, I've been to Foxwoods. I've never been to Mohegan. Oh, I, well, I think Mohegan is is better. Really? Yeah. You don't need to go to Atlantic City. It's a, it's it's that's better. Just go just go there. Yeah. Skip it. Remember that commercial? Take a chance, make it happen. Uh, finger snapping. Uh, the, the, the wonder of it all. Yeah, let's live for the wonder of it all. This is for Atlantic City. Fox Foxwoods. Yeah. Oh, Foxwoods. I used to play it all the time during the Knicks games. Um nice. All right, there you have it. Uh, okay, let me get my ad read fell here. One second. I didn't think you were coming back. 
Yeah, it was all the way over there. All right. Uh, we're going to go to our picks here in a moment. But first, a quick word from our good friends over at DraftKings Sportsbook. Speaking of the Knicks, speaking of basketball, speaking of the National Basketball Association, the NBA season in full swing. We are rounding the corner trade deadline in the rearview mirror. We got the all star game on Sunday, all star Saturday night on Saturday. A lot to be excited about. KD on the Suns. He was at the game yesterday. Just chilling. Tremendous stuff. Anyway, we want to remind you to get in on the NBA action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the National Basketball Association. New customers can place $5 on any pregame money line bet and get $150 in bonus bets if your team wins. Plus, all customers can take a shot at an even bigger payout with DraftKings stepped up same game parlays. New customers Download the app and sign up with the code DMAR. That's very important. Place five buckaroos on any pregame money line bet and get $150 in bonus bets if your team wins. That's code DMAR only at DraftKings Sportsbook. 21 and older in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. Bonus issued as bonus bets. One boost per eligible game. Opt-in required. 10 plus leg required. For 100 deposit, excuse me, 100% boost. <sighs> deposit, parlay, and wagering restrictions apply. Eligibility and terms at sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball terms. Please support them because they support us. There's a lot more than just basketball that you can do over on DraftKings. All right, time for the Parlay Pals. And that means you can sit this one out in your Rick. But we are back. <laughs> and right. uh, yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, we're back, baby. And uh, it's time to make our picks for this weekend. A lot on the table. Shall we do the uh, randomizer thingy? Yeah, let's do it. By the way, is oh. Aries FC12 on the table? No, no. not on the table. Right. Not on the table. Randomizing. Here we go. What about Fury FC75? No. LFA 153? Oh, Frank going first, Ooh, followed by Ariel, you. followed by uh, Connor. Uh, none of that is on the table. Uh, right now on DraftKings Sportsbook, we have UFC and PFL Challenger Series if you want to dip your toe in. Uh, hey, shout out to MC Dub, Michael Carter Williams, one of the guest judges this week on PFL. How about shout that? Out, man. Our guy. Shout out, dude. Love MC Dub. Former Syracuse Orange. Yeah. Rookie of the year. You know him, right? Yeah. Point card? Yeah, legend. Orlando Magic, Bulls. Legend, Bucks. Mike strong, but yeah, man. Love him. Huge MMA fan. Gigantic. I've seen him yeah. in many a fight. All right, Frankie, you're up first. Oh, man. Nervous? Pretty much, yeah. I feel like he's going to go uh, Challenger Series. I'm yeah, feeling strong about that. That's what I was thinking. But I thought I would go with Concrete himself, Clayton Carpenter. Wow. Clayton Carpenter. I'm looking for him. Oh, there he is. My- concrete. <laughs> concrete. Is that his nickname? <laughs> yeah. Is that really his or nickname? Or in France, they call Concrete. Yes. Clayton. Oh, is that what they call him in France? Yes. Clayton Concrete Carpenter? Or That's is it one. Concrete Clayton? I, th- I feel like it's Concrete. concrete Clayton, come on. Triple C. Yeah. Clayton Concrete I like Carpenter. it. Any any particular reason why him? or I mean, he's Concrete. Yeah. That, I feel like that'll be useful. He's minus 305. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it that was, was minus 255 earlier. Sure. No, it's not. It's minus 305. Oh, lucky for me. Uh, what about our guy Lee Wood? <laughs> Of uh, Nottingham, uh, a plus underdog. 215 dog. Yeah. I'm staying away from that one. That was going to be a uh, a homer pick, but I'm going to stay away from that one. All right, I'm looking at... Is it is it me or is it you? It's me, right? It's you. What do you, what do you think that fight not going through the decision? Well, that makes me nervous, but like he's yeah. absurd. Right. His fight against Mick Conlon last year was bananas. Fantastic. Bananas. Bananas. Uh, and I interviewed Brendan Johnson yesterday, and then he popped in. He was doing something at the city ground. He was doing that face-off, and then he just pops in. Amazing. Can't wait for that. Nottingham, Saturday. Um, all right. Jessica Andrade, minus 140. Was Blanchfield a favorite against Tyler Santos? Tyler Santos was a slight favorite. Wow. Like a minus 130 before it got canceled. I'm looking at that over one and a half. There's also one other one that I wanted to look at, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, of course. Is there anything that you're leaning that towards? 
Yeah, I think I got my pick. You have your pick. Yeah, we yeah, yeah, we yeah. tend to pick before the show starts. I like to let it ride. I want it to be very like. Mario likes to get his first eyes on the card. Yes. Uh, Mid show. Live. But yes, yes, yes. And in real time. I mean, what's better than that? Um, who are you leaning towards? I'll, I'll let you make your pick. I'll, I, I will also be taking an alternate total, similar to you. Okay, go ahead, because I had I got nothing else. Uh, I will be taking the under two and a half in the Jordan Wright Zach Palga fight. Under two and a half in the Jordan Wright Zach Palga fight. Okay, I like yeah, that. Minus four hundred. Uh, yeah, Jordan Wright just has not seen a third round in his professional MMA career yet. Wow. He might go. He might go to the wrestling, but I don't know if he's going to be very successful. He's moving up to two hundred five. Palga moving down to two hundred five. I think it's going to be a uh, exciting fight for as long as it lasts. And and what is that minus two and a half? Minus four hundred. So we're at minus one fifty four now with you to go. Okay, uh, my pick is in. Just want to let yeah. you all know, and I am going with Myra Bueno Silva. Why are you laughing? Why? Because uh, I told Frank before this, I was he like, knew uh, Ariel's going to go with Myra Buena Silva. I mean, it's... Uh, Look, I, Clayton is 6-0, and oh, but has a winning streak of 7, which is just amazing. How does that even work? Maybe it was his amateur. Uh-huh. Weird. It's weird that they would include that. But anyway, uh, Myra Bueno Silva going up against Lena Landsberg on the yeah. prelims. Uh, a minus 475 at the moment. So, you know, we're just trying to get wins here. We're just trying to rack them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't mind the one and a half shot for the main event. Uh, Should we throw it I'm, on? If I'm not mistaken, okay. uh, didn't you take Carol Hosa, who fought Lena Landsberg uh, back in October for the Parlay Pals? Are you trying to say that I'm anti-Lena? To, yeah, it's starting to seem like you're anti-Lena I actually like Lena a lot. Did I take Carol Hosa? Uh, maybe I did. I think so. I think so. Uh, majority decision. Well, Lena is in a bit of a rut at the moment. Yeah, that gets us to even money. I don't hate that. It does? I don't hate that. Yeah, plus 100. Plus 100. Clayton Carpenter, minus 305. Wright Palga, under 2.5, minus 400. Myra Boyna Silva, minus 475. Even money. And honestly, when people rip on us for taking giant favorites, they're usually like, oh, make the rule minus 500 or better. We're, we're technically doing that. So Sure. Plus 100. Here we are. Wow. Feel good about it. Uh, honestly, if I'm, if I'm being honest, uh, you know, this is a tough card. This is a tough card, yeah. Betting perspective, viewing perspective. Although I will admit, um, I am very intrigued by the main event. I think the main event oh, is yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Oh, right? main event's fantastic. The main event is absolutely great. I mean, Blanchfield looked amazing against Molly McCann. She has looked amazing thus far in her UFC career. And Jessica Andrade is, I mean, just an absolute tornado. Yeah, it's gonna, the, the main event is, is for sure uh, must-watch television. Uh, beyond that, it's a UFC card. Who do you got in the main event? I'm going on Drudge. Do you want to rip through them now, or we don't have enough time? No time. Uh, no Jack, time. Della, Jack Della has arrived. Okay. So you're, you're going on Drudge money line. Peace out. Yeah. You're correct. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Straight up. Nothing else. No uh, over one and a half. Something like no, that. No, no, no. Just straight up. I can get into it in a minute. Okay. All right. Give you my reasonings. All right. So stay tuned for that. And by the way, uh, Jack Grealish with the big. Uh, the big score for uh, Man United. The big goal, the big score. I don't know what I'm saying. Man United? Man City. Man City. Gosh, I'm all for clamped here. Uh, so they're up 2-1. Huge stuff there. They would be tied, and I think they would get the uh, the advantage because of uh, the goal differential. So they would be top of the table. Top of the table. They'll never win you know, Europe, but they could be top of the table for the uh, Premier League. For now, though, let's go to our last guest of the day and golly i don't know if anyone has ever woken up this early to join us so let's not waste any time he had a massive win on saturday here in america sunday in perth he remains undefeated in the ufc he's one of the brightest young stars in the sport on a meteoric rise he is jdm he is jack della madalena he is don giacomo he is joining us right now very early over there. Jack, what have we done? How could we make you wake up so early? Yeah. I mean, I could see it in your eyes. You must hate me right now. How much do you hate it's, me? It's bad. This is more of a sleeping than last time, so it's all right. What was last time? It's all right. Last time was early hours. It must have been... Oh, I think we had you at the top. Yeah, we had you at the top here. So this time, so this time the play was to wake up early and not go to sleep, you know, late. This that's what you you opted for this time. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah, probably just went. Yeah, exactly. Wake up early and continue on my day. I appreciate that. And it's summertime over there, so it seems like the sun is out. Is the sun out right now or not quite yet? 
Nah, it's okay. actually still dark. Okay. I geez. think no, like more like mid in the middle of summer. It's probably getting a bit lighter now, but still pretty dark. Yeah. Okay. All right. By the way, how's your nose? It's still going good. Okay. Still going good. It looks a little more crooked since the last time we spoke. Nah, no, it's about the same. Okay, all right, yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. To get a win like that at home in Perth, can you can you even put in into words what that felt like, what that meant for you? What was that? What was that like? It was pretty surreal, you know. The just the the crowd, the crowd for the whole week was pretty insane. They were super excited to be there, and like they Australian crowds get around Australian fighters. So yeah, it was surreal. It was incredible, and it was everything I hoped it would be. Yeah. Uh, did you feel nervous beforehand, just because you wanted to perform? You know, it was a big moment for you in your career. Did you feel nerves? Honestly, not any more nervous than usual. It was just the normal nerves. Of, yeah, not wanting to underperform for the crowd, and then yeah, I felt pretty good walking out. And then when I made the walk, I felt pretty much just another day in the office. What, what, like, how could you even put into words the, the confidence that you're dealing with right now? Like your level of, it feels like you're just on this amazing run and there's so much talk and buzz and hype surrounding you and you're going out there and delivering. Does it feel like you are, you know, like for lack of a better analogy, just walking on water here. Do you feel that confidence oozing out of you? Um, I was pretty, yeah, honestly, I thought I, like the, everybody I thought, I thought I could beat them. So far, they're obviously tough challenges, but yeah, I guess, I guess I get the confidence from training every day. But yeah, I think I can. I think I can beat people in the top fifteen and keep this run going. I really wanted to get a first round finish from the Perth crowd because that's a, a, how my year went with first round finishes. So I was really gunning for that first round finish this time around as well. It was getting a little spicy there with you and Randy before the fight. Um, were, were you were you surprised at any of that going into it? Uh, not really. Not really. The crowd was pumped. Like every time we had an interaction, the the crowd was really getting behind me. They were booing him. I think he felt like the just felt the crowd was really honestly the crowd was alive every time yeah. there was any interaction they'd get behind it. So it was cool. I enjoyed every second of it. Um, and, and even afterwards though, I saw you guys, uh, share a drink, share some time together. Was that just a random thing? Like you just saw each other at the bar restaurant hotel or did you plan that? Um, sort of, uh, I was having like a small little after party and then, um, uh, Randy reached out to Tim and said, I'd love to get a drink with Jack, which was really cool. Wow. So he came down, we shared a drink and sort of just shared it out. Wow. experiences and discuss the fight and pretty cool to see that it's a shows good sportsmanship so it was, it was welcomed amongst my friends and family yeah what was it awkward at, at the start not really to be honest like it's i don't know i feel like when you compete against someone the awkwardness for me anyway sort of just is out the window it wasn't no it was no awkwardness it was cool to See, so like, yeah, respectful martial artists come and give props to the winner, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Uh hey, you never know what's going to happen. But, yeah, when I fought Danny Roberts at Apex, I felt a little bit more nervous than usual, but... Because there was no one there, maybe? It was sterile? Yeah, maybe. Maybe it just seemed like a weird environment to fight. Must to what I was be had been used to for right. a few fights. Must have been incredible not to travel, right? You, I mean, such a long trip usually for you to just fight. Like, how far do you live from that that arena? Oh, I live 15 minutes away. Wow. In a car. So I'm really like, yeah, Perth is pretty small, you know. I live, that that arena is, yeah, probably 15 minutes out of the CBD, the city. Wow. And yeah, I live about 15 minutes out. And, and what was the game plan? Did you stay at the hotel or did you just stay home all week? No, I stayed home all week. Wow. It just seemed easier. I thought I'd just take advantage of being at home. E even uh, though home might be a little hectic, you have a young child, right? You, you, you'd you rather stay there yeah. than at the hotel. Yeah. I sort of just let mom take care of um. Ah. Mom was very good for a, a week to take care of 
they have been just let me be. But yeah, I love, it was nice just being at home. It just made everything feel a bit more relaxing, a little, little less hectic. Right. By the way, how old is your son? He's about uh, six and a half months. Going on seven months. So the last time we spoke, he came to the fights. He came to the fights. Wow! Last time we spoke, yeah, I don't he think was, there. was he was he born yet, or he was just about to be born. Oh, he, I probably wasn't born yet when we spoke. Yeah, but you knew you were obviously going to be a dad because that was that was yeah yeah. So he's six. Uh, so when, when was he born? He was born in uh, in in August. About the twenty uh, ninth of July. Twenty ninth of July. Okay, so. I think we spoke after UFC 275, which was in June. So it was right before he yeah. was born, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right before he's born. Is it? Is it? Is it totally? Do you find? I was actually. I asked answered a question earlier about like what it's like to be a father. Do you feel completely different now, fighting as a father, and not so much like you know your wife was pregnant, but now like he's actually here. You have to see him. Is it different? Yeah. It is different. You know, it's just. Yeah, it just it makes everything more a bit more real. Makes me really want to obviously win a bit harder, I guess, if that was ever possible before. But yeah, just obviously, and then just brings a good balance to life. Yes, that's the it's word I use. Cool, and, good balance. And, and, yeah. And, and so he went to the fight. He came. Yeah. Now it was okay because it was early morning, um, right? I thought I didn't end up fighting until about midday. Midday. But he got there at 10, 10 a.m. Was there for probably two hours. He had big head like um headphones on, so yeah. it wasn't too loud for him. But he loved it. He's a pretty chill baby, so he was pretty he just loved watching all the people around wow. and had a good time. Did he make it till the end? Um no, he they came backstage with me after I fought. Okay. We did our media stuff, and then I watched Volkanovski fight backstage. So we just watched. Okay, we watched it together backstage. And 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 before you fought, as you were walking out, getting ready to fight, did you happen to see him? And if so, what did that feel like? No, nah, I only saw him in the morning. Okay, you didn't see him in the arena. That's pretty. It's just so. No, nah, I didn't see him in the arena. Okay. Um, wow. So even even the morning of the fight, you left from home. Yeah, he left from home. Woke up when he woke up, and then that's amazing. Cruised in and just went to fight. Yeah, it was cool. It was beat a man up and then yeah, went back home. Pretty, yeah, that was pretty much how it went. So it's pretty cool. Uh, by the way, I saw a photo of your son. Um, I think he was at the gym. Uh, he seems like a very healthy boy. He's a very big boy for six months, right? I saw. Yeah, you guys he's both, big. He's, yeah. he's huge. He's. A, I mean, this kid looks very healthy. He's We're massive. showing the picture that you posted. He's, I thought he was like yeah, maybe like 12 enough. months in this photo. He's six months? <laughs> yeah, he's solid. Solid, Franco. He's a big boy. Very happy. I also saw another photo where he threw up right in your face. Yeah, he does that time to time. <laughs> that happens more than once? <laughs> it's happened more than once, yeah. Oh, golly. What a he eats a lot, you know. He's always got a full belly. Yeah, no, I can understand. <laughs> Look at this photo. We're showing the photo now. The the throw up is just like dripping off your nose. <laughs> the joys of being a dad. Yeah, I had right? to jump. Yeah, I was pretty proud of that moment. Had to get a flick. Yes, um, you're 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 Man. technically a father of two because you also have a dog. Uh, what kind of dog is this? A, yeah. a, a bulldog. It's Australian bulldog. Wow, what's the difference between an Australian bulldog and a British bulldog? Um, I don't really know, to be honest. They, she seems, I think she's a bit more, she's a bit bigger. She's not as, um, I'd say Austra uh, in British Bulldogs are quite short and big. She's more just a bit like, taller and longer. Okay. But much the same, much the same. Is she, is she good with your son? Yeah, she's really good. She... Yeah, I know you probably wouldn't want to leave a dog and a baby together, but she, we pretty much do at this point. She's a pretty calm dog. Okay. Uh, yeah, she seems pretty yeah. calm. Also doesn't seem very yeah. active. I saw a video of you just dragging her, refusing to walk. You were just dragging her. <laughs> was that, what is going yeah, on there? Yeah. She just doesn't like to walk? Yeah, for some when I always walk her down to the park and whenever she like sees a nice Nice grass. She seems just to lie on it, and I think she. I think she likes getting like 
she likes the itchy feeling of getting dragged along it. Oh, she okay. actually likes getting dragged. Okay. So if anyone saw her, she'd think I'm just dragging my dog home. But <laughs> for some reason, she likes to get dragged on spiky grass. Tremendous. Um, so now, <laughs> you know, I we were talking about this uh, on Monday. You look at the top 15 of the UFC welterweight division, and, you know, with all due respect, there's there's a couple of guys who have been around for a minute, right? I feel like you look yeah. at some of these matchups and you could do a lot of damage right now at the top. Um, and I know you mentioned top 15. I think you also mentioned in your post-fight press conference of a Sente Luque type, right? That's what you're, I mean, if, in a perfect world, that's what you're leaning towards? I think so. I think it's a cool fight. I was only sort of saying his name because I didn't think he had just from the top sort of guys. He was the only one that didn't really have a fight lined up, I believe. And this is, I think it would make a cool fight. I think that's a one for the fans. And yes, I think the UFC could get behind that sort of a fight. Uh, you're ranked for the first time. Did you know this? Yeah, I did. I saw that, which is really cool. Yeah. Real number cool. 14 as of, uh, as of yesterday, um, when you saw that, what, what, what did you think? I mean, was that a goal for your, for you? Like, was this something that you had on the, uh, the board of things to accomplish? Um, it was, you know, I really wanted, honestly, my next fight, I really was push. I wanted to fight someone in the top 15. So now just to be in the top 15, I guess it's even better. So yeah, yeah, it is a goal, you know, I'm going to keep crunching my goals. It's one of the goals and going to keep moving towards number one. I, I feel like you might start to run into an issue where a lot of these guys aren't going to want to fight you um, because of how good you've looked. Do you, do you feel like that might be a case, like some of the older guys? Yeah, maybe. Maybe just timing-wise and it doesn't work out for them. I think if you do fight me, I'm going to hit you hard yes. over and over again. So it's going to be a hard fight. So, yeah, I hope we I hope we don't get that. I hope everyone's down to compete but uh, what is the goal for this year in terms of how many times you fought because like you you fight in february you can realistically get three in if things work out you know for yeah. you is that what you're hoping for yeah i think so i think at least three would be the goal i think last year my schedule i was pretty happy with the schedule last year it was three fights sort of like a fight at the start of the year mid-year and then towards november so I think, yeah, I can probably stick to that same sort of schedule and keep it rolling. Yeah. And, and fighting in front of crowds, right? Like you had the apex one last time, but like you've also, you know, you've been in Singapore, you've been in the, the crowd is, is so much better, right? I, it's not always going to be Perth obviously, but it's just a whole different ball game. Yeah. Yeah. I think, the, I think the crowds were, yeah, that's a big part of it. You know, I like, I enjoy the crowd. Happy to go find the apex if need be, but yeah, I think the crowd is, adds that little bit more of excitement and makes them feel more like you're walking out to fight. Yeah. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, was this your first sub? Um, in the U S no, in my career, I have, um, well, I have one rear naked choke. Oh yes. Back in, in 2017, yeah, James Duckett. Okay. Yeah. Second sub. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Second sub. Um, but in the UFC and it's been a while, it's been six years since that one. Yeah. Um, it's been a while. What, what, were you surprised you got a sub? Um, not really, to be honest. I was actually envisioned that I might hurt him, and then if they, at any point if he does give up the neck, I'll take it, you know. So yeah, just I was hitting him. In the he sort of turned over to all fours, and I followed his hip, and Mark wasn't finishing it. So I, yeah, just stuck the uh, yeah, took his neck and subbed him. Do do you think it should have been stopped earlier? No, no. I don't think so. Okay, I think looking back, I landed some shots, but I, no, I, honestly, if that was me in that situation, I'd much prefer to. I would be annoyed if it had stopped at that point. Okay, some people have been starting to uh, call you. You know, you got Don Giacomo, but you, I don't know if you know this. Uh, some people have been calling you JD Him, um, things like that. Yeah. Are, are you familiar with all of this, and how do you feel about this nickname? I like it. Okay. I like them all. Okay. So damn school. It's, I guess some of, only some of the greats get their name. Uh, yeah. I don't know what you call that, but yeah, it's cool. I'm easy. Okay. It's better than them butchering my name. Sure. Yeah, no, no. They definitely <laughs> they definitely know your name now. That's uh, 100%. 
Um, I also wanted to ask you about eternal MMA. I've gotten to know Cam O'Neill a little bit uh, over the last few months. Yeah. And you're one of the uh, the great products of, of that promotion, and they're getting a little more attention now. Um, for those that may not be familiar with Eternal, um, what what what, uh, what are your experiences like with them, and 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 what was it like fighting for them? A lot of your fights, the vast majority of your fights going into the UFC were with Eternal. They seem to be the 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 predominant sort of um, I don't want to call them regional, but like the next step before the UFC in Australia, they're number yeah, one. For sure. Yeah. So so what was your experience? Yeah, they're like definitely number one. They were great, you know. Honestly, for me, it was just uh, wanting to fight consistently and. They're the only show in Australia that put on consistent fights throughout the year. Like, cut, like if you look at their calendar, they fight. They have a fight. Like it seems like every month or two. So it was, yeah, it was perfect for me. They always made made my uh, journey easy. Mm. Consistent fights, good competitive fights, and you just go to one of those shows, and they're yeah, really professionally run and. Yeah, I think it is the cream of the crop of uh, MMA organizations. Australia's number one by far. Love it. Uh, so realistically for you, when would you like to fight again? What month? Um, honestly, any like, May onwards. Any May right. onwards would be cool to be honest. I'm going to I'm going to buy like going for a holiday, the family in March. So I'll probably just train up until March and then yeah, April, probably May, I'll be good to go. Okay. Uh, and I feel like... But we'll see, you know. This time we'll next see year... see if anything pops up. This time next year, we're talking like some serious business. Yeah, if I feel like if I can string together a, a set of wins like last year, which that's what I'm going to do, I believe. Yeah, I think we will have a big fight this time next year. I love it. I love it. By the way, do you have a take on... Uh, the title fight coming up next month, who wins, Leon or Camaro? Uh, I think Leon will win, to be honest. I think, I don't know, I think when you get a a young guy who knocks out the old guy for a belt and then you rematch him, I think it's a tough ask for the older guy to come back. Yeah. Just from where he's at, just from where they're at in their careers. And I think, honestly, from skill-wise, I think Leon's, He's got a beautiful striking. He's a very nice striker, and he showed that he he has got the wrestling there. If I think if he backs himself, bit of a trick, which question. he will. It was a bit of a trick yeah. question because that's that's your chosen few guy. I mean, you couldn't go against <laughs> nah. the captain of the ship, right? No, now. I'll be honest with you. I think he's. I, I'll be honest with you. I think he's taken that. I appreciate that. Thank you for that honesty. Uh, congratulations on the win. Thank you for waking up early. I pre- What's the move now? Do you go back to bed or do you start your day? Nah, the sun, the sun is up, so I'm probably going to start the day. All right. Well, I... Uh, it's only 5.30. That's all right. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Your son probably waking up pretty soon, right? Six months? They're waking up at what? 6.30, yeah. 6, something like that? Yeah, he's up normally 6, 6.30. Okay. Hopefully an hour he's given me. All right, cool. Well, enjoy that hour. <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy the victory. Congratulations. Can't wait to see what you do this year. Feels like sky's the limit for you. Enjoy it. Cheers, Eric. We'll talk to you soon. All right, there he is. Jack Della Maddalena, JDM, JD him, Don Giacomo. Everyone very excited about this man and with good reason. Right now, 4-0 in the UFC, 5-0 if you include Contender Series. Um, and what a run for him. Uh, one in January of 2022, one in June of 2022, one in November, was 3-0 and last year. One of the breakout fighters of 2022 starts the year off with his uh, biggest win so far, the win over Randy Brown on uh, Saturday, a uh, first round submission, two minutes, 13 seconds. He said he wanted the first round finish. He got the first round finish. Uh, he, uh, he has four in a row now. Uh, won on the contender series just uh, not that long ago, September of 2021, so a year and a half or so ago, won via decision, but very few decisions on the resume. Uh, 11 of his 14 wins via knockout, two via submission, one via decision. So he gets his second submission, first in the UFC, first since 2017. A name to remember, and now, as far as the very official, very unbiased, 
very legit UFC rankings. He is now 14th, right behind Michael Kesa and Neil Magny and Jorge Masvidal, Shavkat Rachmanov, who's got that big fight against Jeff O'Neill coming up in a few weeks' time. Uh, that is in Las Vegas. But as we said on Saturday, there's a lot of guys who have been around for a long time at 170. Feels like a changing of the guard is coming. Usman Covington, Shamayev New, Bilal, Gilbert Burns, Wonderboy, Jeff Neal, Brady Luque, Rachmanov, Masvidal, Magni Chiesa, JDM, Michel Pereira. So interesting times. And uh, I know GC loves him some JDM. This time, does JDM fight for a belt in 2024? Oh man, that's tough. I'm, I'll say yes. I'll say yes. Could I mean, be back I've, end of the year. I mean, back end of the year, yeah, this guy's fighting three times a year. We're talking, you know, five, six fights away. Let's go back end. Let's get the let's get the Luke fight, which would be an absolute banger. Oh my god. Uh, I mean, how can you not love the guy? Like he talks about how chill he is. Like he's, he's so chill. He t- he's he's talking about getting four straight first round finishes to start his UFC career. Like he just went to the beach with his kids. Like he's just like. Yeah, pretty excited about it. Pretty excited. Like I, feel like, I feel like when it's like, all right, Jack, time to walk to the cage, man. He's just like, all right, cool. Yeah. Like, he just gets up. Nothing feel like, seems to rattle like him. When he told his wife goodbye, he was just like, I'm heading out for work. I'll See be back later. later. <laughs> like, everything's just how hum, just business as usual. I have to be honest, when he talked about the first round finish, the way he said it was so nonchalant, I was starting to think, wait, did he not get a first round finish? Because he was like, eh, I really wanted the first round finish. But he says it in a way that it's almost like he's upset. You know, like he's just so chill about it. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. And most guys, like you hear them, they're just like, ah, oh, if you're not nervous before a fight, like you're you're not human. And he's just like, I don't like to get too nervous, you know? Yeah. Like, as if that's something you have like complete control over. Unbelievable. Yeah, um, he's the man. All right. So let's see what happens with him. Uh, four great characters on today's show. Appreciate all of them, and especially him for waking up so early. Let's get the picks. And by the way, Man City wins 3-1. Erling Holland with the big... Wow. Uh, That's huge. I mean, they're top of the table. That, t- that ties them up, 52 points apiece? Ties them up, but they have the, the goal differential. Ay, ay, ay. But you know what? I'm happy for them that they got this win, even though I'm not the biggest fan, because we all know what's going to happen Saturday at the city ground when they walk into the bus. So that is Nottingham Forest. You know, they were too focused on Wednesday. It's going to be a huge letdown moment. Couldn't agree more. I mean, I couldn't agree more. What a day it's going to be on Saturday. Revenge. For me, it's very personal. First game I ever saw in attendance, of course, we lost 6 0. So we've got a little thing or two coming. You know what, what I mean? What a day. What a day in, in Nottingham on I Saturday. Know. We, we start off with Man City coming into the city ground. Then we got Lee Wood uh, later in the day. I mean, it, what a day it would be to be in Nottingham. Could you imagine? Because like Lee Wood is an institution there. Like The whole city stops, I hear, when he fights. I imagine. And uh, this is a big fight for him, as we said. You know, underdog going into this fight. Face. Do we have the face-off, by the way? We do. Look, can we play this real quick? I need to hear the audio. I haven't heard the audio. Oh, you audio haven't heard yet. the... Matchroom did a great job with this. This is yesterday at the city ground. This is actually at the exact time that I was interviewing Brennan Johnson, uh, the great young forward for Nottingham. This is happening behind us, behind the interview. But the way they shot this and with the audio was brilliant. I'd love to see this happen more. It was almost cinematic. Take a look. City ground in the back, love it. Where's the translator? <laughs> Tell him I picked him. Hey. I picked you. Bueno, lo bueno que lo he hecho. Mucho es mío. Close is gonna get. Espero que se haya preparado muy bien. Espero que se haya preparado muy bien. Una guerra. Creo que sí. Seré su peor pesadilla. Seré su peor pesadilla. Espero que sí limpie la de Warrington. I heard it all before. All before. Siempre, todo es todo. Great. Great shot. Pero no un lugar como yo. Not for me. He's about to chew through that piece. Yes. <laughs> oh, and then they have to break it up. Look at this. The music. They're at. Red and gold jacket is sick too. They're at the. Uh, the city ground with the the lights on, the 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 breath. It's so cold. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's amazing. I love the line. Tell him I picked him. Yeah. Tell him from the I underdog. Picked, I, picked I picked you. you. <laughs> <laughs> he does have the belt. He does have he the does, belt. He does. He uh, does. Can't lie. I've been getting into the, like higher level boxing stuff lately. Been loving it. I'm telling you, man. 
Love it. Like the the real high level stuff. It's a bit. Oh, it's I'm amazing. I'm always down for. It's amazing. Got to get that DAZN subscription. <sighs> yeah, Eddie. Can we well, gift our guy or what? Uh, hook me up. Thirty dollars a month. A lot of big fights coming up. A lot of subscription services. I to know. Pay. Yeah. There are there are a lot. All right, what do we got? What do we got? Uh, all right, let's start with uh, UFC Apex sixty nine. I'm keeping it light. I'm keeping it tight. This is a this is a tough card, man. Uh, proceed with caution. By the time this card rolls around, we'll be two short weeks away from UFC two eighty five. We'll know much more about the fighters by the time that happens. Uh, to kick us off, the curtain jerker. It's a flyweight fight. You know what I'm doing here. I'm taking the under. They're five and one on the year, and the only one that lost was a road to UFC fight. I'm not going to stop now. I'm not going to sit here and you know give you some long explanation of why I'm doing it. It's a flyweight fight, so I'm taking the under. It's it's as simple as that. I mean, the bookies are starting to wise up. They're giving us minus money on these now. It's it's getting ridiculous. Wow. Uh, we continue though. Only only have a few on this, but I am taking some shots. I'm take I'm taking some sprinkles, some longer shots. So Jim Miller. He's been on this card. He was supposed to be on this card. Uh, opponent loses his opponent. He gets Alex Hernandez in on short notice. Hernandez just fought at 145 in December. Now he's at, he's moving back up to lightweight for this fight. I mean, pretty much the way this fight is going to go, Alex Hernandez is probably going to look great in the first round, and you know he could have Jim Miller in some trouble. But if he doesn't finish him, I mean, it just seems like Alex Hernandez just sort of falls off a cliff if he's not able to get it done in the first round. Uh, if you look at it, four of his six UFC wins are by first-round finish. Four of his five UFC losses are by second-round finish. I mean, we saw it last time out against Billy Q. We saw it last February against Hanato Moicano. I remember watching that Hanato Moicano fight and being like, man, Alex Hernandez at, at dog money was probably a good pick this week in the first round. And then we get to the second round, and he just starts struggling immensely. For that reason, chunkyard dog. The vet, been there, done that, seen it all. I'm going to take Jim Miller inside the distance at plus 333. Now, I mentioned Alexander Hernandez. Four of his five UFC losses come by getting finished in the second round. Jim Miller, three straight victories by finishing his opponent in the second round. So I'm taking another little sprinkle on Jim Miller, round two, plus 1,100. Oh I mean, I'm, I'm talking long shots, sprinkles, just a little something fun, make the card a little bit more interesting, keeping it tight, keeping it small. Only have four singles on this one. But Jim Miller, I mean, he can be a hero for me on Saturday. That would be absolutely tremendous to watch his cash. I mean, I, I think there's a legitimate chance at it. If he, if he can, If we can get to the second round, if we can meet in the center of the octagon, in the second round, I, I feel good about the potential of this cashing, man. I mean, it really is just the story of Hernandez's last three years. I mean, he's he's super dangerous. He's super talented. But if he can't get his opponent out in, in the first round, he, he really starts to struggle. Uh, main event, played it this morning. Honestly, I thought about waiting even longer to see if there was going to be more money coming in on Blanchfield. But at this line, I, I felt comfortable playing it. Some people might end up getting like minus 120, minus 115 on Jessica Andraja. A lot oh. of people seem to like Aaron Blanchfield this week. This is a big step up in competition for her. I mean, this is not the J.J. Aldrichs. This is not the Sarah Alpars. This, this is not Molly McCann. This this is Jessica Andraja. Like, this is, this is top-tier talent here. This is a super talented uh, opponent, a super dangerous opponent. I mean, if you, if you look at who Andraja is losing to, it is the top of the top. It's the Ioannas, it's the Roses, uh, the Valentinas, the Whaley's. Like that, that's who she's losing to. When she when she fights someone like Lauren Murphy, she essentially put on a master class just a few weeks ago. Really, the only thing that's giving me any sort of pause here is the fact that it is on short notice. Is she going to be in proper shape? Is she going to be good to go? From everything that I've ever seen from her fights, I, I fail to to think that she's going not going to be in shape. She she took the fight for a reason. Uh, it doesn't have like a huge benefit to her. Winning, whereas if Blanchfield wins, it's going to be absolutely massive for her moving to a title. So I'm going to assume that she's in shape. And the performance she's coming off of, I mean, she looked so fantastic. There's going to be a large disparity in the striking. I, I think if this stays on the feet, it's just going to be one-way traffic for Jessica Andrade. The worry is Blanchfield being able to get the takedowns. We saw a struggle against Valentina Shevchenko, got taken down seven times, finished. Uh, not a great performance. But in her UFC career, man, a 74% takedown defense, not many people have been able to, to have successes. It was really only Valentina. And then 10 years ago when she was fighting a bantamweight uh, against, you know, the Liz Carmouches and, and the Raquel Penningtons of the world, uh, you know, I think 
the only other person to get multiple takedowns was Tisha Torres and Jessica Andrade landed 10 takedowns in that fight. So, I mean, if we're going into round two and say Aaron Blanchfield is 0 for 3 on takedowns, I mean, Jessica Andrade is going to run away with this thing. If if And the fact that it's a five-round fight and Jessica Andrade is live for a finish at any moment, um, I'm going to favor here. I mean, this is a super playable price and... You know, maybe I look back on her and it's just like, man, I can't believe I played Jessica Andrade against Aaron Blanchfield. She's she really is the future. But at this at this rate, I'm I'm going to go with Jessica Andrade. I, I think she gets it done, and I I think she likely finishes her. Wow, likely finishes. Good thing I didn't take that. Uh, what was it? Minus fifty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, shout out to Best Fight Odds minus fifty thousand. Yes. Uh, I, I really do like this fight. I have to say, like, I, oh, I, I think it's a fantastic yeah. fight. I mean, and I, you know, I could be wrong on this. It's a it's a coin flip on the odds, essentially, uh, with the way that it's moving. A lot of people like Blanchfield. She is she is up and coming, uh, and I think it's going to be super entertaining. I mean, when are, it's rare that Jessica Andrade is not involved in an entertaining fight. I I would also say, you know, I know we were talking about thinking about it more. You beat Jessica Andrade, Aaron Huge. Blanchfield. I, I, how, how do you deny again the big if is is if Valentina loses you got to give her an immediate rematch but if she wins you beat Jessica Andrade and I feel like you're, that I mean that's the most impressive win of anyone else in that discussion say she finishes Jessica Andrade too oh my gosh Jesus. I mean this is a five rounder dude and, and Andrade makes fights chaotic like there there's a world that if she loses she gets finished especially if, if Blanchfield's able to get her on the ground consistently throughout the rounds I think it's a fantastic fight. Uh, when I heard Santos was out, I was I was pretty ups, you know yeah. disappointed. But You're like, damn it! I, I mean, amazing replacement. Amazing, amazing replacement. Uh, and I do have a little action. I got a little action on uh, on uh, Wood Lara. What do we got? What do we got? I, I had to do it. I'm you going with the dog? I'm taking Lee Wood to get knocked down. Oh, minus, interesting. Minus one hundred two. You uh, can do that. And you're not saying get knocked out. You're not get knocked out. Just get, knocked down once. Get knocked down. So, I mean, if you if you go back and look at his last fight, he gets knocked down in the first round, comes back, and ends up winning in the 12th round. Uh, but, I mean, Marisha Lara, man, he's, he's got serious power. Six knockdowns in his last three fights. These dudes are... If, if everything that they're saying is true, they're going to come to the center of the ring, and they are just going to chuck him. I really do think this is going to be an incredibly exciting fight. Um, and I, th- I think someone's going to get knocked down, and I'm, I'm going to lean to the wow. side. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit wild and wacky. Yeah, I think it's going to be wild and wacky, but I am taking another little flyer here. A lot of people thinking this one's going to end earlier. I am actually going to take the fight to end in round 7 through 12. So either huh. either of them can win. It's plus 220. Uh, so my thinking behind this, last time Lara was in a 12-rounder, I, I believe it's the only time he's ever fought in a 12-rounder round, against Warrington. He got two knockdowns in that fight, and it took him till the ninth round to finish it. And then Lee Wood, all five of his last wins, all by knockout, none of them came before the ninth round. Uh, so I kind of like this to be a slugfest that goes a little bit later and, and someone ends up getting finished. It's like minus 110 to end in the first six rounds. At plus 220, I'm, I'm willing to take a little, a little shot on, on it going longer. Can't wait. And, and the word is... If he wins, maybe even if he loses because he's such a big star, but I think if he wins, it makes more sense. They would do him versus Warrington this summer at the city ground. Can you imagine that? He said in uh, the little mini doc that that Matchroom put out, uh, Dance with the Devil, uh-huh. uh, that like the dream is to be Lara yeah. and then fight at the city. Yeah, Taking a flight out there? It's going to be me, Brennan, Jesse, Stevie Coop sitting in the front row, just taking it all in. <laughs> Just taking it all in. Should be great stuff. I can't wait. Nothing on the chamber, huh? No Sami Zayn play? Do you want to know the odds? Tell me, tell me. There are odds. There are? Yeah. What is it? Roman Reigns minus 2,000. 2,000? Sami Zayn plus 700. Ah. It's as if someone knows. Nah, I mean, look. It, like I said, they never change uh, the belt before Mania. They never do that. Come on, man. It's all, it's all about my guy Cody Rhodes. That's who yeah. takes it out. Uh, that's who and we got ends any. the bloodline. Yeah. Oh, wow. All right, look at you. Is that a, is that a bold statement? I've, no, I feel like, I mean, you said he's a favorite, right? Like minus 500 or something? Yeah. Yeah, so. But is that a correct statement? Ends, the, Ends bloodline? the bloodline? I mean, I don't know if you could end it if you just beat him, but maybe they okay. will fizzle or crumble or, I don't know, break up. You know, that could happen. Um, all right, so those are the plays. By the way, a couple of news and notes before we say goodbye. They, uh, yeah. 
they announced who the judges and who the referee will be for the highly anticipated John Jones versus Surreal Gan fight. Uh, this according to Damon Martin of MMA Fighting. The assignments were made <laughs> at today's Nevada Athletic Commission. Frank's got his fingers crossed. Why? Frank is a Derek, huge Derek Derek on there. Uh, okay, yeah, I know you're a big fan of his. Uh, Mark Goddard is going to be the referee. I'll take so, it. Yeah, uh -oh. yeah. Best in the Cheer biz. God. Best in the biz. No, best in the Early biz. Early stoppage. Listen, best in the biz. Okay. I always preface that. Do I not? I say always. The best in the business. Worst stoppage in title fight history. I did not say that. Uh, <laughs> the judges will be Mike Bell, Sal Diamato, and... Let's hear it. Ron McCarthy. Oh, oh. come on, McCarthy. Uh, Co-main event. Main event. Uh, Co-main event referee will be Jason Herzog, who probably is number two in the biz. Nice. Judges, Ben Cartledge, Chris Lee. Nice. And Derek. That's what I, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> he just made Frank's day, man. Oh. You think I could get Derek on the show for you, Frank? I would, I've already you, you need to get him in studio if you're going to. Yeah. Frank's dying to meet him. When he found out that he was one of the judges for the main events this weekend, he was hyped. Why are you such a fan? He's amazing. He, he, by the way, he's the one that scored at 49 46. He sees clearly while others uh, do. Uh, yeah. That is great stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't even, honestly, I don't even know what Derek clearly looks like. Wow. They're not allowed to do interviews. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so like. Douglas maybe Crosby. he can. Uh, I mean, only with Chael. Maybe he can do uh, an interview <laughs> for, Chael, uh, through the Frank lens. <laughs> That's the best lens to use. <laughs> can we get a spin-off show? <laughs> just just for it's my view on things. <laughs> yeah, why not? It would be so good. Oh, it would be so good. Oh, through the Frank lens. <laughs> it's such a good. I mean, it's the all-time name. All-time name. This is such a great name. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Oh, my gosh. That is incredible. Um, yeah, they're not allowed to do interviews, unfortunately. They're, or at least they are strongly, strongly advised not to. Uh, another piece of news, this according to our good friend Mike Heck of MMA Fighting. Jorge Masvidal's trial date has been pushed back again following the alleged assault on former friend Recent opponent, Colby Covington, on Wednesday, a hearing took place at the Miami-Dade County Courthouse, and the case was continued. A pretrial date was set for May 10th, with the trial now expected to begin on May 22nd. The two-time challenger is accused of assaulting Covington in March of 2022 outside a restaurant in Miami Beach. So, during the hearing, Masvidal's defense attorney was hopeful that the case could be resolved by the end of March and that the trial would not be necessary. Be nice. By the way, when is Colby going to come back? What's happening there? I don't know what's happening there. Um, but it would be nice to have him back. Also, perhaps the biggest news of the day. How about this one? Uh, this is according to our good friend A.K. Lee. Jake Paul is one win away from officially being a ranked boxer. Those are the stakes that have been laid down by WBC President Mauricio Suleiman, according to a Wednesday press release in which he states that the WBC rate, rankings or ratings committee will rank Paul in the cruiserweight division, should he defeat Tommy Fury on February 26th in Saudi Arabia? How about that? He's 6-0 and as a pro. A win over Tommy Fury gets him ranked. Do you think people will go crazy over that? I'm sure the internet has taken to this news very, very kindly. That's going to be the newest argument? Yes. The WBC ranking? Should he be ranked? I don't know. I don't know which rankings are more fugazi, the WBC rankings or the UFC official rankings. Probably, I'll say WBC for these purposes because I said earlier that the UFC rankings are the best. One last thing, uh, Bellator going back to Hawaii, guys. This is exciting. Their shows in Hawaii are always great. Uh, they're going back on Friday, April 21st and Saturday, April 22nd. Bellator 294 will be headlined by Liz Carmouche versus Deanna Bennett 2 for the women's flyweight championship uh also on that card tim johnson sarah mcmahon making her bellator debut against arlene blankow now bellator 295 to me is the real real entree this is a tremendous main event it's rafian stotts versus patchy mix in the finals of the bellator bantamweight world grand prix 
And the uh, the winner, of course, we hope will face Sergio Pettis later on this year. But those are two incredibly gifted, incredibly talented, incredibly fun to watch fighters. Stotts, 19-1 coming off that win over Danny Sabatello. Mix, 17-1 coming off a very impressive win over Magomedov. And then the co event features Hawaii's own, the pride of Honolulu, won Ilima Le McFarlane against Japan's Kana Watanabe. Tough fight, fun fight. Watanabe, very good, 11-1-1. McFarlane, 12-2, usually performs quite well in her home state. Yancey Madero's back. His, uh, his fight last year, the scene was great. And a bunch of other fighters as well, including Kai Kamaka the third. So that's April the 21st and April 22nd. A lot to look forward to. There's some talk of uh, Tyson Fury versus Alexander Usyk on April 29th as well. That would be the following week. Uh, so, so very, very, very exciting stuff. Big business. Oh, I see a tweet here from Tommy that he's on his way to Saudi Arabia. So that is good stuff. That will be next Sunday. Um, so no conflicts, conflicts whatsoever with uh, the UFC card. That's the one headlined by Nikita Krilov and Ryan Spann, correct? But that's the last Apex card for quite some time. So that is great news. Plenty of time to talk about all of that. Uh, but for now, it's time to say goodbye. Unless Frank has any final thoughts on anything you want to share before we say goodbye? No, I think uh, your tank done? is empty. Tank is empty. We're done, right? I mean, it's been a long week. Gassed. Gassed. Who knows what's going to happen the rest of the week. The next time we speak, Montreal's own Sami Zayn may be the uh, the undisputed champ. You think Tommy's actually going to be there next weekend? <laughs> What do you think? Is uh, his flight's gonna go? Uh, he's like, oh he's gonna go to Germany. He instead? stops in Saudi Arabia, gets right back in the plane. He's <laughs> like, like you know I, I made it. Fuck this shit. Yeah, I'm out of here. Uh, no, I think he'll be there. I, I do think they should have Mike Perry just there, chilling, just in case. But I don't know if they're gonna do that if Tommy's already there. We are out of time, Frank. It's time to say goodbye. Man, I really enjoyed that chat with Eugene Behrman. Straight shooter, you know? I like a good straight shooter. Tells it like it is. Thanks before you speak. I, I should learn from them. Yeah. He reminds me to a degree of Fedor in that regard because he takes a, he takes a pregnant pause, I believe they say in the business. He, he, he stops, he contemplates, and then he gives you the goods. It almost, it builds the anticipation, right? You're like, oh, what is he going to say? And then he hits you with something which is usually pretty damn insightful. Yeah, I agree. So I appreciate that very, very much. Still not quite over the, the new haircut from Bo Nickel there. Um, really was shocked to see that. Looked Didn't great. Expect it. No, I'm not saying it. I just, you know, it takes some time. It's like, you know, you see a friend, you see a significant other, they change the hair style. You're like, oh, wait, I, I need a minute here, right? Whoa. No? Is that why you're giving Joe a hard time about his haircut? Joe's new haircut needed a minute. Wasn't as drastic, if we're being honest. Needed a minute. Um, but yeah. And I then mean, you were disappointed that he wore a hat today. Well, it was so nice. Loved the haircut. Comes back the next day. Usually wears a hat. Monday wasn't wearing a hat. Comes back with the hat. Was, was surprised he didn't let it go for a little bit longer. Just let it breathe. Just a smidge. He's taking this as a, like a directive now. No, I love a hat. I lo I'm a big hat guy. One of the biggest hat guys in the biz. Uh, thank you very much to all our guests. Thank you very much, Bo Nickel. Thank you very much, Modestus Bukaskis. What a story that was. Thank you very much, Eugene Behrman. And of course, Jack Della Madalena. Thanks to everyone who sent in questions. Thanks to all of them back there. Thanks to all of you. Back on Monday, same time and place. Until then, I say, I'm out of here.